prizes. Creating moments like these, powered by you. Human-centric, but autonomous. Inanimate, but intelligent. Bionic, but beautiful. Innovative, but intuitive. Get ready to step into a future where technology embraces consciousness and augments the human spirit. Where our present merges into the future. Welcome to India Digital Fest. The future begins here. And now, please welcome your hosts for the day, National Editor E.T. Now, Aisha Faridi, and Senior News Editor at Times Network, Sumit Lakutia. Well, what a grand visual treat that was, ladies and gentlemen. Just give me a second. I'm just waiting for my co-host, Sumit, as well, to join in. I'm wondering where he is. Uh, Sumit, can we have you on stage, please? Sumit, where are you? Hi, Aisha. Can you oh. see me? Here I am. That's you? Yeah. Look at me. Uh, very <laughs> cool, but what happened to you? Well, you know, since we're at India's trailblazing platform to explore technological transformation, I thought I could use a bit of transformation myself. How does my avatar look? Uh, very cool, but I'm just wondering if you're going to join me in your human form anytime soon so we can start the show. Um, so actually, you know, Aisha, I'm running a little late. I mean, Delhi traffic, I mean, guys, what can I say? But isn't it great how I can use this technology to work my way around it all? Yeah? It's fabulous, but is that your excuse, really? Delhi traffic? Listen, Aisha, Steve Jobs did famously say, let's go invent tomorrow instead of worrying about what happened yesterday. So how about my avatar keeps you company while I get there, and we can begin the show for our audience so they don't need to worry about anything and they can enjoy the show today. Okay, I I'll take it from there. Right, right, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we'll have to make do with Sumit's uh, meta avatar, if I can call him that. But good morning, formally, once again, and welcome to the first edition of WhatsApp Presents, Times Network India Digital Fest. Future begins here. Our presenting partners, WhatsApp, our associate partners, Dream Sports, banking partner, IDFC First Bank, knowledge partner, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, Bangalore, associate partner, Storia Fuel Foods. A huge round of applause, please, for all of our sponsors. Thank you very much. Now, we're incredibly happy that you could all join us uh, at India's one-of-a-kind platform that seeks to harness digital transformation and showcase the future of business governance as well as society. Well, as Sumit's digital avatar proves, the greatest technological minds of our generation believe that innovation stems from an inherent shift towards taking the disruptive approach that makes any process more efficient, like being digitally present, like when you can't be physically present. And digital transformation is not just geared to make the world more efficient. Today's technologies like AI, ML, conversational technologies, chatbots, deep learning, they also aim to make the world a more transparent place where information is exchanged extremely freely for the betterment of people across the world. Now, here in India, experts foresee tremendous growth in the digital economy. We are estimating about $800 billion digital economic revenue by 2030 itself. And that's all on the back of rising internet penetration, increase in incomes, the young tech-savvy Indian population. Plus, we've had a private sector innovation like the digital payments ecosystem, provision of high-speed internet in very remote areas as well, in tandem with public sector initiatives such as the Digital India campaign that have acted as a successful catalyst for this rapid digitization. So ladies and gentlemen, long gone are the days when India was following the lead of the West as one of the largest and the fastest growing digital markets in the world, we are on the cutting edge when it comes to adoption of new innovations. 
So in this exciting scenario, India Digital Fest is on a mission to bring to the fore the power of disruptive and frontline technologies being implemented across the Indian ecosystem. And today, all of us here can truly shape the future of a digitally powered economy through collaborative efforts. To give you a greater understanding of our theme, we bring to you the vision of WhatsApp Presents Times Network India Digital Fest Future begins here. And on that note, to kickstart the first edition of WhatsApp Presents, Times Network India Digital Fest, I'd like to invite on stage Mr. M. K. Anand. Please give a huge round of applause, the MD and CEO of Times Network, M. K. Anand. Thank you, Aisha. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the future is a hypothesis that can be shaped to suit all of us. We become what we plan to be. In this, we also respond to what others around are racing to become. Never before has the future been so exciting to behold, so tantalizing, and so intimidating all at once. For never before have 8 billion people pondered and planned all at once, armed with technologies that aid them to do the same planning. It's an honor to stand before you today as we launch India Digital Fest, a celebration of the remarkable strides we have made in the world of digital technology and a glimpse into the incredible future that lies ahead. As we look towards this future, there are several technologies that we know will dominate our lives in the years to come. We've already seen how digital payments have transformed the way we transact, and we can expect this trend to continue. The rise of digital payment systems and blockchain technology will play a significant role in shaping the future of finance. With 800 million connected to the internet and so many more enabled to digitally transact, India is poised to become the world's largest digital financial ecosystem. <clears throat> digital technology has taken center stage in the area of media, entertainment, sports, etc. From the rise of uh, streaming platforms to the integration of technology into sports, we expect to see more and more innovations. Virtual reality and augmented reality will play a significant role in creating new entertainment experiences. We've already witnessed the power of animation in its best avatar this year. Gaming has become a, become a massive industry worldwide. We've already gamified everything, strategy, CRM, knowledge, and even love. We've seen the power of gaming bring people together to entertain and even to educate. In the coming years, we expect gaming to continue to evolve with new technologies creating even more immersive experiences. With more and more businesses moving online, digital tools have become even more critical for reaching consumers and driving sales. There has been a sharp rise in D2C startups that are leveraging the rise and rise of e-commerce platforms besides the ex existing industry. A new era of entrepreneurship has been kick-started that promises exciting prospects. Artificial intelligence has made significant strides, and we can expect this trend to continue. As AI becomes more advanced, it will transform everything from healthcare to transportation, creating a more efficient and connected world. As we look towards, forwards towards this future, it is essential to consider the relationship between humans and AI. While AI has con incredible potential, we must also be mindful of the risks it poses. This is a particularly important subject that needs our collective attention, and we will be talking about this in one of our larger sessions today. <clears throat> Finally, as we look forward towards the future, we must consider how we can prepare our workforces for the challenges that lie ahead. We need to invest in education and training programs that will help our citizens develop the skills that they need to succeed in the world that is increasingly driven by technology. By creating a tech-savvy workforce, we can ensure that India remains at the forefront of the digital revolution and continues to be a leader in innovation and progress. As India's most influential news network, Times Network has actively championed India's growth story through its nationally recognized initiatives, including India Economic Conclave, Leaders of Tomorrow, Times Now Summit, etc. Themed, the future begins here, India Digital Fest will highlight frontline technologies and disruptive innovations that are being implemented across the Indian ecosystem and analyze how they will truly shape the future of a digitally powered economy and society. 
a definitive platform for the brightest minds, visionaries, and disruptors to throw light on the upcoming disruptions across tech domain, India Digital Fest will chart the roadmap to harness the full potential of frontline technologies to transform a nation on the rise. The event will also feature an immersive experiential zone to showcase cutting edge technologies from the most influential tech leaders in the digital universe in India and abroad, as well as homegrown innovations. My fellow Indians, the future is bright and the possibilities are endless. Let us embrace technologies that will shape our world and as, let us work together to create a better tomorrow for all of us. The future begins here and now. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister MK and Navika. Sir, Honorable Minister, Mr. Thakur, sir, if we could request you for your keynote address from the podium, please, sir. Thank you. Shri M.K. Ananji, Shrimati Navika Kumarji. Ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. A very good morning to all of you. India is proud to be at the vanguard of the digital revolution that has drastically transformed the way we connect, communicate, and collaborate with each other and the world. With the number of internet users, in the country surpassing 700 million, we have seen enormous growth and have come a long way in the last decade alone. Our visionary Prime Minister, Shri Narendra Modi ji, had launched the Digital India Initiative in July 2015, about 92 months ago. Back then, our global ranking was, per, on per capita data, consumption was about 122 or 123 at that time. In February 2022, India was the number one in the world as far as the data consumption is concerned. <laughs> India consumed more per capita mobile data than the US and China put together. Digital India has added more internet subscribers in the rural areas in the last three years from 2019 to 2021, then in the urban areas, if you look at the numbers, 95.76 million vis-a-vis 92.81 million in the rural and urban areas respectively. This is the result of the dedicated digital drive for digital India initiative that was launched in 2015. This is the result of the dedicated digital drives across rural areas through ambitious government schemes like the flagship Bharatnet project. Telecom Development Plan, Aspirational District Scheme in Northeastern Region through Comprehensive Telecom Development Plan and Initiative Towards Areas Affected by the LWE, etc. The 200% increase in the rural internet subscriptions between the year 2015 to 2021 was a 158% in urban areas reflects the increased impetus the government is putting to bring rural and urban digital connectivity to the same level. Tabhi to aaj aap agar aap gaon mein bhi ja kar dekhenge, ya kisi gramin kshetra mein, shahero mein bhi, to aapko ready wala bhi dikhe ga, chai wala bhi dikhe ga, sabji bechne wala bhi dikhe ga, jo aaj se saath saal pehle hum soch nahi sakte thhe, uske wahan pe bhi ek QR code laga ho gar, apne mobile se aap paisa de sakte ho, ये दुनिया के शायद किसी देश में ना होता हो लेकिन मेरे भारत में होता है और ये पिछले सात वर्षों में बदला है एंड टुडे 40 परसेंट ऑफ़ द वर्ल्ड्स रियल टाइम डिजिटल पेमेंट्स हैपन इन इंडिया इंडिया डिड 48 बिलियन ट्रांजैक्शन थ्रू 2021-2022 व्हिच इज़ 2.6 हाइर देन 2.6 टाइम्स हाइर देन चाइना which was number two with 18 billion real-time transactions. So you can see the gap. 
18 billion transactions and 43 billion transactions, number one and number two. We are clearly far ahead. Increased adoption of unified payment interface, UPI, Bheem, and QR code based merchant payments in India, coupled with boost to cashless payments across businesses and consumers, have led to a boost in real time payments in the country. As of 2021, 31.3% of all payments made in India were made through the real time payment instruments such as UPI. Taking India's digital transformation and connectivity to new heights, Honorable PM has launched the 5G services in October 2022 to accelerate the Digital India movement and ensure Jan Bhagadari towards making India future ready. Aaj hum garv ke saath keh sakte hain ki 4G bhi hamare paas make in India hai aur 5G bhi hamari apni technology hai aur aane wale mein samay mein 6G bhi Bharat ke dwara nirmit hi technology hogi na keval Bharat ke liye balki dunia ko dene ke liye bhi hum taiyar honge. Ye atm nirbha Bharat na keval ek soch hai na keval ek sapna hai इसको आत्मसात करके धरातल पर उतारने का काम भारत सरकार और भारत के लोगों ने किया है 5G टेक्नोलॉजी इज सेट टू बोल्स्टर एंड प्रोपेल इंडिया पोजीशन एज एन इकोनॉमिक एंड टेक पावर हाउस ग्लोबली एंड विल प्रोवाइड न्यू अपॉर्चुनिटीज फॉर स्टार्टअप्स टू कम अप विद इनोवेटिव सोल्यूशन टू सॉल्व एग्जिस्टिंग चैलेंजेस क्रिएट जॉब एंड कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू इंडिया इकोनॉमिक रिजिलियंस फॉर द सम इन रिसेंट ईयर्स India has made monumental strides in digital strategies and data-backed data governance. India has adopted two and embraced new disruptive technologies and deep-dived into digitalization to drive economic growth in order to improve the lives of its citizens in urban, peri-urban and rural areas including those living in far-flung towns and villages. Today. Our country is diverse, democratic, digital, demand and data driven. Today we have a powerful story on digital public infrastructure that is finding global resonance and resounding applause. The increasing digital adoption during the COVID-19 pandemic in areas like healthcare, agriculture, fintech, education, skilling, media and entertainment indicates that the digital delivery of services in India has a massive potential across economic sectors. I still remember during the COVID-19 pandemic when many leaders in India raised the questions on India's capability and capacity to manufacture vaccines or raised questions on COVID app and the Arogya Setu app made wild allegations that it, it is a drive for the data collection. When in the month of February, I met Mr. Sundar Pechai here in Delhi in one of the events, he publicly said that he still have to carry a hard copy of his vaccine certificate, whereas 1.3 billion Indians have a digital copy of their COVID vaccine. So someone from Silicon Valley he still have to carry a hard copy, whereas most of you have the digital copy with you. Friends, if you look at the UPI Bheem transactions, I have given you the numbers. In one month alone, we have more than 782 crore transactions worth 782 crore transactions worth 12.82 lakh crore rupees in a month's time. That clearly showcases the number of transactions are increasing with each passing day. And it is more relevant today when Times Network start this kind of digital fest to create more awareness and also to tell the world that India is ahead than many others in the field of technology, in the field of digital space. And if I have to talk about the most popular league, the Indian Premium League, or the most popular game like cricket, if you look at their rights five years back, the digital rights and the linear rights, there used to be at least eight times difference, 8x. 
but this time i think they sold the right for close to 46000 crore rupees the 23000 crore was for linear and 23000 crore was for the digital space so you could say in which direction the world is moving and times network knows well and they are the first to take steps in that the direction and i'm glad anand ji and navika ji have taken the steps in that direction i think we see navika ji every day on the television we'll see her more on the digital space now while india's digital journey started with aadhar as a medium for service delivery at the doorstep upi strengthened the digital payment infrastructure with other initiatives like covin e rupee creds account aggregators ondc open credit enablement network which is ocn etc at different stages at different stages of implementation india has developed a unique and cohesive digital story to tell we are at a critical moment in history and it is time to reconnect reimagine and realize new possibilities for our youth and the world at large i look forward to hearing your expert opinions on mobility fintech future of tech meditech metaverse open and inclusive innovation edutech e governance e gaming web 3.0 and what not as far as i am heading the information and broadcasting ministry we are also looking at the animation visual effects gaming and comic sector which is the avc avgc sector very seriously i think it is going to create thousands and thousands of job locally and if i look at the media and entertainment sector if it stands at 29 30 billion dollars today we see that in the next 3 years it is going to touch the 100 billion dollar mark 100 billion dollar us uh, us 100 dollar billion mark so why so because here are the consumers here india is spending a lot of money to have the right infrastructure from government to the private sector they are investing billions of dollars to create the right network we may have started late with the 5g network but we are among the fastest to have the 5g network in the year, in the few months to come and forums like the digital india fest by times network will help in realizing the vision of our honorable prime minister to digitally empower every indian as we march towards india's tech aid if i look at our startups 8 years back we were no we are in the startup space in just 8 years spans we are among the third largest startup ecosystem in the world and we have more than 107 unicorns in india now in covid when i see when i saw the big companies struggling to survive it was the startup ecosystem which was not only flourishing but also they went through with the acquisitions of such established companies across the world as well so i think it's going to be a great time to listen to all of you and hear what next for india i still remember in 2014 when i contested my third election of lok sabha and got reelected and prime minister modi formed the government he became the prime minister india was among the fragile five economies in the world it was a great challenge in front of us but when we are going to complete the 9 years in the month of may i can proudly say here that under the able leadership of prime minister modi from fragile five to first five economies of the world that is how we have grown india ranks first in the milk production in the world we are among the largest producers of the millet in the world india ranks the third globally in the startup ecosystem we are the second largest mobile manufacturer in the world from the second largest mobile importer say about 5 years back we are the first responder to the humanitarian crisis anywhere in the world bharat ek samay tak madad mangne walon mein hota tha apda ke samay 
लेकिन नेपाल का उदाहरण देख लीजिए टर्की सीरिया का उदाहरण देख लीजिए भारत मदद मांगने वाला नहीं मदद देने वालों में बन गया है मेरे भाई और बहन वी आर अमंग द लार्जेस्ट फिल्म प्रोड्यूसर्स इन द वर्ल्ड एंड लुक एट द आर 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 एंड द एलिफेंट बिस्परर्स वी हैव वन द ऑस्कर अवार्ड एज वेल नाउ सो द टेक्नोलॉजी इज टेकिंग अस टू दैट लेवल and i'm sure avg sector has great potential and the other sectors as i mentioned before i'm sure from green hydrogen to the digital area india is going to leave frog in these areas and going to lead in many sectors thank you navika ji and anand ji for inviting me here to speak and i looking forward for your valuable suggestions and looking forward for other speakers to come and speak i may be in the parliament but as you know parliament how is functioning these days bahut kaam ho raha hai navika ji hasri kaale kapde aapne pehne maine socha baaki bhi pehn ke chal rahe hain aajkal bahar to main ye bhi keh deta ki kaale karname wale kaale kapdon tak aage kaale andolan karne tak aage नहीं आप इसको बुरा मत लीजिए जैसे सब काले कपड़े वाले मैं आप सब पे नहीं कह रहा मैं वहां के पार्लियामेंट वालों के ऊपर कह रहा हूं तो मैं इतना ही कहूंगा पार्लियामेंट का सेशन है मुझे भी वापस जाना है लेकिन क्योंकि भारत के फ्यूचर और भारत में फ्यूचरिस्टिक जॉब्स के साथ जुड़ा हुआ ये आज का कार्यक्रम है विच इज गोइंग टू क्रिएट मिलियंस ऑफ जॉब इन दर्स टू कम एंड आई एम श्योर एज द लीडर्स ऑफ दिस इंडस्ट्री यू आर ऑल हेयर टू कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टूवर्ड्स इंडिया ग्रोथ विशिंग यू ऑल द बेस्ट and wishing the time network best all the best thank you jai hind jai bharat well ladies and gentlemen as the digital revolution accelerates our habits and the way we work and live has all have also changed haven't they sumit absolutely in fact you know in response to this organizations have been leveraging an increasing amount of software to support and accelerate this transformation we are now witnessing a change in the landscape of our five digital world which you were part of exactly it was a wonderful experience but we'll talk about that a little bit later and uh, you know aisha like you were saying there also emerges a pertinent need for businesses to introspect on how they can elevate their standards to meet the expectations of the new age customer you know as the industry leader that has been creating superior platforms products and services for smes startups and brands across the globe whatsapp is committed to enabling channels of communications between businesses and their customers enabling conversations that matter In fact to talk to us about exactly this unleashing the power of digital the road to india's decade we invite on stage the vice president and head india at meta sandhya devanathan for her keynote address first hello everyone ladies and gentlemen uh, i'll stick to the theme of the conference i'm really excited to be here today to talk about uh, you know the excitement around the india digital fest it's great to be here when i took on the role of heading meta a few months ago i knew that this would be a really exciting journey for many reasons it was homecoming for me uh, the country that i return to now is very different from the one i left in 2005 i've been back as a tourist many many times but it's not the same when you're here you heard the minister and mr anand talk about all the revolution that's happening in the country the pace of change in india has been dramatic over the last few years india has placed itself at the heart of a transformation where digital is playing a central role in changing lives in creating opportunity and spurring new models of innovation and entrepreneurship and that's really exciting for us the second thing is just the role that we see uh, ourselves playing in this story of india's transformation us as meta this is a future that we are equally passionate about and we want to play a role in shaping and celebrating india's rise as a digital superpower over the years and particularly in the last two we've seen the role the power of digital come alive in more ways than we could ever imagine and nobody wants to go back to the days of the pandemic but when the world shut down it was the internet that was open we saw hundreds of millions of people globally use our platforms use platforms such as ours to access healthcare health information 
and connect with their loved ones. I was away in Singapore for those two years, away from my family, from my dad and you know, the rest of my family. And I don't think I could have managed without you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram. I saw that play out. Many of you may have used our platforms or other platforms, and you would have stayed connected with your friends and family. But what we also saw was how we brought hundreds of uh, millions of people together who didn't even know each other. For every hand that went up asking for help, many helping hands came forward. A YouGov survey conducted during that time, during the pandemic, highlighted that in India, the relevance of groups or communities is even more than compared to the rest of the world. 92% of people that you know, responded to the survey said that they received some form of support through online community groups during the pandemic. We had communities like Caremongers, started by Bangalore-based uh, Mahita Nagraj. She started it just at the start of pandemic in 2020. And the group gained popularity, and within four months, it had more than 50,000 members. These volunteers did everything, you know, they, they did a range of requests. It could be something as simple as running errands for someone who was immunocompromised, or it could be, you know, finding recommendations on treatment for cancer. And these were absolute strangers that were coming together during the lockdown and pandemic to help each other. And each of you are probably in some group like that that has done similar amazing things. You know, the minister talked about 1.3 billion Indians accessing uh, uh, COVID vaccinations online. We at WhatsApp played a small role in our partnership with MyGov, and we saw 80 million people access uh, the chatbot with MyGov on, uh, on COVID information. We also saw 40 million people download vaccination certificates, so we're really proud of that role that we played. This, in many ways, is a powerful demonstration of the power of technology and the power of network and how it brings people together. Digital has introduced new ways of working, learning, buying, and selling as well. It's not just what we saw during the pandemic. It's just changed the landscape on all of this. It's changed how we spend our time and where we spend it. And it's all happening here in this country where more than 700 million people are already online. And tens of millions are coming online every few months. We're experiencing the winds of change, and we're lucky at Meta and WhatsApp to see this happen you know, real time. Whether it's a local Kirana store getting orders on WhatsApp from their customers, whether it's a mother who's starting a home, baking, a home bakery business on Facebook, or whether it's my aunt who post-retirement started a page on Instagram selling you know, smock, smock clothes for little children. Right? Or it, you know, it could be a student doing immersive learning via AR and VR. Or it could be a creator in Nagpur who's actually using, who's breaking through barriers of language, location, resources, and ex, you know, unleashing the joy of creative expression. So it's all happening, and we're lucky uh, to see this real time. Every story of India and Bharat revealed the compass of the most dramatic digital transformation that's sweeping across our country. And these are just a few glimpses of what's unfolding in our country. At Meta, we believe our story is embedded in the exciting story of India. What lies ahead energizes us even more. Our excitement about the potential of India, our passion for the hundreds of millions of people from the country uh, who actually come online and who use our platforms to drive big, dramatic change. And that's you know, really exciting for us to see as well. Uh, we, we reiterate our commitment to being an ally for this country, to being a catalyst for economic growth. Uh, and you know, we want to be a part of the success story of this country that is in the heart of a world that's being transformed by technology. India's canvas is vast and open to anyone who wants, a, who wants to dip a brush into the future, who wants to reimagine possibilities and script the story of tomorrow. And for us, nothing can be more fulfilling than fueling the aspirations of a billion Indians to script the story of India of tomorrow. Thank you. I was just going to say, please wait by. <laughs> and I'd now like to inv invite MK Anand as well on stage to lead the fireside chat with Sandhya called Unleashing the Power of Digital, the Road to India's Decade. Thanks, Aisha. Welcome, uh, Sandhya, to not just this place, but uh, to India. After so many years, you've been uh, sort of... Uh, doing stuff all over the world and coming back here. Uh, this is a very, very exciting uh, time for all of us who have been in India 
and I'm sure it's going to be even more exciting for people like you who are going to be bringing all your experiences and uh, adding to the to the party, I would say, that uh, you know, we are seeing that is happening around here with so many people innovating, so many new things happening around. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So I think, uh, you know, India is a little unpredictable and sort of goes off a uh, little tangentially. Uh, there is Navika here. You saw that in the first session itself. I mean, we start with something and it goes off in this direction, that direction. I think people in media, people like us, have uh, the responsibility to bring the discourse back on track. And I will bring it straight on to uh, the, the topic at hand, digital. Uh, we have, in fact, in the last, uh, last decade or so, uh, seen uh, India becoming a very, very, very big player on the, on the digital uh, data use. Uh, and that, I think, has been, uh, you know, one of the key reason triggers of it is uh, the, the, uh, the internet service providers and the, the companies which have done the infrastructure to bring the costs of data down so significantly different uh, you know, in, this, in this part of the world. But it also uh, has been partnered by companies like you, and I would say WhatsApp in particular, because that is, I think, one of the killer apps that moved people from uh, the regular SMS into, uh, into using uh, smartphones and therefore the need to sort of uh, get uh, data enabled. As uh, we understand from various numbers, uh, about 700, almost 800 million users already on internet in India. And, uh, you know, you people have already done a great job there, but there, I think, is our roughly another 500 uh, million people. So what is uh, uh, WhatsApp and what's, what is Meta's and companies like your role uh, in democratizing the power of technology? Thanks, Anand. Uh, you're right, the 700 million people on the internet and counting, it was exciting to see the pace of change and the number of people getting at it were coming online uh, every day. I think of our role as democratizing the access to technology, right? So if you think about our platforms and what it enables, for many Indians, it's the first port of call, their first experience with the internet is our platforms, be it Facebook, be it WhatsApp, uh, you know, or be it Instagram. And I think what we've done is actually democratized access to many people who wouldn't have had, uh, you know, that access. We made it intuitive and we made it widely available. Uh, so we remain excited about uh, helping getting the next half a billion people online as well. Uh, and I think the way we think about it is also in terms of creating for India and thinking about India-first innovations. So we think this will also help in you know, inclusion and improving access. So some of the things that we've done are GeoMart, you know, our partnership with Geo and where we launched GeoMart, where you have this really seamless experience. When I tried it, I was pretty blown away. Uh, you don't have to download an app. You don't have to think about you know, uh, learning a new way of ordering groceries. You just do it on you know, uh, an app that you already use and love, which is WhatsApp, and then you use it to get groceries. And that's changing the way uh, people use WhatsApp and how they, uh, how they experience WhatsApp and you know, communicate with businesses. The second thing that also that I think we've done a lot of work around is just Indians love to, conform, to uh, consume short form videos. And I talked about unleashing expression. And I think that's where also we've sort of doubled down our investment in Reels in India. And we launched Reels in India first globally. So again, that's you know making something for India that then transcends a crop that so we can, we can oh, you know we can expect to over the next uh, I mean, during your tenure and the next decade see India specific innovations and India specific products also. Yes, because culturally, Geomart was definitely an India specific product, and you, we we remain invested and excited about the India opportunity. And I would just you know say also that as a, as a company we connect 3.7 billion people across the globe. So this is something that we hold dear to our heart, which is just improving access to technology for everyone through our platforms. Thanks. Okay, now uh, post the pandemic and uh, you know the whole uh, pullback of cash uh, across the globe, inflation, etc., and all that has sort of suddenly started hitting. Uh, you know, investments into startups and uh, the whole mood has changed over the last six months compared to the two and a half years before that. And that obviously is going to have an impact on, uh, you know, uh, the, the investments which are, you know, so important for new areas. And uh, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts on the contagion effect on the Indian tech sector and challenges that we will face in realizing the vision of 
the so-called India's decade that the minister said. The news is grim, isn't it, <laughs> Anand? Like any time you see there's a bank failing, be it SVB or Credit Suisse, you know, interest rates rising that causes more turmoil in the market, capital markets drying up, VC funding drying up. So I think the macroeconomic situation sudden, certainly looks grim. But I think, and, and it would be a fallacy to think that India will be immune to everything that's happening globally. But what I see is actually a tale of two cities. I see a story of resilience in India, and I think that's powered by a bunch of things economic resilience, the digital governance that we talked about, which is enabling inclusion for you know, millions of people, uh, the very strong and robust startup ecosystem. So I actually see, even as they're global headwinds, we remain really optimistic and excited about what's happening in India. And I think the way we think about it, and which is why you talked about our, uh, you know, our commitment in investments, we actually see the role that we can play during this period is really around upskilling and training and supporting more Indians uh, you know, to earn livelihoods. And that's something that we've been quite committed to. Uh, some of the work that we announced uh, you know, a few years ago was around CFIND, where we've committed to train 10 million small businesses over the course of the next three years uh, and help them come online and you know, get, uh, be digital. We've also committed uh, to support 250,000 creators because we realize creator economy is becoming huge and a viable source of business for, uh, of livelihoods for Indians. Similarly, you know, we're future focused. We're thinking about XR. We announced a fund with Meti and Fiki to train startups and developers, and we've invested $3 million in that. So, you know, while the larger macroeconomic situation is certainly grim, we remain really excited about, you know, so, India's so, prospects. So besides the, uh, the ecosystem development, which obviously is a huge investment, and that is, I would say, in the area of uh, consumer development and user development, uh, within, uh, you know, uh, Meta itself, uh, do you think there is going to be investment into your Indian operations in terms of bringing people who will do research and development of your products from India? or that will continue in the way it is? At this point, I have uh, okay. no news to share on that. Sure. So uh, digital, I mean, we got into the business and the ecosystem point of view. Uh, small businesses in India uh, have greatly, uh, you know, uh, benefited from uh, Meta's work uh, with Facebook uh, first, WhatsApp, of course, and Insta being a very, very important area for, I mean, the smallest of startups, uh, you know, originally start from that. How do you they think they can continue capitalizing on digital to grow and, sc in, and scale? I mean, or do you think, you know, because most of the times you see that they, they go, go to a certain a, you know, stage and then there is a sort of a plateauing. Uh, so what is it that can be done from your side to sort of, uh, you know, intervene there? Yeah, I think on small businesses, uh, we remain particularly excited about small businesses. A lot of the time that I've spent since I've moved in India has been trying to understand how small businesses set up, you know, uh, their operations online with us, how they actually sell their goods and how we can make it easier for them to onboard and scale on our platforms. And I would say this, I'm actually seeing a couple of things. One is um, for small businesses, Earlier, you'd have to set up a website or build an app to actually go online. And it was a big sort of uh, uh, you know, friction point for them and a big barrier for them to do that. And I think what's happened with our platforms and certainly others as well is that that barrier has fallen away. Now, pretty much anybody uh, you know, with a good idea who runs an offline store can actually go online. They don't need a web page. Their first port of call can be WhatsApp or Facebook or Instagram. And we see that playing out on our on our platform time and again. The other thing that we see, and, we, and we, when we actually did a survey with Ipsos, we saw 72% of SMBs actually reported using one tool, a, a meta platform tool, to actually grow and scale their businesses. The second thing that we see is just the access to a larger market, which wasn't possible before. Say, you know, I'm from Vizag, right? So you're a small store in Vizag, or you're a small business sitting out of Vizag. It's now possible for you to reach all of India using digital platforms, and that's the power digital gives you, right? So we've seen that as well play out on our platforms, and we're you know, happy to play a part in it. Again, the same Ipsos survey uh, talked about 50% of SMBs actually reported uh, exporting globally. They, they said they, they got more access to global markets, and they were getting orders globally through our platform. So I think that's the other opportunity it opens up. The third, and this is the one that I'm most passionate about, which is just women-led entrepreneurship, right? So 
my aunt is an exa perfect example of someone who's come online and has done, uh, has started her store completely on Instagram. The other day she called me and very excited. I sold one lakh of smocked frocks on Instagram and that sort of blew me away. But what we've seen since the pandemic is more women are taking steps to become entrepreneurs on our platform. So I think 73% of all Instagram pages that are women led, that identify as women led, started post the pandemic on our platforms. Uh, half of all the Facebook admins who also are small business owners who are women also started their uh, businesses post the pandemic and their presence, not businesses, their presence on Facebook post the pandemic. So women-led entrepreneurship is another place where I think we can play a, a big role. Great. So consumer behavior is seeing a sea change and uh, particularly in the last uh, two to three years, pandemic being a very, very important trigger, whether it's consuming news, entertainment, shopping, mm -hmm. utilities. How do you think brands are leveraging these apps uh, of yours to cater, cater to the trends in this? And uh, you also started saying that, uh, but I think you know, when we sort of look at uh, uh, small brands uh, doing it, uh, you know, there, is a, there is a significant uh, uh, you know, gap between what they currently do with uh, native intelligence yeah. versus what they can do. So yes. what is it that uh, they are doing and what are you doing to help? I think on, uh, on brands, again, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to see the same thing play out in Southeast Asia as well. So uh, again, I think uh, in India, I'm seeing a different you know, set of trends. Uh, the first that I would say is just the small business bit that we talked about. 63 million uh, you know, MSMEs in this country contributing to 30% of our GDP you know, and employing 110 million people. So that's a huge stat. And what we're seeing is more and more of them are going um, digital. So that's a big trend that we're seeing, and that's something brands may want to capitalize on. The second thing that we're seeing is around D2C. Like, gone are the days when there was only one flavor of cola or only one brand of shoes that you bought, right? And this has really transformed. If you look at the country, and we have a ringside uh, view to this because we see a lot of these uh, brands being born on Instagram or on Facebook, but direct to consumer is the other big trend that we're seeing. Uh, there's just one example is uh, Wow uh, Earth, which is one of our fastest growing beauty brands, and that's pretty much all uh, you know digitally led, and they do full funnel advertising that you know right from branding to actually fulfilling uh, using digital platforms. So that's another big thing. The third thing, and you talked about it, and uh, the honourable minister also talked about it, which is uh, Bharat, right? And the number of uh, people coming online, uh, you know, from the rural areas in our country today. I think the stat he used was uh, 92 million versus uh, 97, so 97 million rural Indians coming online in just the last three years. So I think building for Bharat versus India is something that we, uh, we see brands doing more of, and I think they should do much more of as well. So I'll give you a simple example. Eno actually used uh, uh, either national census data, zip codes, and their own uh, you know, audience to target uh, rural populations in India. And they targeted 27 million people doing that and saw 27% increase in sales uh, with just the strategy. So I think brands that are savvy, that know how to target, because then you'll end up seeing a larger audience, a larger set of consumers you can reach out to, and then you're building for rest of India, not just the metros. And I think that's a big thing as more and more Indians come online and start consuming. This is something that I'm, I'm taking aside. Yeah. Uh, in the rural uh, area and amongst women, and I'm not uh, sort of uh, thinking that they are anything more or less, but uh, when one looks at, uh, you know, people in the family who sort of uh, do this, uh, you know, dabble at entrepreneurship uh, with the newfound power of uh, technology, mainly WhatsApp or to some extent Amazon here, uh, or Geo, uh, I think, uh, you know, there is a significant difference, as I said, between native intelligence and the smart ones, right? And uh, people are bewildered, in fact, uh, you know, uh, to sort of make that, that leap. Uh, you know, you probably would have plans, but can we sort of, uh, you, know, you know, discuss anything on that in terms of how are you proposing to handhold uh, the entrepreneurs into getting a little better than what they currently do on the marketing side? Because uh, what, what happens is there are agencies, but then, you know, you really have to go from agency to agency to agency four to five times to actually find a, you know, cut. And, and it's difficult for people who don't have that kind of money to spend something and then go back and out. Because Facebook is a, ultimately a marketing company, a marketing support company like us. Uh, you know, we also in our ecosystem have to sort of handhold our advertisers. So, but your advertising base is like millions probably will become a billion uh, in the future. How do you propose to look at that in this country? Yeah, a great question. And I think I 
alluded to it in the beginning. I've, in fact, and as an aside, my aunt calls me for Instagram tips, so I'm getting, I'm, I myself, I'm trying to get better at it so I can help her with it. But it's true, our products, uh, our platforms now serve millions of people. You can reach an audience, you can build your business, and we take that responsibility really seriously. So the work that we're doing to actually get small businesses online, so the partnership that we have uh, on CFINE, which is uh, a center for entrepreneurs that we launched, uh, I think, earlier in 2021, I think, uh, late 2021, talk, we're really focused on enabling and training 10 million uh, small businesses across the country in the next few years. Uh, that also includes creators, because I think what we're also seeing is a blurring of lines of creators uh, and small businesses, and creators can also become entrepreneurs and you know, uh, make a viable living. That's 250,000 creators. So there's work we're doing there. There's work we you know, do anyway online on our platforms where we enable web-based learning, uh, and you know, people can come and learn at their own pace and their own, uh, and their own time. So that's, again, something that we're doing. The bits that we are now investing in uh, and you know, where we think you know, there's leaps into the future is around the metaverse. So uh, we partnered with CBSC because we think young children, tutors also need to learn about what's coming down the pipe. So there we're looking at 10 million students and around a million educators, uh, you know, and we partnered with the CBSC board uh, to train them on the basics of XR because we think, you know, that may be a decade away, but it's coming. And you saw that, uh, you know, at the launch today. Uh, so that's also a place where, so upskilling, training, uh, it's never enough. So I think we need to do more public-private partnerships around this. So WhatsApp is emerging as India's growth platform, touching the lives of users in different ways. How do you see WhatsApp as a private messaging app transforming businesses which, in which sectors will be the forefront of this change? So uh, WhatsApp, uh, definitely WhatsApp, right? So uh, if I think about WhatsApp in India, again, connecting hundreds of millions of users, and I talked earlier about businesses coming online through WhatsApp, uh, we don't see a single sector as such. In fact, what I've been really pleasantly surprised by, yes, just yesterday we, uh, we met with a large financial services player, and they were using it to renew insurance policies. So we're seeing you know, banks and financial services institutions use it. We're seeing, for example, HDFC Ergo use it for uh, you know reaching farmers in rural India and you know uh, giving them agricultural uh, farmers insurance so there is that we're seeing retail use it right and I talked about Geomart which is transforming the way you buy groceries in India so I think there's no one sector what we've been really pleasantly surprised by is across sectors the amount of willingness people have to test and learn and this is what I keep saying in my seven years at uh, at Meta formerly artist formerly known as Facebook uh, I think if you test and learn on the platform and you're willing to try things, uh, you end up seeing success. That's something I've definitely seen in India. The other bit that I've been, uh, you know, quite excited by is the partnership we have uh, with uh, public sector and just the government. So I talked about MyGov, which is, you know, yeah. 40 million vaccination uh, certificates downloads and as we speak. But equally, the work we're doing with Metro Rail. So now it's we it started with Bangalore, and now it's in three other metros. Uh, you can just go online and you know use WhatsApp to buy tickets, and that's transforming the way people commute. So we're seeing more and more use cases that transfer that transcend not just private sector but going to the public sector yeah, so domain as well. That was one of my questions as to how do you get it? You know how because I, I see, for instance, uh, the Bombay Municipal Corporation see ads there below. It is you know there is a WhatsApp number which sort of asks you to sort of ask questions. So I think. Uh, there is a lot to sort of for you to contribute into the e-governance uh, aspect and governance in particular. One very important question on WhatsApp, you know, SMS, as all of us have seen, has practically become a sort of a, a bin of spam. Uh, WhatsApp is not that. But lately we have started seeing that there's a bit of a spam happening on the, on, from the business side on that. I mean, are, do you guys have, you know, any way to sort of start uh, filtering that because, you know, that otherwise will become a problem. Uh, WhatsApp is now open for business, and with that, you're right, you know, uh, they'll come um, questions like the ones you've asked. I think the thing that I want to reiterate and sort of really land is that users have a choice, right? And uh, we only allow businesses to message users who've opted in to receive marketing messages from the business. So the control and the choice tests, rests with the user. So I think that's a really important thing that, you know, uh, you should be aware of. The second bit is around users can also initiate, are the ones that can initiate a conversation with the business if they've not opted in. So that choice remains and exists. That being said, the things that we are uh, also doing to enhance, so you could be in an opt-in list and you want to drop out because you don't like what the business is sending you, 
you can, uh, you know, uh, you can block that business. And that's a capability that we've built in. Because we're also very aware, uh, and we want this to be uh, an experience that works for the user and for the, uh, and we don't want complaints, right? So this is something we're very laser focused on. So you can block messages, you can report a business if they're sending you too many spam messages. At our end, we have controls, so we don't allow a business to send multiple messages in a day to a consumer. So all of these are safeguards that we're building in as we uh, open up, as we have opened up WhatsApp for business. Ultimately, I think the key takeaway there for us is that users should find value in the businesses that contact them and not feel harassed. And equally, businesses also should be communicating with users that want to hear from them. So we want to make this a win-win experience, and that's what we're focused on. The last question, my favorite topic, AI. Mm. You know, it's the so-called next buzzword, and I think we're going to be talking about and hearing about it a lot more uh, than we have till now. How do you see it play a transformational role for India in general? I'm not, now this is not a meta question, this is about India and AI, how do you think it will impact us? This one, I think, you know, you'd probably be the better person to answer that <laughs> with your 56 years of India experience. But uh, I would say, look, I'll, I'll, I'll give the meta answer and I'll, I'll talk about how that impacts uh, or, or, or how I see that play out in India. I think for us, what we've seen AI do is really transform how we run as a company, right? So if you think about everything from recommendations you get on who to follow or, you know, uh, uh, who to connect with or, you know, the uh, recommendations we see on the ads that we serve or the integrity measures that we're taking, the misinformation that we're finding uh, on our platform that we take down, all of that is powered by AI for us. So we've invested over many, many years, and we've doubled down and tripled down on, on AI as an investment for us. But so far, that AI investments has been more on recommendations and you know, fighting, like I said, misinformation and integrity. What we've now started seeing, which is where I think there's a great role for India as well, is around the power of generative AI, right? Which is you know, what you saw with ChatGPT, what you're seeing with creative uh, generative AI, all of that, that has also the power to transform uh, your experience, your user experience, increase productivity, efficiency, and just like, you know, change uh, every field. So there is where we're now uh, invested. Like we just announced the formation of a new group that's focused on AI at a company level because this is a priority, you know, the top priority for us, and this is where we're doubling down. As, as for India, I think this is the year that India holds the chair. I, I think of uh, 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 the Minister, uh, Minister Rajiv uh, holds the chair for uh, the, gov the Governance Committee on AI, if I'm not mistaken. I think the worldwide chair. Uh, and I think that's a great sort of uh, uh, segue into what we can expect to come out of India. I think AI will transform healthcare. Definitely, in terms of outpatient outcomes, in terms of recommendations, prognosis, I think it's already transforming banking and, and finance. It'll transform a lot of sectors. So I'm waiting to see what it does, not just for you know the private sector, but also for digital governance and you know providing services to ordinary Indians. So I'm excited by that. Thank you, Sandhya. I think that's about it. And uh, thank you for being a partner with the India Digital Fest. And uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Us. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, MK, for that engaging conversation that gave us the essence of the India Digital Fest platform for us. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take a moment here to thank our sponsors at WhatsApp Presents, Times Network, India Digital Fest, Future Begins Here. Presenting partner, WhatsApp. Associate partner, Dream Sports. Banking partner, IDFC First Bank. Knowledge partner, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, Bengaluru. Associate partner, Storia Foods. We'd also love to know your thoughts on India's digital future. So do share your opinions, your perspectives, any photos that you have with us on social media. Don't forget to use the hashtag India Digital Fest as well as hashtag IDF2023. Now, in our inaugural session, in the inaugural keynote address made by the Honorable Minister Sri Anurag Thakur, he did speak about 5G. Well, and about how important it is for India's future. As we all know, 5G is a fifth generation mobile technology and the new global wireless standard that can be leveraged to empower the people of India with a higher quality of living and together 
move towards a future that is driven by sustainability, digital and green innovation. Now that brings us to our next speaker who steers a market leading enterprise that is a forerunner when it comes to harnessing the power of 5G to propel India's digital transformation. Please join me in welcoming on stage the Vice Chairman of Bharti Enterprises, Mr. Akhil Gupta, who will be in conversation with my co-host and national editor, E.T. Now, Aisha Faridi. Thank you, Sumit. Please have water first. I have lots of questions for you. <laughs> So Akhil, we are talking about, you know, the future beginning here, what India's decade is going to look like. None of it is possible with, without telecom operators, right? And given that now it's only a two-player market, must be putting a lot of pressure on you. I, I first of all, disagree with that. It's not a two-player market. <laughs> I am quite certain Voda idea would be there. BSNL is going to come in some form. Uh, in a new avatar. So there's not going to be a two-player market, but yes, uh, quite clearly behind the entire digital revolution, it is connectivity. And therefore, the telecom networks are clearly very important. But tell me, you know, about 15 years back, when I think we last interacted or we last physically met in Russell Khema when it was still a desert, right? You were the CFO of Bharti, I remember. Uh, from then to now, there were about, what, more than a dozen telecom players that pretty much only one can count on one hand fingertips, right? What is it that you're doing right at Bharti? There must be something in your DNA for you to be able to last as one of the top three telecom providers in the country and still be growing. Well, I would say fundamentally we are a conservative company. Mm. And I guess um, if I was to give you a very straight Chris answer of what we did right, I think we kept our balance sheet very strong. So that's what we have been doing in this entire period when there were a lot of turmoil, uh, many near-death experiences. And we always believed, and I always believe, that in difficult times, if you are a strong player, you become stronger. If you are weak, you perish. So we tried to keep our balance sheet very strong. And the result is that today, we have a very strong balance sheet. We did not hesitate in raising a lot of equity. And that's, I think, the reason why we have emerged very strong. But is that the key to survival for the large telecom players such as you? You've got to have deep pockets. You've got to have enough funds to play with. Well, that's where the balance sheet comes in. Yeah. And as far as technology is concerned, everybody has it. Besides, of course, we have such a wonderful operational team on the ground. They have uh, kept through all the difficulties. But yeah, ultimately, they also need resources. So if you can keep on providing resources, then you can remain on top. OK. Tell me, Akhil, what will the Bharti of the next 10 years look like? Will it be the same company doing the same businesses that it has? Or will it be a large conglomerate with many different businesses underneath? I think because we're we now talking digital, right? Telecom is a medium to digital. Would Bharti want to be an enterprise or well, a utilities company in that first sense? First of all, I, I think we will be in the digital space primarily in providing networks. Now, as you know, we are already now in satellite communication. We have one web with the full constellation covering every square inch of the globe. We are, of course, in Africa. We are in India. So our primary thing is about communication, digital network, digital connectivity. Now, on top of that, what all we might do, it's an evolving industry. I won't put any boundaries and not want to really say that we will do this, we will do that. We will fundamentally partner with everybody. You've seen um, Sandhya give a very good account of what Meta is doing. There are thousands of other players, big and small. Our aim is to partner with everybody and provide them the connectivity, the digital platform where they can build their products. That's what we would really like to do. But such partnerships also come with a cost, right, Akhil? 
is Bharti willing to spend that much? And if you have to spend that much, you've got to raise capital. Is there a capital commitment vision that you have in mind? As I said, we have a strong balance sheet. We are in free cash flow, so I don't need to raise more capital. But yes, we have to spend a hell of a lot. And that is where I think the big debate today is that the OTTs, and that's of course a very divergent opinion across the world, we believe that we are all in it together and they must share a fair share of the burden of all these networks which have been created in some form or the other. But yeah, you're right. This does need a lot of capital, continuous deployment of capital, and that's what we have been doing. Tell me, how's the evolution to 5G been? Because already in a very short span of time, we're in about, what, 400 cities? Four. It increases every Around, day. Yeah, so. it increases pretty much every day. Even I've lost track. How's the transition been? Because it's been one of the quickest from 4G to 5G. Still a bit of early days hmm. because the coverage is not ubiquitous. Uh, I think in the next six months, we will see a whole lot of difference. And people will really start feeling the power of 5G. But it's been good. I think the handsets have been coming, the percentage is increasing of the 5G handsets in the smartphone shipments. So I, I guess 5G is there now and it will only go from strength to strength. Sure. Are you already committing investments to 6G because that's what the Prime Minister look, is talking look, about tele next? Telecom is an evolving movie, yeah. right? We had 4G. As 4G started coming to an end, we had 5G. So the investment span shifts from 4G to 5G. At some point, it will shift from 5G to 6G. We are not too worried about this aspect. But this is just an evolution. We'll go along with the evolution. At one, what point do you think 2G and 3G will cease to exist? 3G. And it'll only be 4, 5, 6. 3G is already gone, but 2G is still there in India because I think there is still a whole lot of customers mm. who are not able to afford a smartphone. Mm. But matter of time, it will go. And what happens when pretty much all of India and all Indians have a smartphone with 5G? Do we have the bandwidth and the capability to handle that kind of volume? Yeah, that's exactly what we are doing. And when I say we, I'm not talking of Airtel, I'm talking sure. of the telecom industry. Sure. We are collectively investing about 3 lakh crores. That's about $35 billion. In that, it includes spectrum, the equipment, the towers which are being created, the fiber networks which are being set up. And what that is doing, like in our case, our total capacity in the very first phase will go up from about 45 terabits per second to over 85 terabits per second. So this is about capacity creation. Because I believe telecom is a supply-led demand. The more you supply, the more demand will come up. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, looking at the Gen Zs and Millennials, one must say that they have some copious appetite to consume data. But tell me, what are the hindrances? What are the roadblocks? Because, I mean, you know, like you're saying, it all sounds very good on paper that the transition is going to be very smooth. But bes besides funds, what are the roadblocks for this transition from 5G to 6G? Look, the big hindrance in telecom development in India today is the very poor return on capital which this industry has. And at some point of time, that will have to change. Because otherwise, the investments will dry up at some point or the other. So return on capital is a big hindrance today. And that's the reason why you are seeing a very <clears throat> big and a very respected player being in a bit of a, not a bit of a, but a serious trouble today. This industry's financial health has got to improve if we need to fulfill the dream of beginning digital connectivity across this country. So what's stopping you? Why don't you bite the bullet first and increase the tariffs? Competition. I think I'm not worried about tariffs. Mm. What we need to see is increase in ARPUs. The overall revenue has to go up. The per GB price can come down. That's not a problem. But the overall revenue will have to really go up. ARPUs need to go up to 300 rupees in a phase manner over the next few years. 
Therefore, what is the solution, considering you've got a very large dominant player such as you, and then there is one more, and then a week number three and four, right? Who bites the bullet first? I think it only boils down to that. No, I mean, I what is the solution of return on capital <laughs> generation? Someone's got to do it. Um, I guess we'll all need to work together. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put blame on anybody, not on the government, because they are not saying no. I guess it will happen, but I think it should happen sooner than later. Because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, we've got the cheapest telecom rates pretty much in the world? Absolutely. <laughs> right? <laughs> Without a doubt. So you're saying that we should be ready to pay more for data and telecom services I think in days to come? Consumers are ready, but somehow, as an industry, we have not been able to come to an understanding of increasing the ARPUs so that this industry can be healthy. But what will happen? I mean, what will give up first? Either you lose subscribers or then you go in for a very, very gradual and slow increase in tariffs. Look, in India, it will and have I'm to sure be gradual. And I'm sure you walk this tightrope no, many look, a time. It will have to be gradual, but it has to be steady. And we do, from almost 200, need to reach 300 over a period of time. You know, by the end of the next financial year, I believe that 5G is expected to be present on a pan-India basis. Yeah. In the very near term, what is it that you and Bharti are doing for this smooth transition? Setting up networks. <laughs> um, blowing up money, putting loads and loads of capital behind this. That's one thing which we are doing. Right. Uh, you also talked about, you know, towers. Is that a business which is viable? And is that a business which is also a sort of deep fund sucking business, if I can call it yeah, that? Yeah, it needs a lot of capital. Hmm. Uh, it's a good, very good business model. But I think we need uh, at least three to four players for that business to be really viable. Right. Let's talk about Bharti Enterprises then. You know, we've talked about what the vision is going to be at Bharti. You've talked about funds. You've got, talked about the hindrances. But in the next five years, how is it that Bharti becomes one of the sole providers to India's next decade? Uh, what provider? One of the sole providers, one of the major providers for India to be able to reach its digital dream. We are already. I don't need to wait for 10 years sure. for that. We are a major provider for everything which is happening in the digital world. It is riding on our networks. Without the networks, none of this is possible. So we are already a very major uh, player in this whole digital ecosystem. Mr. Gupta, apart from being a telecom provider and a key one at that, there's also Airtel Payments Bank. And that business of yours is profitable. What's the vision to take that forward? Because that is also a space where there is immense competition. Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> Bharti and Airtel have always been about inclusive growth. If you looked at our journey in telecom, we started from Delhi, and we are now in 17 countries, including India. But everywhere it's about inclusive growth. We believe Airtel Payment Bank is another big opportunity to take banking to the unbanked, and that's what we are doing. So that's the aim, and we also believe it's a profitable journey. It's a journey full of potential, so we look forward to developing that bank. Now give me a headline, tell me how much of money are you deploying from the rights issue, or are you going for another round of fundraising anytime soon or no, there's not? Nothing, nothing on the horizon nothing right on now, the horizon. Don't, need, don't need to raise more money right Adequate now. cash in the books? Absolutely. Okay, great. We look forward to the digital future that Bharti has in store. Thank you so much Thank for you. taking time. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for that. Now, the Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman's announcements for the tourism sector in the 2023 budget bode extremely well for the tourism industry. The development of 50 new destinations and the one-stop online application that the government will be launching with features like physical connectivity and tourist guides all seek to help in the growth of domestic as well as international tourism through leveraging the power of technology. Well, our next session is going to be around that very topic.
So, is the industry ready to implement innovations that are changing the face of travel? Well, our next speaker belongs to an ubiquitous brand that foresaw the value of technological applications in the travel and hospitality industry. To speak to us on immersive travel experience, is the industry ready? Please join me in welcoming on stage the chairman of Make My Trip, Deep Kalra, in conversation managing with the managing editor Times Network and business head Times Influence, Mihir Bhatt. Thank you, Deep, for uh, joining us. My pleasure. Uh, as you can see, our uh, theme is uh, Future Begins Here. And my first question is obviously, uh, you know, we want to understand, you are somebody who saw future of travel and how it will go online uh, decades back. Uh, so what was your thought process when you actually ventured into online travel portal? Because till then, this whole industry was completely fragmented. There were a lot of mom and, shop, uh, mom and pop shops and uh, it was quite unorganized. So the credit goes to you, and I think he deserves a, a huge round of applause for that. Deep. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, when you say decades ago, it does make me feel like a tech dinosaur. But how time flies, and we're talking about the decade ahead, which is a lovely term. So I started Make My Trip uh, way back in 2000. And for me, the motivator at that point of time was fairly simple. At one side was to do my own venture. I'd worked with three different companies, ABN AMRO, AMF Bowling, and G Capital. And uh, I don't think I was entirely satisfied working uh, for a company, although they were wonderful companies. But there was something inside which probably was driving me to do my own thing. But more importantly, it was an introduction to the internet, both formally and informally. So informally, those of you who were, uh, I think, old enough to be tinkering, tinkering around on the internet in maybe 99 in India, uh, when uh, Akhil's company had not really given us very fast broadband. So it was 128 uh, MVBS, really slow connectivity, uh, dial-up modems, that horrible noise, and breakdowns, etc., all the time. So yeah, I think I was a child of that, that era. But even then, despite the painful experience of staying online, even then, it was clear that this is something which is going to change everything. It was like a huge force. There was something like which has not happened, at least in my lifetime. I was 30 then, and I was saying, this is amazing. It also afforded the opportunity of someone with probably little capital, because I was a professional uh, from a service uh, family to do something, to dream of doing something of his or her own. And you could do it with little capital. Yes, venture capital was available way back then. Then we went through the drought of the dot-com bust, which is another story for another day. But those were the drivers. And, and why travel? My thesis at that point of time was things that are largely being transacted, products and services that are being transacted on the phone are most likely to move online first. And this was, so it was either online stockbroking for me or online travel. And maybe by training, I was closer to online stockbroking, but the heart and passion was in travel. And you know, you never met your travel agent, maybe once a year on Diwali, but you called them up, they booked your tickets for you, they sometimes made reservations for you, someone came to pick up the check, and that was the way the business was transacted. That was ready for disruption. So yeah, we took that pioneering step way back in 2000. Yeah. Right. Uh, today, uh, Deep, India is a huge uh, success story uh, in terms of uh, you know, online transactions and the sheer number of people who are online, which is actually expected to cross 1.2 billion by the time we reach uh, 2025. Uh, standing here today, what is your sense? Uh, you know, uh, the new technology, 5G, 6G, AR, AI, how are they going to shape the future of travel and tourism industry? You know, I think we have to take one quick step back. And we have to firstly fully appreciate what is different about travel from other goods and services that are sold online. Firstly and most importantly, travel is perishable. So therefore, if today this hotel doesn't sell, let's say, 20% of the, their rooms, that 20% is gone forever. 
So there is incremental benefit in selling every last room and, in several, and for an airline to sell every last ticket. Now, why doesn't that happen? Because why don't you get the cheapest tickets on the last day? We all ask. In fact, now there are questions in Parliament, why are tickets so expensive? It doesn't happen because big brands don't want to dilute their brand position. So, but they do it wisely. They do it smartly. The lowest prices are available either very early on or sometimes last minute for certain kind of brands who are quite happy to sell some tickets in the end last minute. So products are perishable. Secondly, travel products are not like any other products where they don't occupy a space in your house, whether on your kitchen shelf or in your bathroom shelf or in your cupboard or wardrobe. They're very different because they actually occupy a piece of your mind and time. So when people say, hey, when I'm going and buying something else, let's say on Amazon, on Flipkart, uh, I might want to buy something travel. It doesn't happen, and we've tried it many times. It doesn't happen because you don't say, I'm buying a mobile phone, or I'm buying a mobile phone cover, a charger, an aftershave, blah, blah, I need all of this. Oh, guess what? Nice ticket, let me buy it. It doesn't happen. You go and buy, book a ticket, <clears throat> or book a hotel room only when you're ready for travel and you commit to time. So these two things make the influence of technology very, very potent on travel. Till 1960, all airline tickets were manually done and there was no system. So the first GDS or global distribution system came up in 5760 in the US. Imagine at that point of time, if you were booking a ticket, let's say on even Air India from Delhi to London or Delhi to Bombay, and you were sitting in Calcutta while booking it, which could well happen, they had to make many calls to understand, do we have enough tickets available on my stock? And they could never be a perfect or an optimal solution. Technology changed that. Then more advances came in technology. But the biggest advance and the biggest impact really, I think, has been the web, the internet, and then, of course, mobile phones, smartphones. And now we'll talk about AI. Because fundamentally, they have helped suppliers. Again, airlines, hotels, railways, bus operators, car operators, to optimize and maximize the revenue yield that they can get on their perishable inventory. And that's most important. At the same point of time, the other stakeholder in the game is all of us as consumers to get the best deal given the circumstance what's happening, to get all the options as you see. Today it seems like pretty easy to do, but I can tell you building the first direct connect with an airline was one hell of a job. It took, I kid you not, close to six months to convince Air Deccan which was the first low-cost carrier that we tied up with way back again in, in uh, I think, 2004, 2005, to convince them to give inventory through a direct connect because they actually didn't know what that was. And I remember sitting with Captain Gopinath, convincing him about these plans. After 20 minutes, he told me, I have to tell you, I was drawing on the whiteboard. He said, I haven't understood a word of what you've said but let me call my CTO in and I'll give him the go ahead to do what you want to do. And then the next one took several weeks and then finally it became a cookie cutter model. But fundamentally now these airlines could optimize yield and could hope to optimize revenue as well. Similarly with hotels going online. So technology's impact, what has happened in the past is huge, but what's going forward is also going to be quite amazing. And uh, as we get into the new exciting realm of the stuff that you guys are talking about today, uh, which is data science, which I think is the bedrock really, data science and machine learning, which is the bedrock of what we use today, uh, AI, which is obviously the most exciting term around here. Right. Deep, also, uh, globally, if we look at the uh, travel and tourism industry, you know, it almost contributes more than 11% of uh, global GDP or world economy. Uh, in India, as uh, we catch up with technology and as more and more Indians migrate to uh, being online, uh, do you see the market share of uh, uh, travel and tourism industry going up uh, in the overall contribution to GDP? Uh, it should, you know. 11% uh, is a very big number as a contributor to GDP. Uh, it's also, by the way, uh, about the same 10 to 11% of jobs created. So it's actually one of the sectors which plays to our advantage uh, as a country, as an economy. So firstly, we have to keep in mind that India, I think, is bestowed with natural beauty, natural places, uh, cultural, historical, probably more than any other country in the world. That being said, I think we've done quite a sad job of promoting ourselves the way it should be. We rank 
number 22 or 23 in the frequently visited, like in, in countries traveled to, which is sad for a country our size. Why doesn't it happen? We can say our marketing is not great. I, I, I tend to disagree. I think Incredible India has been a fantastic campaign, etc. I think it's perception, which is not far from reality. So firstly, India is perceived as sadly an unsafe place for a lot of foreigners. So either you get two kinds of travelers coming to India. Either they come with the high-end travel, which is you know, rose tinted glasses, you come, you stay in five stars, that's a thin sliver. Uh, till recently, pre-COVID, hotels used to love and only look at these customers. I can tell you it all changed during COVID. It's the domestic traveler who's spending more and now every hotel says domestic is the most important. Or you have backpackers. But you don't have the middle class. So a middle class American or a middle class European traveling to India as one of their first choices doesn't happen automatically. It's considered an exotic place but also a risky place. So we have to change that. The second thing which we don't have I think is easy infrastructure last mile. I think we've got now a lot of infrastructure happening in terms of new airports, in terms of wonderful new roads, but the last mile is still lacking. Therefore, when we are in season, every hotel you'll see the hot spots get Cho choked up and you know we're putting a lot of pressure on them so I think we have to change that if we manage to change that travel and tourism can play definitely I think we can pick up a couple of percentage points in the next few years as a share of market right uh, the uh, what is this about uh, you know the whole uh, focus about sustainable travel and sustainable uh, industry especially the travel and tourism industry uh, do you think the use of latest technology can actually uh, help and speed up that process? Because there are a lot of people who are talking about it nowadays. So firstly, I think sustainable travel is today not a cool thing, a fashionable thing, a nice thing to talk about. It is a dire need. It's a dire need for India because just like I said, the places that are most popular have got completely overheated. Uh, there's a concept called carrying capacity. We have far too many people traveling there in season and therefore putting a tremendous pressure on resources. So uh, whether it's water there, uh, the structures that are coming up there, a uh, little unplanned, very risky, even the roads, the pollution during peak season, even in places like Manali, forget Shimla and Nenital and North Goa, has really become terrible. So you have to think about what we are doing. So we have to go to different places. But more importantly, we have to ensure that our footprint there as a tourist uh, is done in a sustainable manner, which means all stakeholders, including the suppliers there, the small hotels, the homestays. We have to think about sustainability, which is are we genuinely going green or is this lip service? And therefore, we are finding a lot of younger travelers, particularly 30s and below, actually being acutely aware of this and choosing greener options. So that is happening and we are seeing that through our tech platforms. So tech has a role to play. Um, I don't think it's that straightforward. Uh, first big role to play is awareness. People are not even aware of which are the places which are green or not green. So when you're, let's say you've decided to go to Goa, there needs to be a sort order and we have actually experimented with that in the past, which can sort not on price, not on star rating, not on reviews, not on distance from beach, but also on how green is that property. That's beginning to happen in many places. We experimented with it. We are looking for a good third party accreditation because it has to be neutral. Customer reviews can be overlaid on that. I think that's a big need. Similarly, there's a big need as I'm not sure we're aware of a concept of green fuel, green aviation fuel. So a lot of airlines now are looking at a more expensive option, but a sustainable option. There's one small airline in Europe, in Scandinavia, which has gone completely green, using only green fuel. And they are finding that, yes, it's more expensive, but a lot of people, particularly Europeans, who are, I think, uh, maybe more evolved in this aspect, are already opting for it and happy to pay 10 to 15% more for the same ticket. That's a big deal. But to say we traveled green, Therefore, my carbon footprint is actually much, much lower than what it would have been. So people are getting that kind of consciousness in India. It's being led by two cohorts, and there's a big overlap between them. One, the youth, like I said, and the second, the digital avant-garde, and they are also the youth. So there's a massive overlap between the two, and they are the ones who are actually, uh, I think, not only aware, uh, but giving a thumbs up and actually putting their money where their mouth is. 
Our job as a platform is to do that aggregation, uh, that sorting, that selection, so that people can make a more informed choice. I'll give you a small example. So way back, I think 15, 16 years ago, we launched something which many of you who've used our platform would have seen, where we said, help offset your carbon footprint by taking this trip, by contributing to maybe uh, one tree or more trees, but as low as five rupees, which now goes to the Make My Trip Foundation, which works with five or six different NGOs on the ground, like Seva Mandir in Odepur, uh, Tata Trust in Uttarakhand, uh, we're working on a very exciting project in Andamans where we've built water ATMs already last three years where people don't have to use plastic bottles but can refill the bottles given to them. And people, 18 to 19 percent of you, of Indian customers, contributed that five or ten rupees for a greener uh, tomorrow. So I, I'm actually very enthused with the kind of reaction people have had and happy to put money in for that and that has helped us we've planted now with that money and our own um, company support 1.2 million trees uh, with seva mandir largely which is already done and more this is happening uh, we're doing a project in ladakh with sonam vanchuk's foundation which is around miyawaki uh, uh, plantation and we're doing this uh, water atm project uh, in andamans as well as working with waste warriors and tata trust in uttarakhand in sahasradhara for solid waste uh, proper uh, disposal and management of the same. So I am finding that people are quite ready and our job as a tech platform is to give those options. Right. Uh, coming back to technology, uh, you know, I mean, one is obviously the immersive travel experience or I mean the way people can easily access things online and uh, maybe take a better decision in terms of where they want to travel. The second part is how is technology helping companies like yours uh, in building better customer experience pre and post travel and also in terms of customer services through technologies like let's say chatbots. Yeah and that's that's really the most relevant I think uh, for today's discussion and indeed it's been game changing in terms of many features that we are able to do which we couldn't have done before um, machine learning was a reality, data science was a reality and now AI is entirely a reality. And I'll give you examples of Sun and they have to be win-win. It has to work for both our stakeholders, uh, which is ultimate consumer, all of us, and then our supply partners, which is airlines, hotels, bus, etc. So I'll go, I'll go by, let's say, airline. So airlines are telling us all the time that, listen, you know, help us kind of maximize our yield. We want to sell the last seat on every flight, but we won't want to discount very heavily. Customers, on the other hand, are telling us all the time through surveys and otherwise that, listen, how do I protect myself against these crazy fair spikes, or when is the best time to buy? So it's no different from the stock market. Nobody knows the best time to buy. But through technology, we can give you two different things. One is fair lock. So fair lock is a feature, as the name suggests, where you can lock into a particular fare, which is pretty exciting today. If the fare goes lower, you get the advantage of that fare. If the fare goes higher, you don't have to pay the high amount because you paid a tiny premium right now. And we're talking about really tiny amounts. How that is possible at the back end is purely by data science. So we look at various factors, one of them being what is, how early did you book? What is the history of fare spikes on that particular route? How many other airlines are planning to come in there sometimes? And what is the history of this customer actually? Also, how often do they change? So fare lock and the second one is zero cancellation, where again, by paying a tiny amount, you can lock a zero cancellation fare. This actually got built during COVID because a lot of people rightfully were saying, we're not sure we'll be able to travel. We're not sure it'll be safe to travel or I might be unwell, etc." So if your plans are tentative, then that is a very good option to go to. Again, both of them only possible because of these technologies beyond, behind. The third one becomes what I call connected trip or cross-sell. So if you booked a flight, you're sitting in Delhi, you're going to Bangalore, at the right point of time, it makes a lot of sense to give you a very good offer for booking a cab to the airport. 80% of people uh, in India actually book cabs to go to the airport. 20% have someone leave them, either their own car and driver or a friend or family or whatever. 80% book cabs and then of course there's metro. So that 80%, you have to give a very good offer. And the beauty of the cab offer that we can give, of course there's Uber and Ola, is that that is seamlessly tied up with your flight. So if your flight is delayed, that gets delayed automatically. 
If your incoming flight is delayed, they are already informed about that, so you don't have to you know, panic. Also, you beat Russia. We've all seen what happens in Russia when you end up at an airport. You know, a flight, the, basically there's a huge waiting, your, your cab keeps canceling out. We found that to be very popular. And also offering hotel deals, which hotels are willing to give only to customers who have shown distinct intent to travel, which is an actual flying customer. So Bangalore will give us, Bangalore hotels will give us very good deals not to display on the site, but to offer only to people who have actually taken a flight to come to Bangalore, because then they know that they're offering a genuine customer and they're not diluting their brand. So we are finding that also to find a lot of traction. For hotels, hotel ranking is now entirely based on your customer intent that you've shown us. So we have a huge repository we are building all the time of data of customer intent, which is much larger than customer buying. So only about 10% of people who come actually buy something, 90%, but they demonstrate intent. They show us what they searched for, they look at the prices, where they exited. All of that can be bundled together, therefore to show you next time when you come, only relevant hotels. So if you have chosen largely five-star hotels in your last eight searches, for us that's telling us something, right? We should next time have the skew much higher. Even last two searches is enough for have the skew of five-star more. Similarly, if you have traveled very often, you typically travel with family, then we have to show you places which are like family-like hotels. But if you travel on business and you're a consultant and you do Delhi, Bangalore, 8 a.m. in the morning and you come back on Friday, leave on Monday, typical consultant lifestyle, then we actually have a feature which is flights you prefer, trips you prefer. So what you have preferred, then your conversion becomes very quick. We also have a feature which is QuickBook. So for the frequent business travelers, that QuickBook means you can get done in less than a minute and get done. All of this is getting powered like this. For rail, there's a very exciting product which people don't really know, which is a cancellation product which uh, we actually call Trip Guarantee, which basically says if you book a ticket which is waitlisted today, and if that waitlist doesn't get confirmed when the chart is prepared, we give you three times the amount. Why three times? That enables you to either go to a premium class which might be available, so upper class in the train, or cab if it's a short distance, or flight. And we are finding a lot of people converting for that. So you can rest assured, book it even if it's on waitlist and take away the anxiety. A lot of work also on post sales is happening where we've automated these, these flows. So yeah, very, very exciting times. And you know, what I'd love to share with you is what's happening today with AI, which the new model on AI, which we are all aware of, is generative uh, AI, right? This generative model is heady. And the things it can do to summarize very intelligently the reviews you're getting, not in tabular form, but in a very easy to understand form, to help us build content in a very interesting manner. So we are working, we're building core capabilities, but we will work with the leading players for this. Right, one last question, Deep. Uh, one is obviously the rebound that we saw uh, in the travel industry post-COVID that seems to be sustaining. What is your take on that? And secondly, uh, because, uh, I mean, allow me the liberty to uh, call you a startup then because you actually started your company when the, the term itself was not coined, at least in India, right? Uh, the startup universe has been going through a churn and it has seen valuations drop and we have seen layoffs and all. So what is your outlook on that? Yeah, absolutely. The rebound or the revenge travel in any terms given is heartening for all of us to see. It's real. Uh, today, almost every domestic player in travel in India is saying we have now recovered more than 100% of pre-COVID. But, you know, it took a long time. And, you know, there was no travel, as we know, for that first quarter, which we, you know, I shudder when I think about what happened three years ago on this date, literally. Uh, so things have changed a lot. I think people have come back. We believe it's going to be, uh, you know, very steady, at least on a secular growth. There will be some ups and downs. There will be blips. I think people have learned to live with it. Can India do better? I spoke about it. Undoubtedly, we can do better. But the beauty, the silver lining that COVID taught, at least the travel industries in India, is to firstly automate a lot more of your post-sale processes because you couldn't afford to have people doing this. Also, to prepare better the standards and the SOPs that are put in place today for hygiene, for health, for care and safety are much, much better. And then I think we had a lot of time, which was almost forced pause, to build a lot of these products around tech. So I think it really did. There are silver linings to it, and we are thankful for that. I think this for that. I think the startup winter which we are talking about or the funding winter that we are talking about 
uh, is a reality, but it's going to be short but sharp. And today it's not only because of the overheated part of it, but now we have the banks crisis, not just in the US, but also in Europe, which you know really exacerbates most of this. But I've seen cycles now being shorter, sharper, and it'll come back. There is no doubt in my mind that the next probably two decades, or decades as you call it, belong to India. It's ours to lose. And especially on the digital side, I think India is just going to come out shining in, uh, in all quarters. On that note, uh, Deep, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And uh, I think uh, that's a very bright future that you have portrayed, that next two decades belong to India. Thank you so much, Deep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kalra. And thank you, Mihir, for that discussion. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's now time for a quick lunch break. We request all the delegates to proceed downstairs to the courtyard. Uh, please do join us for lunch. Uh, but be back here really quickly after lunch. We have a stellar lineup of insightful thought leaders here at WhatsApp Presents Times Network, India Digital Fest. Future begins here. IDFC First Bank, Knowledge Partner, Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, Bengaluru, Associate Partner, Storia Foods. Now, India's one-of-a-kind platform that seeks to harness digital transformation and showcase the power of digital technology to shape the future of business, governance, and society. That is what India Digital Fest is. In fact, you know, looking at uh, the kind of polycrisis scenario of today, especially vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis Russia and Ukraine, yes. we see a wide range of emerging technologies, so myth like uh, cyber tech, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, that have military applications as well. That's true. And you know, uh, Aisha, not to be left behind, there is a dedicated effort by the government of India to increase capacities and institutional architecture uh, and to make strategic investments that aim to integrate these technological innovations in each of the armed services. Uh, you know, in fact, Aisha, a significant stride has been made uh, with technology in defense and not just in development and manufacturing of arms, but also in creating a comprehensive national security strategy when it comes to global cooperation. In fact, I completely agree with that, Sumit. And the initiative on critical and emerging technology concluded between the United States and India in May 2022 hmm. surely is one such vital step in the direction of forging bilateral cooperations. In fact, Absolutely. to further discuss this and the role of technology in the future of warfare, we have with us a panel comprised of eminent experts. Please join us in welcoming the founder of Absolute Composites, Raghavendra Reddy, and the co-founder, MD of Bot Labs Dynamics, Dr. Sarita Alavat, in conversation with defense expert, Maru Raza. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we can do better than that. We've just had lunch. A huge round of applause, please. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I was just looking at my watch to see that I can keep time. Unlike some of the earlier sessions, I think they've gone a bit over the top. But uh, thanks for giving us a good audience after lunch, which is normally not the case with conferences because after lunch, people peter out. And we are going to look at the future applications of technology in warfare in the context of drones, which is really becoming the go-to weapon system and the go-to platform, particularly for the army, but also for the other services, including the paramilitary forces. And we have with us uh, two experts who are manufacturers, and therefore, they are trailblazers in the field of drones and their use in modern warfare technologies. Now, as the anchors, and the masters of ceremony have just told us that increasingly technology is going to change the game on the battlefield, though I'm a traditionalist, and I still believe that the man on the ground will be your final decisive element in any conflict, at least for now. Though the world is trying, spearheaded by the Americans, to try and have a conflict scenario where you have non-contact warfare, 
which means that you use technology and the other uses technology and whoever's technology is better gets the better out of the two. Now we have a situation in the world and the ongoing conflict in Ukraine which gives us an idea of how things are going to pan out. And drones have played a dramatic role there in stalling Russia's military efforts by providing reconnaissance, by providing top attack armor, because tanks are best fortified from the front. Historically, the fire on tanks came from the front, but they are light on top where the commanders sit and drones are hitting them and decapacitating them. But also the intelligence gathering, the information gathering, and target acquisition for long range artillery, all part of drones. But here we have two makers of drone technology who are going to take us into the next generation of drone-related conflict technology. And we have with us Mr. Raghav Reddy, who is the founder and director of Absolute Composites Private Limited, a Bangalore-based company. And amongst other things, he has made an unusual application for the armed forces, which is a flying soldier onto the battlefield and beyond. Some of you may remember from the field uh, from your experience of watching Sean Connery in Thunderball, where he suddenly puts on this gear and this outfit, and he escapes from a situation, flies into, sits in a car and drives off. Now, that's the kind of people that Raghav's technology is going to be giving capability to in the battlefield, and we will discuss a bit more about how best it can be used in future warfare. I hope the military decision makers understand what he has to offer. And we have uh, Dr. Sarita Alawat, who has a strong academic record with a PhD in microbiology, interestingly, from the University of Illinois in Chicago, but here she is more into scientific technology. And she has been making drones in swarms. Now people ask, what is swarms? It's like a whole swarm of birds I, some of you would be familiar that every winter the Siberian cranes come in large numbers from Siberia to bird sanctuaries like Bharatpur. And interestingly, in one of my TV shows, I was discussing with a general who seemed to be quite familiar with it. You know, there are some masterminds in the swarm group which lead the swarm in a particular direction. So it's not that you just let them and create sort of confusion in the minds of the enemy that what these swarms are doing, but they can be launched with a purpose. Now, she already has manufactured swarm groups of about 3,500 swarms, but she is now looking at another world record, which is 7,500 swarms. And I was trying to understand from her till I got pushed into this hall that how is it 3,500 into two, which becomes 7,000, how is it going to be any less or any different from a bigger group of 7,000, but we will discuss that as we go along. So I'll first ask you, ma'am. Now, swarms serve many purposes. The biggest purpose, to my mind, is the psychological impact of swarm drones when you're sitting in a trench, and this is the situation that our soldiers are largely faced with, both against Pakistan and China, and China is a world leader in making drones, and the drones made their real impact. And let's not for a moment forget the so-called Iranian drone attack on Saudi Arabia's Aramco facilities, and which caused a stir, or the Houthis using the odd drone to hit Dubai, I think. But the fact is that drones in large numbers can be a game changer. How can they be a game changer? Oh, sorry, that's long. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarita. Uh, so uh, a little bit correction. Um, so I do have PhD, but my focus was mostly on imaging. 3D imaging is, had been my uh, PhD and postdoc uh, uh, emphasis. And after coming back to India, I ran into my two co-founders from IIT Delhi, Anuj and Tanmay. Uh, and then we started working on drones because drones is comparatively an easier technology and a more of an upcoming technology to work with. So now, uh, how did we land up with swarms and how swarms can make a huge difference 
uh, across the board when we talk about uh, only uh, defense applications. So, um, so first we were making individual drones and then we realized uh, uh, from IIT group, so we could probably add a uh, advantage uh, by uh, developing a swarm. Uh, what the swarm means is when you have a number of drones operated by a single user. So in 2018, uh, our group was the first one uh, to have built a swarm of 10 drones. And uh, we demonstrated to Indian Army uh, on Army Day, and then we took our systems to Pokhran uh, for the validation. And uh, in Pokhran, uh, we realized that uh, building a technology defense grade uh, takes a much, much more than you know working some systems in IIT Delhi. And uh, so then uh, we started building technology uh, completely in-house, and uh, eventually we were able to connect uh, uh, more than 3,500 drones recently. So now coming back to how a swarm can uh, actually help, and I think everybody has talked about India and Russia war. Uh, drones have significantly been enabling uh, one side or the other, but swarm on the other hand has not been used uh, uh, as much because swarm technology is still in infancy stage. Uh, in India, the capability is currently where the drones are talking to each other, they're smart, they have uh, uh, intelligence built in, and they can go a distance of, let's say, beyond 20 kilometers, is still very limited in India. So the, the most groups that in, in our country uh, can demonstrate is maybe at most 20 kilometers. And uh, when we talk about swarms, we also talk about a different kind of UAVs, can be small or big. So all these things are still yet to be worked out. But in future, uh, warfare uh, or even any other drone application, you will be seeing more drones because anything a single drone can do, multiple drones will be able to do much better. And I think... Okay, so uh, that's well explained. And I'll come back to you, the dual use of technology because your swarm drones can also have enormous dual use impact. Uh, one of the things is that the drones can actually alter information acquisition process because your swarm in large numbers can cover the tricky boundary areas such as the LOC, which is 740 kilometers, and the LAC with the Chinese now, which is more in the news, is another three, 400 kilometers. So the swarms can actually go out in a, in a horizontal pattern, picking up information quickly, allowing commanders to draw the big picture to see where to focus on. But I'll come back to you on some of these issues later. But Dr. Raghav, now I need to understand from you the space suits or the drone suits that you make. Uh, as I was telling you over lunch, that you need to have a tactical approach to that because it's one thing to exhibit scientific capability. It's another thing to put it to good use for national use. So what do you have in mind? As of now, it's uh, solving the technology problems with a view of uh, some sort of applications for sure. Mm. Uh, as these are very, very new uh, which we are seeing, uh, world over we would have probably seen about four or five individuals or maybe small companies who are attempting to uh, work on such technologies. The first jet suit, it was called as rocket belt. Uh, why? Because it used rocket propellants, hydrogen peroxide kind of, uh, uh, kind of propellants, right? So it's, it's been, it's been, uh, almost 60 years since then, and we have not seen any significant uh, improvements uh, in terms of uh, compact, wearable personal air mobility. Uh, applications, I'm sure there can be lots and lots of applications, both in the civil uh, uh, area and also in the defense area. Uh, so our focus has, has been to solve the technological, uh, or rather technology problems, 
in terms of propulsion, uh, in terms of giving more autonomy to it, more safety, and also being uh, compliant to the regulations, right? So that's the technology part of it. And talking about the applications, uh, to directly uh, move into the civil space, you know, we need to deal with DGCA here and, uh, and FAA elsewhere. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, there has been a good interest from the armed forces. Uh, even before we, we uh, started to fly, started to even fledge, uh, there has been some interest, and, and we are already uh, I mean, talking to the armed forces to understand when, uh, what kind of applications do they need it for. Uh, even are, we are have. You speaking to the Army Research Bureau in uh, uh, Bangalore? Army Research Bureau, yes, I think they have a small extension of uh, ADB. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so uh, applications, you know, we would like. Uh, uh, End users to come and uh, rather talk to us on 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 okay. what's off. So yeah. you know, uh, two points quickly. Uh, one is when you talk of the military, you only don't look at offensive purposes. You know, there are logistics and defensive purposes that your kind of equipment can help. Yes. For example, yeah. carrying medical supplies at short notice to front line. By the time a vehicle or a helicopter reaches there, it takes much longer. There are processes involved which are very time consuming, longer than the flight time. Yes. But your chap can fly in, a doctor can fly in with that and immediately attend to serious cases. Also, passing information at double quick time when your cyber network and your phone network is jammed. You can send a messenger with that. Commanders can reach the spot on quick time to actually stand on the ground and see how the situation is evolving. There are historical examples of that, that commanders on the ground altered the situation when they got to the ground, as against sitting with a map and a command room. But I'll come back to you with something else. Uh, Dr. Sarita, now I need to understand from you, how do you <clears throat> hope that your swarm can actually be commanded by pilotless drones in multiple locations at the same time. If the situation unfolds and there is firing near Kargil and there is firing near Jammu, but your swarm is required. Now, is there some way of somebody controlling it <coughs> or they can just go and send photography back? Uh, so. Uh that will be very futuristic, uh, but currently, let me give you, paint you a scenario where what, you know, rest of the world is doing. So if you look at how US and China operate, so Swarm, uh, currently, they are also operating at 50 at max. Uh, so you take 50 drones, and because, as I said, the range is limited, so they have them packed in the, uh, in a truck. So you move the truck near LOC and make them, you know, take off from there. Or you can have them in a plane. And yeah, 20, 20 kilometers range is good enough. Yes. Because if you're not offensive, you can be well behind the line of control and not be shot at because most of the ammunition used to hit helicopters and other things don't have a range more than four kilometers. So you can be at a distance and still get you photography, still get you information. But just explain to us what kind of command system did you have in mind? Yeah, yeah. So, uh so the, uh, the second is that you can operate them from air or you can operate them from a vehicle. And uh, the current system that we have built in that each drone has a camera. Uh, in addition to a payload, it can see individually and communicate uh, to the base station and also among themselves. And uh, so you talked about master when you talked about birds. So in drones also, you can have different kind of topology. You can have master and slave, one drone controlling rest of the systems and they uh, uh, collectively decide that what they need to do, scan an area or take some action. But the kind of system that we are building now, so if any of the system is brought down, even if the master is brought down, the rest of the slaves can decide who is going to be the master by a consensus. And so the operation is not affected. So what uh, we have in mind going forward is 
because the range is limited, command can be. So what we are putting is a repeater system. So if you want to increase the range of the swarm, you can have a drone follow the swarm and then uh, increase okay. the range. I, I'll come back to you. Think over the next question, and that is what kind of funding, what kind of government support are you looking at? Well, I'll come back to you afterwards. Okay. Dr. Raghav, now I need to understand from you the military applications of offensive use of drones. Let me give you an example. That if you want to carry out a commando raid across the LOC, a group of 10 well-trained commandos can play havoc on the other side. Remember 2611 just had a handful of people and they catered mayhem in Bombay. So a good trained commando outfit, uh, they call them teams. Now they can actually completely uh, psychologically uh, block the commander's thinking if behind his back attacks are taking place. And your chaps can fly about 10 kilometers range, so they can take off from this side, from Uri, go there, land up, blow up a headquarter, come back. Now, have you thought of that? And the second thing is, the one area that we were talking about is the possible minefield crossing. But again, minefield crossing, you will need to provide equipment to at least 35, 36 soldiers for a platoon to go across to remove a nest of eight, 10 soldiers on the other side of the minefield before you cleared the path for others to go through with more elementary means of clearing a minefield. Now, what is the kind of funding that you would require, say, for 35 suits as against 150 suits, as against 800 suits, a battalion level? So what is the numbers you're looking at? I mean, because I'm told the 1,000 odd drones that were used, and somebody said so the other day in a conference that I hosted, had an expense level of about 65 lakh. Am I wrong? It, what is the kind of money you're looking at? I, I think that question is... Yeah, I'll ask her, but what is the kind of money you're looking at? For the... You mean yeah, suits. human. Each suit, Each what suit, is the okay. kind of thing you're looking at? You right. can multiply. When it goes into scale, it will obviously, the cost will come down. See, the cost of uh, a jet suit, uh, not just the jet suit, but I mean, anything for that matter, with volumes, the cost would drastically come down. I know. Right? As of now, it's in the prototyping uh, stages. You know, we are still improvising. There are more and more uh, versions of the jet suits are yet to come. Uh, based on the endurance and the capabilities, um, and the ranges, et cetera, and what kind of safety levels, you know, what kind of compliance requirements. Why? Because compliance is a huge cost for us, right? So, uh, and ultimately, you know, we are going to offer the systems only with compliance, right? Uh, either it is military use or even the civilian use. So, uh, see, the cost of developing one jet suit as of now has been about half a million USD. Which yeah, but that includes R&D. Yes, yeah. right. So uh, going ahead, if we are looking at hundreds of them, you know, each suit could be about a crore of rupees. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's yeah. an acceptable figure considering the yeah. fact that what are you going to look at? 150, 200 crores. That's the cost for one fighter yes. aircraft. Yes. Even lesser. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'll come back to you on that now, Dr. Sarita. I need to understand that swarm drones require government funding. The problem has been till now that DRDO seems to get most of the government handouts, most of the support, and it's a sort of comfort option for the government to go for, and I mean the bureaucrats in the Ministry of Defense, that, oh, you know, DRDO is our trusted white elephant, so let's put a little fodder more in front of it. But what kind of expectation do you have from the government to support this because the former Army Chief General Naravne was on record to say that the last century was dominated by tank warfare. The coming century is going to be dominated by drone warfare. And drones are not just, we're not talking about drones usage only in ground operations. We're talking of their usage in naval operations. We're talking of their usage in even air operations. So your expectations from the government should be high because the Prime Minister has said that they want India to become the drone manufacturing hub of the world. I think it's a tall order, considering the Chinese are well ahead of us. The Turks are also manufacturing a lot. So what is your expectation? 
सर आई जस्ट वॉन्ट मे कपल ऑफ पॉइंट तो पहली बार तो एक्सपेक्टेशन वेन पीपल लुक एट ड्रोन इज द मूवी रेफरेंस एट ऊरी यू मेक सो अभी वेर द ड्रोन्स आर वेर द इज शोन इन यूट्यूब एंड मूवीज इज स्टिल ह्यूज गैप सो द ड्रोन्स आर नॉट एज एडवांस नॉट जस्ट इन इंडिया नो वेर एल्स देर आर लिमिटेशंस एंड द सेकेंड वेन यू थिंक ऑफ कॉस्ट एज माई को पैनलिस्ट सेट द कॉस्ट ऑफ आर एन डी इज अ लॉट and i think when you talk about in india uh, we want a product but we don't want to invest uh, uh, in the r and d and the you know the the tough cycle of a product development and that's as we been seen with every technology and with hardware you see lot more so the kind of money you need and depending on what kind of system you are looking for so let me give you one example so in russia um, ukraine war Uh, the turkish drone gets mentioned a lot berekta right it's a warfare kind of a drone uh, it first it took around 250 million dollars to get this thing ready and also we don't have time in india we want things everything made yesterday yeah. right so it took uh, from the day it was made it took 9 years uh, till their army inducted it so in that 9 year that product especially a defense product uh, gets fine tuned to the application so it's not only just the money uh, you also need this patience of providing test fields certifications a lot goes into building a technology so when it comes to drones so for example us so uh, in india uh, nobody gives you funding at the initial stage when you have an idea yeah, we yeah. literally have suffered lack of funding for 5 years till we had something to show off uh, then we started getting some funding and most right. part we have been funded by government right right so now let me give you figures in what it takes to make a swarm of 10 drones so uh, one drone with a thermal because you need thermal camera and all it would be in the range of 12 to 15 lakh just bill of material not adding the manpower understood and then you multiply by number and the base station so it runs into a simple swarm will run into crores or two okay. plus crores yeah i i'm completely with you on this i think what's important and here's a suggestion that you must establish contact with the army in particular that needs drones and get them to work with you on specifications there is a limitation on the indian front and the limitation is you first make a product and then these chaps land up from army at corridor and they say oh ho oh, oh, ho it shouldn't be flying that low it needs to fly a little higher i did a conference 2 years ago and i remember the late general bipin rawat suddenly said oh i need drones that fly over 14000 feet and luckily the drone manufacturer had a film running next to him which showed that the drone going over khardungla pass i said there it is it's going over 19000 feet he said oh yaar ye to bahut badhiya cheez hai he told his staff officer ask him to come and see me so what you need to do is you need to match the only of the three services that really works closely with the industry is the navy so i think the army and others you need to push for it you need to promote yourself and then we are talking business now finally last question to you what is it that you would expect from the government uh funding though we've been trying uh i have understood that it's impossible to get any front from the government number one uh why because there are no routes and channels uh for the government to fund the private companies directly of course now there are uh, uh, i mean dst and idx etc but one uh, uh major setback in that is uh, they take a lot of time and uh, too much of paperwork uh, which i think is how it is um, i have no complaints over that but i mean can we take it up you know do we develop the technology work on technology or or spend all the time in um, doing the documentation part of it and then sending them papers after paper volumes of that right so uh, uh, we have also understood that on the on the private funding side uh, essentially uh, there is no fund for r and d yeah no fund I, for research I, and development i'm with yeah. you and times up i think what you need is somebody to champion your company's work because there's one thing to innovate and design and create there's one other thing to find a suitable buyer 
Uh, we are totally out of time, and thank you very much for your brilliant insights. And I think all of us have got a, a little great closer understanding to the whole business of drones. Most importantly, and I think that's the underlined aspect, you need the government and you need the services to come out and support you. Otherwise, Atmanirbhar Bharat, at least in the drone field, will remain a dream. Thank you very much. Good day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alawat, Mr. Reddy, and Maruf for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd love to know your thoughts on India's digital future, so please share your opinions and perspectives with us on social media. Don't forget to use the hashtags India Digital Fest as well as hashtag IDF2023. Now let's, uh, Sumit, move on to a different sector altogether, right? We were just talking about military and warfare. Let's now talk about education. Mm -hmm. The National Education Policy 2020 has taken a very symbiotic view and established that since technology is rapidly evolving, there is also a need for specialists to deliver high-quality e-learning, encourage a vibrant ecosystem to create solutions that not only solve India's challenges of scale, diversity, equity, yeah. but also evolve in keeping with rapid changes in technology mm -hmm. whose half-life reduces with each passing year. Exactly. Well, our next topic is very exciting. It's called Digital Revolution in Education. Uh, we'd like to invite up on stage the Vice Chancellor of Ramaya University of Applied Sciences, Dr. Kuldeep Kumar Raina. And so I'd be in conversation with you. Let's. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raina, for being here with us. Now, digital, uh, the impact of digitalization on education, yes, we've spoken about it so much in the last two years, especially with the pandemic and how things have changed, especially in that sector. But, uh, you know, technology is no longer only an option just for early adopters. It's being seen all throughout the whole spectrum of organizations. It's not just education startups we hear of fintechs, edtechs. It's not edtechs, just the startups. It's established institutions also. More importantly, besides the basic conversation around that, I want to delve deeper with you as to how the future of learning, the future of education is changing because that is one sector that has been hit, has been impacted very much by digitalization, by technology. Just your initial thoughts on that. How are you seeing things develop in, the, in your sector? Uh, good afternoon, and thank you, Sumit, for uh, such a wonderful question. But at the outset, I would like to thank Times Group for associating Ramaya University of Applied Science and Knowledge Partner. I think when we say that future begins here, I think we in the university, in the education domain, education space, say that we are here to create the future of the generation of generations. And in that context, you know, very, very pleased that, you know, you are raising some pertinent questions uh, when it comes not only up sickling the people, but also it has a why and all of us, those who are in this auditorium and all listening to us as well, uh, education and the university system has always contributed mm. in developing the knowledge and sickle sets, but at the same time, it has also created a kind of sense of belonging to each one of us. So in that context, just a brief, that we at uh, the university system in the Ramaya University are always focusing towards developing the capabilities, not only giving the degrees, but I think there is a lot of learning mm -hmm. which goes behind mm -hmm. uh, training the people, cycling them, innovating the thought process in their mindset to create something good, not only for our country, mm -hmm. but the global community. And for that, Sumit, I think uh, education is going to be there more and more things are going to be coming up. Uh, think 30 years back, when uh, in 90s, we were not sure in which direction we are moving, but today we talk of chat, GPT, and whatnot. This country had resources which were not compatible to teach computer science programs, but today our workforce, the manpower is doing some wonders. 
Absolutely, and not just what you mentioned about the global impact. So not just Indians in India, but Indians around the world making such waves in technology. You mentioned Chat GPT. We are here at the India Digital Fest. So of course, I have to take that ahead with you. The impact of AI in education. How uh, how do you see that? Uh, do you feel that? that AI would be taking over the human form of education the way ahead. There have been so many reports of how uh, students have used chat GPT to write uh, papers, uh, uh, thesis for different uh, uh, big exams, even you know passing these bar exams and other yeah, exams. Yeah, Sumit, uh, challenges at every, every sector. But I think chat GPT uh, replacing teachers and the human beings, I think it is beyond any contradictions. I believe that it is we the people, the gray levels that we have in our mindset, mm. that we have created that GPT. It did not create human beings as on date. So I think our role, role of the fraternity of the teaching community is going to be there and very, very important, very, very significant. But all these are the offshoots mm. of the technologies that we evolve. Mm. I think we the people, when we teach in a class and make students to go to a, a domain of the laboratory, the prayog shalas, I think that is where new and new thought process comes. Today we talk of AI, ML, as a dominating tool, or chat GPT. What is going to be there after five years, we don't know today. I think it is we, the people, who create the sense of curiosity in those young minds, the sources of the future the energy, something new is going to come up. It has come, it will phase out. Mm. We learned computers from the basic, COBOL systems, photon, where is that? It's not there. That means the knowledge generation is taking a leap forward. Mm. So in that context, I would say, we, the people, mm. are going to be there. We, the teachers, the fraternity is going to be there. Yes, evolve newer tools, yeah. which will facilitate, will communicate more effectively, and bring better lives to the people. And peace, prosperity, and we as Indians, can we rule the global community in the knowledge domain? I think that's a big challenge for each one of us. Absolutely, yes. And uh, uh, Dr. Raina, how do you see the overall ecosystem moving? Because what I'm trying to say, like what you're saying is every few years, things come around, changes come around. So it's important for an important sector like the education sector to also reinvent itself regularly. In that case, maybe the restructuring in the ecosystem, regulatory uh, restructuring, regulatory movement. Your thoughts on how that can be achieved to keep the education sector relevant as time moves on? I think uh, uh, if we look at three years back, in June 2020, Government of India made an announcement of the implementation of the new education policy. If I look at it as an academic, holistically, I think it is a turning point in our thought process to bring in flexibility, curate the new thought process, and bring technology in the forefront. I would personally see, and we all as the vice chancellors in various fora, when we discuss and deliberate, I think it is one of the significant things. What evolves out of it is certainly, which today we don't know, but when we talk of researching, I think there is already some great knowledge which exists. I think we have to go deeper, penetrate at the foot and see that what is unsolved and can we provide a solution towards that. I think the new education policy is one such document, is a policy document, which is going to give us a great space, a great thought process. Yes, don't expect results tomorrow. I think it is going to take some time. And we at Ramaya University, when I was listening to Raghavendra, working in the composite systems and all that, I think we have created universities, we are working in them. I think we have nucleated such new thought processes, uh, Sumit, that we and they, yeah. not only Raghavendra here, but each one of us, let us shake hands to create new knowledge for the betterment of the people. Flexibility, local, regional, everything will be taken care of, provided yeah. we think unison, and that is creating new knowledge for the betterment of the humanity at large. And we yeah. at Ramaya University, every effort goes in discussing and deliberating, even revising the curriculum from time to time, making it not only industry friendly, but learning friendly too. And looking yes. at the global players for our partners in higher education at various levels, how they and us can work together 
in making a different ecosystem of learning in the education institutions. I'll take that point uh, one step ahead, because again, you mentioned the global aspect. So now I know that uh, uh, Ramaya University, you have 13 plus faculties, you've got various MOUs signed with national government bodies as well as international institutions. What's the plan ahead to provide maybe, uh, you know, formalizing digital education with where people from across the globe can avail the campus experience of education sitting in any remote city. So what, what, what are some plans? Well, I think, you know, this collaboration is a partnership where we share knowledge. We are not, uh, you know, I would say uh, borrowing only the knowledge. I think they and us work together in this domain. I personally see that their advice, their suggestions, their cooperation is uh, adding value to our newer thought process and creating an environment where our students and their students can work together. Can we create a template? Can we create a temp platform where there is going to be exchange of thought process? We in this country are not new to uh, creating new knowledge. It has been there for centuries. But I think today we are in a different domain where global community is slowly and steadily uh, right. recognizing our efforts, our contributions. Whatever we heard since morning, I think it is a it is all contemporary that we are there and we are there to exist. I think in that case, the universities, not only Ramaya, but all universities are contributing significantly in developing the human capital. Perfect. So one last question I have for you. So the important thing is when we're talking about you know, the redefinition of education through digitalization, it's also important that there are some mindset and behavioral changes that should be brought in also. Uh, both in the people that are taking the education as well as the people that are passing on that education. Your thoughts on what kind of training programs for educators and for people uh, that are required to adapt to this mindset? See, you know, the, the, our university system provides, when you said about the 13 faculties, you name any specialization, we have the expertise. Right. Health sciences to technology, social science to the legal sciences, design to management, commerce to product design, artificial intelligence, user interface and user experience training. I think everything is there. So networking, hybridizing, and in that case, I would say we are there to contribute. We are there to, uh, to inspire the generations to come forth. And for that, when we look at the cross-disciplinary and the transdisciplinary approach of education, I think university like ours, who offer such variety of programs, without having a boundary between one discipline to another, are going to be the new norm in new education system. I would say here, digitizing is the core theme of this discussion, the deliberation. COVID certainly gave us a spark that we had to come out, and we have also at Ramaya developed the, we are developing the training skills in our faculty members, we are conducting various FDPs and the MDPs, sickling, absolutely sickling everyone so that right. an ecosystem is created which will help each one. I think we are there to provide opportunities to yes. everyone. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rana. It was an absolute pleasure to have spoken to you and for sharing your thoughts on the space. Thank, thank you, Sumi. Thank you very much. And thanks, Times Group, for associating us in this wonderful event. Absolutely. Future Begin is here. And future is also in the university system. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raina, for that. Now, uh, Bot Labs Dynamics is amalgamating the art of storytelling and steadfastly advancing innovations in drone technology and pioneering the automation of intelligent unmanned aerial vehicles in India. We heard a little from uh, Dr. Alawat earlier in the session with Mr. Maruf Raza. Now, the research-oriented startup incubated at IIT Delhi with more than seven years in R&D for UAV applications, BotLabs Dynamics has built their complete gamut of solutions in-house to ensure flexibility and precision while deployment. Now, building indigenous technologies like swarming from the ground up and in-house design components the startup is working towards building an ecosystem that makes building hardware 
easy in India. In fact, their first show at Rashtrapati Bhavan, where a thousand drones took to the skies over Asina Hills for the beating retreat ceremony on 29 January 2022, put India on the map as the fourth nation in the world to have a show of this scale. They even set a new record by hosting the world's second largest drone show with three and a half thousand indigenous drones lighting up the skies for the beating retreat ceremony in 2023. So to expand on how India's crusaders have embarked on mission innovation, please welcome back on stage managing director and co-founder of BotLab Dynamics, Dr. Sarita Alawat. Uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'll be, I'm very fortunate to share our work with you today. And um, uh, so I just want to take a moment and say that drones have wide range of applications. So let's say from uh, surveillance to you know reconnaissance to payload taking. So uh, and in that, several countries have taken advantage. And we have been talking a lot about US, China, and now uh, smaller players have also made a huge difference. And uh, so when we talk about defense drones, uh, there are larger UAVs uh, which have taken decades to build. And uh, so the, uh, we are not there yet as a country, but we are uh, slowly getting there. So with the point of this slide was, to give an idea that to build such a technology it takes a long time and also large amount of uh, resources. And they run into hundreds of millions. And, but uh, when it comes to drones, uh, it's not just the larger UAVs that make uh, a smaller drones that you use for recreational purpose can also cause a lot of damage. So this Russia and Ukraine war, Chinese drones that we use for recreation uh, just take pictures and weddings have been actually used and then now U.S. is banning uh, China from supplying such drones to Russia because it's really causing the damage. Uh, and uh, so when it comes to India, uh, there are several players in India and you'll be very happy to know there are more than 200 startups in India that focus on drones. So drones is such a large opportunity when it comes to the market size and that's why uh, I think it's the right time for drone community to grow and uh, they can be uh, from heavy payload to small drones there are a wide variety of drones and and that's why there's a space for almost everyone to build this technology and it can't be addressed by one entity whether it's Reliance or Adani and these groups are already present in this domain uh, so why is it a good time for India to build drones, but also why it's also a challenge? So if you have noticed, I labeled my presentation as fun and frustration of building hardware technology. The fun part is it's the right time to build. The frustration is that uh, when it comes to electronics, semiconductors, India do not have any capability. And uh, there's a huge deficit of 50 plus billion. Uh, dollars, we are pretty much importing everything when it comes to smallest of electronic components. And so with all this constraint, we started our journey uh, from IIT Delhi in 2016. And uh, so we felt that Swarm technology made sense because it was something new that India did not have. And Swarms don't have application just in defense, but they have application across the board whether you talk about surveillance, transport, disaster management, or entertainment. So this is where we started. Uh, we were initially optimizing the individual drones, increasing the range and the payload. Uh, this is a picture uh, we took at Tawang border near China, and uh, a drone was flying very near to the border and trying to supply something to the soldiers sitting there. And, uh, and here is the small clip of the 10 drones that we first made in 2018 that flew from IIT Delhi. And uh, this actually put us on the map. 
and because building a swarm technology takes a lot of uh, intelligence so the, you need computer vision you need networking protocols and you need swarming algorithms and it really takes a long time and also skill set uh, to build a drone swarm and we have been very actively demonstrating this capability to indian army air force and uh, we took this to pokhran in 2019 and that's where we learned our first very hard lesson when you assemble the systems they may not perform as well in indian situations so after coming back from pokhran uh, we realized that we need to do something and in a while i'll just come to that but uh, in the meanwhile i want to just show you another clip uh, to show that you might see a small drone it's a part of the swarm it's detecting a tank and it's hitting the tank there so such kind of capabilities lot of group like us are developing where you can save the soldier life and and save also on time and our group is now recently also involved in building a smaller drone that you just carry in your hand and throw and it can give you the situational surveillance uh, and this uh, project is funded by government it will take around a year to materialize Uh, so uh, coming back to the story of pokhran after coming back what we realize is that assembling may not take us far we took uh, we took a step back and we started uh, realizing what is that we can do to make this completely atmanirbhar operation or how can we make it completely not dependent and reliable technology so what we did is uh, we built the entire electronics which we were previously importing uh let's say from switzerland china and america and that's why those systems were not performing as well so we made our own uh, flight controller motor controller and precision gps it took us two years we used this covid time really well we stayed on campus during the covid time and uh, we built the entire drone in house so the drone is built indigenously completely the design hardware and the software and because you're building locally so now you're empowering local vendors also to participate in your journey and uh, so we started miniaturizing the system miniaturizing the electronic component that has been our expertise and with that capability uh, fortunately ministry of defense gave us an opportunity and they asked us if we could connect 1000 drones and make something out of it Uh, and within 6 months with the government help we flew 1000 drones from rashtrapati bhavan and it made a big news and this year we connected 3500 drones from rashtrapati bhavan and this made india the second largest country in the world uh, to have such capability moving forward we really thank you so much so moving forward we want to connect 7500 drones because the record is held by china with 5200 drones so we're hoping by republic day we can break that record and make a india truly a leader in this domain thank you so much uh, so what is that we have done differently so we went to the basics and we started designing so here is a real picture of the gps uh, that we have built in our lab and in that firmware and the connecting protocols are all written by us uh, other than the chip but the entire thing is built locally and in this uh, you will be happy to know uh, that we have also integrated navic so navic are the satellites indian satellites that india has put so now our gps in addition to the international satellites we can also detect our own satellites and hopefully uh, in some years Uh, our drones and cell phones can completely run on the gps system uh, the information that is given by the satellites from indian con uh, indian uh, from indian systems so we have been expert in uh, miniaturizing and this is the current status that we are now integrating lot of sensors on a single platform here is example of x shape pcb which has everything that a drone needs to fly so it's very small and because of that now we will be able to miniaturize the system uh and when you fly drones in large numbers you actually accumulate lot of data and that allows your system to become better and also 
you can make a simulator so without even putting your system in the air you will be able to do things much more efficiently and i would say in this we have not been alone though the journey has been hard but we've had some very good uh, partners along the path so uh, i would take special uh, i'll take a moment to give a special thanks to indian air force army design bureau idex ministry of defense department of science and technology and uh, tdba and these are the bodies that made this uh, possible for us to be at this stage right now uh, so i just uh, want to say it's still a challenge uh, to be working and since i was asked to only focus on defense so i would just so when you work closely with defense there's still something called ncnc no commitment no cause uh, what it means is you can demonstrate your technology to defense but uh, they it's all on your cost and especially from a smaller group from startups is very difficult so even if you make a technology there is something called l1 that you have to work around and all those systems make it very difficult for uh, so i that's why i say developers dilemma because when you're a developer you can't be focusing on all those aspects so there's still challenges that need to be worked out and uh, this is the uh, three of us uh, in 2016 tanmay anuj and i started from iit delhi and i'm very happy to share now our group is more than 88 strong and is making to build this new technology easier thank you so much but we've been also very fortunate to get uh, lot of attention and awards and recognition from the country and because of that now we are able to become self sustainable and with that i'll say thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, dr lawat may i request you to stay on stage just for a quick chat with uh, megna deka my colleague she's a senior editor for times now megna over to you Thank you so much, Sumit. Dr. Alawat, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here. We are completely in awe of your work. You may say this is the developer's dilemma, but for us, it's the spectator's pride. For Indians to see something like that, so big round of applause. <laughs> Truly well deserved what you've managed. I remember the first time I've seen your work on display was in 2000, uh, 2022, over the rise in our skies when we saw about a thousand drones lighted up. You had the tiranga on. uh on in the skies and you had the mahatma portrait also which came up and then we said wow what a spectacle that is and this year you actually brought in 3500 and which is why i am so in awe of the work that you've done and all of us are wondering when you talked and you drew a parallel about a flock of birds they are also communicating with each other last thing we need is drones crashing into each other <laughs> so how do they communicate how do they engage with each other and what's very important as you were telling maru they are also making decisions what is human interference and what is the level of in human interference which is required in a drone swarm so actually it's a uh, lot of hard work what you see 10 minutes of flight and the formations uh, behind that there is uh, Uh, if you uh, talk about on site it's literally on rashtrapati bhavan our team was for a whole one month mm -hmm. and you practice and uh, so let me get to the software part of it so we do not just put the swarm in the air and start running them so we first uh, create an animation create files and we run them through a simulator so the simulator decides if there is a collision or not if there is a collision we change the path and recreate the animation then only we take the files and put them in the air and uh, so now the second question on communication so when you talk about drone light shows kind of drones or small drones they are communicating to the base the base is sending them uh, corrections so our gps that we are very proud of that i showed you has a 10 cm accuracy so a typical gps that you see uh, is a, a couple of meters so when you are in meters you could collide right because you and i are like meter 2 meters apart and so what this gps corrections do is it keeps constantly talking to each and every drone and tells where you are and the drone also has a gps so this correction and you're talking to satellite all the time so then you really know where you are at an accuracy of 10 cm so when we are flying them in the air that's just we keep much. them 
a meter apart. So we take a safety margin. So they can come less than you know a meter, but we are taking them a meter apart, and they themselves won't come in uh, with this error. What if one of them malfunctions? They do. So they do? Uh, 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 because the technology, as I said, the drone technology is, and that's why you don't see drones coming from Ames and delivering you medicines yet. Uh, because of this, uh, so there are safety measures that we take, something called geofencing. So if I were to fly drones here, we make three layers of geofencing. So this drone, if they happen to cross this, they will be forced to land or crash. So they are not allowed to leave the uh, perimeter that we have told them to. Okay. So that's very interesting because the Indian Army, and they've gone on record saying swarm drones are niche and they are the disruptive technology when it comes to the next level of warfare, and a huge edge is expected to be given to our forces when we use swarm technology to the extent that it actually has the aptitude of being used. So what is the kind of surveillance drones that you're working on? I believe you're working on disposable drones as well. Yes. What is that, and why is that important? So what we are working is situational surveillance drone, a drone uh, small, uh, maybe just six inches uh, tall. And the idea is to you just take a drone. So let me take a step back. And when you think of a drone, you need a remote, you need to operate it. And that's a big headache. Like if I give you a drone, I have to teach you how to fly and all that. And that has been a challenge for any operator. So uh, the challenge, what we are addressing is now build a drone that doesn't require any um, flying like that. So what you can, you can operate it through your cell phone okay. or from a tablet. So the, we have made the operation easy. So anybody who can operate a cell phone will be able to operate the drone. Now the drone. So the drone is very small. It's going to be fitted with the thermal camera and the daylight camera. And you throw the drone and it will give you surveillance situation. But then you'll ask you, why do you need this fancy? Why do I need to throw the drone? <laughs> right? You can just leave the drone. So the drone is designed specifically for armed forces which are in difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So they are firing a gun and they really need to see what is happening behind the wall. So the drone will be tagging on the dress and they just throw it. Mm -hmm. And now immediately they can put the tab down and immediately see what is happening and the drone has capability to come back. And it's interesting, you're talking about the surveillance, but then the aptitude of a drone being used in warfare, one would wonder, are you also developing kamikaze drones? Can they actually zero in, lock in on the target, destroy it, annihilate it, and return? Yes, absolutely, and that's very exciting. And the, if you remember the one uh, video clip that I showed, so we made, these are called kinetic strike drones. Mm -hmm. So they work in a swarm, they can come up to from three kilometers, and they have a computer vision on them. So they can identify, in this case, we had identified a tank. Okay. So they will not hit anything but tank. So you can feed anything else and machine learning tools, you can tell that you need to strike a building or strike a human or something. In that case, uh, that's what we, we, we told them to strike a tank. And they found the tank and they struck it uh, with an error of one meter. And how much of payload is possible to be carried by one drone, which are the bigger sizes that you've used? So the one we have made is we are playing around with one kg payload. We are not venturing into bigger drones. So most of our drones are limited to one kg payload in addition to camera and other things. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because uh, we've been discussing, and uh, this is something that Maru's of course spoken about, how far can a drone travel? Can it cross a border? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So there are drones, and as I said, there are 200 startups which are working on drones. So some drones can go up to, you know, so the, the larger drones that I showed, uh, their range are in, you know, 200, 300 kilometers, Barakhtar or the Predator drones. So they run into hundreds of kilometer range, but they are not operated by battery. The right. one I showed you, they operated battery operated. The, the ones you have with fuel operated. So there are also drones which can refuel other uh, aircrafts. Wow. And it's important for us to point out, unfortunately I've been told that we don't, we're running out of time, but we can use it for Kisan drones. Yes. We can use it for fertilizers. It's not just about that. In fact, the Prime Minister once said, uh, you know, flying a drone should be akin to uh, riding a bicycle. Everyone will be able to do that. When will that happen? So, uh, good news is that uh, in Agri-Drone, India has made a huge progress. We are not one in that sector. But uh, there are like close to 100 startups just on Agri. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, so they are catering to farmers across india north to south and mostly just one second the pesticide spray is what they've been used for why pesticides is because when you spray by hand pesticides uh, irritate your skin is really bad for your health but when you do it with the drone it actually saves uh, so it lot saves of the farmers and uh, they can be cancerous if you are yes. in touch with the pesticides you are actually able to save the lives of farmers and ensure their health and that's very important so finally i need to wrap it up but uh, one quick promise i would need from you dr elawan and here we have all the top bosses of times network we have all the bosses of uh, whatsapp next time when we are going to uh, collaborate with whatsapp and times network comes together are we going to ensure that we don't have these lights or these drips and we are going to have your drones and uh, technology doing it we'll try we'll try certainly thank we'll you. hold you to that <laughs> dr elawat everyone thank you, loud, thank loud you dr elawat and thank you megna for that All right, we have to move on now, and we have a very, very interesting session uh, next. Now, so we uh, earlier in my session also I spoke about Chat GPT. So as we all know, when the AI research laboratory OpenAI launched Chat GPT in November 2022, the artificial intelligence chatbot reached one million global users in just five days. Now, based on the generative pre-trained transformer language models, ChatGPT leverages reinforcement learning from human feedback, or RLHF, to learn and adapt natural language used by humans and mimics it to stimulate conversations. So it's no wonder then that ChatGPT has emerged as a global in innovation phenomenon. But you know, the other side, there is still a challenge of AI hallucinations a question of censorship and algorithmic bias to name a few so of course there's a lot of confusion there's a lot of excitement we clearly need an expert to decipher the good the bad and the ugly of chat gpt and ai and luckily we have him with us right here ladies and gentlemen please welcome on stage humanist and futurist gerd leonhard for a special talk <laughs> Namaste. I hope the future is better than the music. So, <laughs> great pleasure to be with you today. So, I live in Switzerland, and my job is to speak about the future. It's very important to realize that the future is not something that we can predict. It's a future, something that we can have intuition about, and hunches, and ideas. And first of all, the future is not something that just happens to us. The future is defined by what we do today. Right? The future is something that we make. It's very interesting when I talk about my work and generally speaking about the future entails, many people have this idea that you can kind of have a safe and easy future. But the reality is technology is absolutely changing everything in our lives, as we've just seen. And on the one hand, I look at technology, I look at uh, uh, digital data and cloud computing and all these things. And on the other hand, I look at what it means to be human. Because what is the good of great technology if we can't be human? We have a great example in social media. Amazing technology, lots of money being made by advertising, but social media has become a major issue as well. Not because of our kids, but because of the way it changes opinions and the way that we receive information. So our mission in the future, especially in India, being such a large country, where we know everybody is now connected, right? We need to make sure that we find a way of balancing the power of technology with the power of humanity. And I think what we're seeing right now in chat GPT and AI is what I call a Sputnik moment. Remember the Russians, when the Russians put the Sputnik, Americans freaked out, right? Because apparently the Russians were ready to go to Mars or whatever, and now, Microsoft, Google, and everybody wants to go to the moon with chat GPT. Do we realize, however, that we only went, allegedly, to the moon once? Right? We didn't go back. Right? So everything about space travel, of course, is making a big comeback now, but chat GPT is kind of like this. It feels like a giant reset moment, but you know, first we have to go to the moon, okay? And we have to talk about what is real and what is not real and separate the hype from the, from the 
uh, from the truth. And, you know, if you see the numbers in India, it's quite clear that India is now becoming a digital masterpiece, so to speak. Right? Now we need to figure out what exactly are we doing with this? And if artificial intelligence is going to be used by what is it now, 800 million Indians that are connected, soon with 5G, what will they be doing? I can guarantee what they'll be doing is to pull out their mobile and speak to ChatGPT and ask questions about anything and expect that to be the right answer. Now, this would obviously be pathetic. Right? This is like Google Maps. We all use Google Maps, but we know, you know, it's sometimes not so accurate. We laugh about it and we, you know, we turn it off and it's a fact of life. It's not the truth. And when we look at opinions, it's hard to find the truth, right? It's hard to find the definitive answer. There is no such thing as an answering machine, right? There's a search engine, that's great, because we make up our own mind. But an answering engine, that's, that's, that's un inconceivable that the technology would give us conclusive answers about everything. And so I want to ask you, what do you believe in? Do you believe in technology being better than humans? Uh, in other words, uh, we don't have real soldiers anymore. We have AI soldiers and we don't have politicians. We have AI politicians, uh, which some people have suggested. What do you believe in? Right? Do you believe in technology or do you believe that we have to put the human inside and put the human over technology? Think about that for a second. Right? I mean, in the end, Technology is a tool, like a hammer, and ChatGPT is a fancy hammer. Right? A guy who builds a house with a hammer does not pray to the hammer. He may pray to the house, you know, that he has built, or the village he lives in, but the hammer is just a tool. If he doesn't have a hammer, it's a problem, but, you know, we have to make a difference between the tool and the purpose. Okay? And that is a very important uh, definition, especially when we talk about education, for example, which I'll comment shortly, really what it comes down to is this. We're going to have to hyper-collaborate to figure out what to do about this. Here in India, and I live in Switzerland, so in Europe, but on a global level, because if we take artificial intelligence to its conclusions, it could in some ways become so powerful that we stop understanding what we are. Right? Because we'd be using essentially a way of digital inclusion that wasn't meant to be as easy as it looks. Sorry, I had an accident a few days ago, have a bit of a nose problem, but I'll try to continue. So I made this film called The Good Future, in Lanzarote, in the Canary Islands. And here, I shot a film about the future, trying to understand which way we're going, how we can keep the human in sight. And while I was shooting the film, sorry, just one second, Sorry, just one second. Check, check, yeah. So God will be with us back in a, in a minute. Uh, sometimes technology does have different impacts, different effects. Um, of course, it's been a very exciting session so far. Important points uh, while we wait for God to come back. A couple of important things. Do uh, post about us. The hashtags are IDF2023 and hashtag India Digital Fest. Uh, we do have more exciting uh, presentations coming up, uh, talks coming up. They're important panel discussions as well, where we'd be talking about different uh, areas of where um, digital will impact, rather has impacted life. We spoke about how it's impacted warfare, education, uh, we travel, in fact, that was some very interesting uh, one of my, so. Uh, in fact, I, I do, we have uh, Callum Chase here. If, uh, Mr. Chase, if I could have you to come up on stage uh, and continue the session if, uh, you could be kind enough to do your, your part, yes. So uh, uh, Mr. Gerd Leonhard will take a quick break.
we will continue back with his session in a short while. Until then, just uh, inviting up on stage uh, Mr. Callum Chase for his session. So would you, you have the headset, so you are free to... I have the headset. I need a clicker. So yes. Slide. We will get you the clicker. We will get you the clicker as well uh, so that you are comfortable to do your session. <coughs> Right, one second, I'll just get this one. Yeah, this is the check. Right. Yes, this is your clicker. Thank you very much. Um, sorry for not giving the proper introduction to Mr. Callum Chase, but he is a very famous author and futurist. The author of this very interesting book called Surviving AI. Interesting that now you are going to be talking to us about that after the whole day that we've been speaking about that. So without further ado, over to you, Mr. Chase. Namaste. Oh, good. I hope he's getting better. What would you say if I said that on that stand, I've got a big red button? And if I press that big red button, then you and all of your families and the whole of humanity will live for as long as you like in perfect health and with the cognitive and physical abilities of a minor deity, not Lord Sheba, but say Hanuman. Would you be interested in that? I expect you probably would. But of course there's a catch. The catch is that if I press that big red button, then there's a chance that the entire human race will go extinct, gone. So let's have a show of hands. How many of you would like me to press that big red button? Good on you. Two. All right. How many? Oh, three. Um, how many of you would prefer I didn't press that big red button? Most of you. And the rest, presumably, you don't care. Okay. Okay. Well, that's interesting and perhaps a bit unfortunate because I'm afraid humanity has got its finger on that button and we're not going to take it off. So, the title of my talk is, Can Digital, Abil Can Digital Ability Surpass Human Intelligence? And I think the answer is unquestionably yes. I'm going to spend the rest of this 30 minutes or so explaining why I think that and what the implications are. The digital ability that I'm referring to, obviously, is artificial intelligence. So let's just get clear about what that is before we start. Artificial intelligence is two words. The first word, artificial, is very easy to define. It simply means something created by humans, or possibly by aliens, but not by God or by evolution. Intelligence has more different uh, definitions, but my favorite is just four words. Goal-oriented, adaptive behavior. So it doesn't mention humans. Intelligence is not something that is restricted to humans. Many animals have intelligence. Machines now have intelligence. An AI is something which pursues a goal and learns as it's pursuing that goal and adapts its behavior accordingly. And the science of artificial intelligence got started in 1956 in Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, one of America's Ivy League schools, Ivy League universities. And the delegates to that conference were very ambitious. They thought that within a year, they could replicate all the functions of a human brain. It was a nice idea. Uh, not for the last time, they were rather over-optimistic. Right from the start, there were two types of artificial intelligence. One type was to replicate the behavior in a simplified way of the human brain, of human neurons. And it was called artificial neural networks. And the first ones were called perceptrons, and this is what they looked like. But in 1969, a book was published which seemed to prove mathematically that these could not work. And so the other form of AI took precedence, which was known as good old-fashioned AI, or symbolic AI, in which researchers try to translate every kind of human thought, every kind of human communication into computer code. And that also didn't work terribly well, and so there were a couple of AI winters during which researchers just couldn't get any money for their, uh, for their work. 
Towards the end of the last century and the beginning of this century, AI did do some quite impressive things, particularly in 1996, a system called Deep Blue, built by IBM, beat the world's best ever human chess player, which wasn't bad. Garry Kasparov, that chess player, accused them of cheating, and he was probably right, but he got over that. All this change, though, all this relative failure, all this failure to make money, which was the critical thing, it all changed in 2012 when there was a big bang in AI. And in 2012, a researcher called um, Jeff Hinton, known as the godfather of deep learning, he got artificial neural networks to work effectively using an algorithm called backpropagation. And he and some others rebranded artificial neural networks as deep learning. Now, there were three things which enabled Hinton to do that. The first was a process known as Moore's Law, named after a man called Gordon Moore, who very sadly died last week, rest in peace. Gordon Moore was working at Fairchild Semiconductors when he noticed that, the, that that company was putting twice as many transistors on each, on each chip it made every year, he thought at the time. Now, Moore's Law has evolved over the time. It went from one year to two years, back to one and a half. Uh, clock speed was added and various other changes have happened. But what it means is that machines get twice as powerful or half as expensive, whichever way you look at it, every 18 months. And that's been going on ever since 1965 when he first noticed it. The second change which enabled Hinton to achieve the Big Bang in AI in 2012 was the availability of enormous data sets of labeled images. And a woman called Fei Fei Li is the unsung hero here. She created ImageNet. And an enormous, enormous amount of effort went into labeling millions and millions of pictures. And of course, most of them are cats. And then the third thing which enabled Hinton to, to create the Big Bang was the availability of GPUs. These are a type of transistor which is very well suited for deep learning. It was originally developed for video games. And they replaced CPUs in AI systems. And since the Big Bang, since the Big Bang in 2012, AI has made money. In fact, it's made lots of money. It's enabled Google and Facebook and some other firms to create the biggest companies in the world. And Google and Facebook in particular have done this by essentially taking advertising money away from Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch doesn't like that very much. And so there's been a tech lash against the tech giants. Personally, I think it's a very good idea to take money away from Rupert Murdoch. I think we should do it more. The, probably the pinnacle of public awareness of AI, thanks to deep learning, was when a, a, deep, a, a system created by a company called DeepMind, which is based in London but owned by Google, they created a system called AlphaGo, and that beat the world's best Go player. Go is a much harder game to win with a computer than chess. So that was in 2016, but since 2016, the world got a bit bored with AI. We got, we got distracted by other things. But, as the introducer said, um, at the end of 2022, the world started to pay attention. Firstly, there were things called generative AI systems, which showed an amazing ability to create photorealistic images based on just a prompt, just a, a sentence or two from a human, like this one. And then in November, a system called ChatGPT was released. 30th of November, and as our friend said, within four, four or five days, it had a million subscribers, a million users, and uh, by mid-December, it had 100 million users, which is the fastest uptake of any, any app, any tech uh, in the history of tech. And then, two weeks ago, on the 14th of March, GPT-4 was released. Now, ChatGPT isn't the best um, large language model or foundation model, as they're called, in the world, but it was just the one that the public was first able to play with. The public hadn't been able to play with anything quite so good before. So that really woke the world up. But GPT-4, released two weeks ago, is a real game changer. This is a very, very powerful system. It's very impressive. Can I just ask, how many of you in this room have had the opportunity to play with GPT-4? Put your hand up if you have played with GPT-4. This is excellent. So somewhere between a third and a half. That's great. That's really good. GPT-4 not only passes the bar exam in America, it comes in the top 
GPT-3 passed but only came in the bottom 10%. It is qualitatively different. And the reason why it's been possible to launch this system is that in 2017, there was a second Big Bang. So the first Big Bang was in 2012, Jeff Hinton. The second Big Bang was in 2017, when some researchers at Google published a paper called Attention is All You Need. And in their lovely geeky way, they were riffing, obviously, on the famous Beatles song. GPT, Ch ChatGPT and GPT-4, the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformers. So they're relying on transformer technology, which uh, fortunately has nothing at all to do with these guys. Now, what transformers do, what transformer AI systems do, is in principle very simple. They are trained on enormous data sets, much bigger than the deep learning system, because the trick is they don't have to be labeled. These data systems don't have to be labeled. So GPT-4 was given the whole of Wikipedia and millions of out-of-copyright out of books and many other data sources. And what it does is it, predict, it predicts the next token in a series. A token can be a word or a part of a word uh, or a piece of code or a bit of an image. What they do is they look back into their corpus of data that they've got to be trained on, and they play peekaboo with themselves. They mask a token and try to figure out what that token ought to be according to all the context, all the words around it, backwards and forwards. And then they reveal the token to themselves, and if they got it right, great, they give themselves a pat on the back. If they don't, then they adjust the model so they get it right next time. Now, before I go on to talk about the likely impacts of GPT on the, the uh, workplace and on uh, society. Anand asked me to talk a little bit about the place of India in the AI industry and make some general remarks about that. You'll notice that the country I've talked about uh, is, is the USA. And that's because almost all, well, most of, cutting edge AI is developed by these six tech giants. It's almost all developed in America. Um, to these six giants, we ought to add DeepMind, which is an AGI lab based in London, but owned by Google, I mentioned before, and OpenAI, OpenAI based in San Francisco, founded by Elon Musk and Sam Altman, and um, that is now heavily invested in by Microsoft. In addition to America, China is a big player in cutting-edge AI. China has its own tech giants, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, are their analogies to Google, um, Facebook and um, Amazon. But also in China, the Chinese government is a major investor in, in AI, which is not true in the States. So you've got America and you've got China, and that's everybody else. This is a chart showing all of the tech giants in Europe, all the wonderful tech giants in Europe. And I'm sorry to say this, but all the wonderful tech giants in India too, and in the rest of Asia, and in Africa, and in South America. There are none. And I think this is a bit of a problem. I mean, I might be old-fashioned, but I don't think it's a great idea for humanity's most powerful technology to be a duopoly of China and the US. No, res no disrespect to either China or the US, but I think the rest of the world should be playing too. There are rankings drawn up of where different countries sit in the AI industry. And I know that India is incredibly wired and very digital, and that's great but it's about number 17 or 18 in the world in AI rankings in terms of its production of AI systems. But actually, nobody should get terribly worried about that because truth is, as you can see in this chart, you've got America way out ahead, you've got China in good solid second position, and then everybody else is scrabbling around for third position. Uh, poor old broken Britain with Brexit and the, one of the most corrupt and incompetent and deceitful governments in world history is slipping down the rankings, slipping back into the pack. But there's a, just a, a gaggle of other people in, in third place. So that's one remark about India and the rest of the world in the AI industry. Another interesting thing about the AI industry worldwide at the moment is there's a, there's a bit of a paradox. Research into AI has been galloping ahead like nobody's business, but deployment of cutting edge AI is really restricted to the tech giants. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is, in order to deploy deep learning, the type of AI which came to the fore in the 2012 Big Bang, you need huge amounts of compute power, you need massive amounts of data, 
and you need very expensive, very talented AI experts who are extremely picky. You know, they can afford to be picky, they get very well paid, and they like to work with each other, and where they all are is in the tech giants, so that's where they stay. So there is this paradox that AI is, going, is galloping ahead but not really being deployed yet, and GPT technology will probably change this. Because unlike with deep learning, with the GPT systems, you don't need these AI experts, you don't need masses of data, you don't need masses of compute, you simply use the platform that the tech giants give you. So the GPT systems will probably democratize cutting edge AI. Now, about a third or half of you have used GPT-4, but the rest haven't, so I'll just quickly explain the kind of thing it can do. So GPT-4 can listen to and record a meeting, either on the phone or in, in real life. It'll recognize what's been said better than humans will. It'll transcribe it and summarize it for you. And that summary, you can choose how it prioritizes the comments, and you can change it. And you can speak to it and say, oh, um, actually, I really, want to, I really want to hear what Mr. Anand said. Give me that in full and you know, dial down what everybody else said. And it will do that. And then you say, actually, no, he didn't say anything interesting, so dial him down as well. You can do that iteratively and verbally. So ChatGPT4 can also write the first draft of a consultant's report. It can produce a fully functioning website just given some handwritten scribbled notes. It can produce an analyst report. It can produce a table, given some rough data, produce some charts from that, that, from that data, and then answer some specific queries so a manager can make some decisions. So it's going to be interesting times for those of us who are knowledge workers, and I think probably that's everybody in the room. Somebody who um, is CEO of a company that offering services to analysts using GPT-4 said to me that he thinks that his clients, the people working for his clients, their work will be sped up by a factor of 10, thanks to GPT. Now, what does that mean? If you have an analyst department of 10 people, does that mean that the bank, the organization that employs them, can get rid of nine of them? Or does it mean that they'll keep the 10 and they will do much more value-added work and produce 10 times as many really interesting reports. We don't know, and it will probably be somewhere in the middle. This obviously raises the possibility of widespread permanent technological unemployment, which I wrote a lot about in, in this book. Now, technological unemployment is the result of automation, and automation is not new. We've had automation for a long time. The poster child for it is the agricultural industry because agriculture used to be every industry. So in America, in 1800, 80% of all workers worked on farms. In 1900, that number was down to 40%, and now it's about 1%. And the grandchildren of those people who used to work on farms are now working in shops and offices and having much better life, actually, working much more interesting and safer jobs. When that happened, that mechanization People had to move from the countryside into the city, and that was really uncomfortable, and frankly, quite a few people died. But even though all those jobs were taken by machines, mechanized by machines, it wasn't a problem in the long run for humans, because when the machines took our muscle jobs, we had something else to offer. We had our cognitive abilities. That was great for us, wasn't so good for the horse. The horse had fantastic muscle, but nothing else. So, in, 2015, so in 1915, there were 21 and a half million horses working in America, and now there are 2 million. Well, actually, there were just 2 million horses in America, they're not working. So 21 and a half down to 2 million, that is spectacular. Um, in fact, if you'll pardon the pun, unbridled technological unemployment. Now, we've got a new type of automation coming. It's no longer just mechanization, it's cognitive automation. And that may well, in fact, I'm pretty sure it will, eventually lead to massive widespread technological unemployment, but not yet. Uh, machines have to get able to do pretty much everything we can do for money in order for that to happen, and that's not here yet. So looking ahead a little bit, I mentioned Moore's Law. Because of Moore's Law, the smartphone in your pocket, and many of you already know this, the smartphone in your pocket has more compute power in it than NASA had when they sent, sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. Um, and that is true, it is true, but it's out of date. 
In fact, now a good toaster has more compute power than NASA had back in 1969. Now, some people say that Moore's law is dead or dying, but it's not true. It's evolving, which is what it's always done. And the result of that evolution is this. Assuming something like Moore's law continues, and there's every reason to believe it will, that in 10 years' time, the machines we have will be 100 times more capable, more, more powerful than the ones we have today. In 20 years, 10,000 times more powerful. And in 30 years, an incredible million times more powerful. I personally don't want to compete in the workplace with a machine a million times more powerful than chat GPT or GPT-4. But there are lots of commentators who deny that technological unemployment can happen. They say it's the Luddite fallacy. They say automation has uh, not caused lasting unemployment in the past, which is true, because otherwise we'd all be unemployed, um, and therefore it won't in the future. And that is a really dumb argument, because just because something hasn't happened in the past does not mean it can't happen in the future. If that was true, we wouldn't be able to fly. So I think that uh, to deny the very possibility of technological unemployment is dangerously complacent. And if we get there, we're probably going to need a really different type of economy, and I describe this in, in some detail in the book. Uh, some people call it the Star Trek economy. It's the economy of abundance. I like to call it fully automated luxury capitalism. But the economic singularity is not the end of the story because now we get back to our friend, the big red button over there. This is the technological singularity, which, which will follow the economic singularities after some time. And it's when we create an artificial general intelligence, which is a machine which has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human. So it can do everything we can do and a bit more. And because machines can be improved in ways which we unfortunately can't, it will go on to become super, a super intelligence. Initially, hundreds of times smarter than Einstein, eventually millions of times smarter than Einstein, which may sound like science fiction. I'm sure a lot of people are uh, sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, there's two ways of doing this. One is to carry on doing what we're doing, using deep learning, using good old-fashioned AI, and using transformers to continue to make our AI systems better and better, and eventually we get to AGI. The other way of, doing, uh, of getting to AGI is uh, is, is whole brain simulation. So you take a brain, preferably from somebody who stopped using it, and you map that brain, you, you map the wiring diagram of the brain, which is, the, which is called the connectome, which rhyming with genome. And one of these two systems, one of these two approaches, possibly both, will get us to AGI, unless there's some magic going on up there. If you believe that, fair enough. I, I personally don't. And it's interesting that the two most uh, capable AI labs in the world, I call them AGI labs, they are targeting AGI. They're explicitly trying to create AGI. Demis Asabis, the CEO of DeepMind, thinks that it will happen sometime this century. He won't be drawn on when he thinks it will happen. Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, which, as you know, launched uh, ChatGPT and GPT-4, he thinks AGI will come in a decade or so. If and when we create a superintelligence, it will be the most important event in human history, and it will either be the best thing or the worst thing ever to happen to us. Because we will become the second smartest species on the planet. And at the moment, chimpanzees are the second smartest species on the planet, and their future is entirely decided by us. There's half a million or so of them, there's eight billion of us, and they have no say in their future. If we decide they live, then they live. If we decide they die, then they die. And they are very lucky, because they don't know about that. Now, if and when we get to superintelligence, what will happen? The Terminator scenario is not, despite what some people would tell you, it's not impossible. The idea of a, of a computer system which wakes up, has a look around, takes a look at us, and thinks, yeah, and decides to wipe us out, is not impossible. The problem with the movies is that we survive more than five minutes. But we'd have to be really stupid and really unlucky for that to happen. It's more likely, more dangerous, that we will suffer a nasty outcome because the AGI, the superintelligence, is indifferent to us. It doesn't hate us, doesn't love us. It just thinks it's got rather better uses for the atoms that we're made of than we do, we have. Or, or, or it, it uh, decides that it would be a better world if there was no oxygen in it. So there's some pretty uncool possible outcomes, but the upside outcomes are remarkable. So DeepMind, one of these two AI labs, AGI labs, has a two-step mission statement for itself and for humanity. Step one, 
solve intelligence, create a superintelligence. Step two, use that to solve everything else. And they really mean everything else. War, poverty, death. Take death, for instance. 150,000 people die every day around the world, and 100,000 of those people die basically from aging. Aging causes uh, dementia, heart disease, and cancer. And we know, more or less, what causes aging at a high level. There's about 10 factors that cause aging, but curing them is unbelievably complicated. We really need superintelligence to help us fix that. Now, there's some very cool upsides, there's some very uncool downsides, so what a lot of people very sensibly say is, let's push on the brake for a bit. Let's stop this process until we know how to make sure that the transition to superintelligence is safe. Unfortunately, to do that, we would have to, exp we'd have to persuade every single one of the 8 billion people in the world that it was a good idea to stop, and that now is the time to stop, and that we can stop, and that nobody should cheat. Well, good luck getting the South Koreans to do that. Even better luck at getting the Brits to do that. So, frankly, I don't think that relinquishment is feasible. We have our finger on that red button, and we're not taking it off. So, to summarize, I do think that digital ability can surpass human intelligence. I think it will happen. Two big questions are remaining. When and will we like it? I used to think, and these are frankly guesswork and it's all you can do, I used to think it's probably about a generation, 25 years until the economic singularity and then another generation until the technological singularity. Now I'm, I'm basically halving those timelines because of GPT-4. I think maybe it's 12 and a half years to economic singularity, so 2035-ish, and another 12 and a half, so late, 20, late 2040s to AGI, which is not very long. Now, it's always a good idea to put some historical context around things. Oh, sorry, I should just answer my other question, which was, will we like it? When we, when we get to superintelligence, will we like it? We don't know uh, whether an AGI, whether a superintelligence will look at us and think, you're a possible threat, I better get rid of you, or I just don't like you, I better get rid of you, or um, you're competing with me for some resources. On the whole, I think we're unlikely to be a threat to it, because once it's much cleverer than us, we, like the chimpanzees, can't hurt us. We won't be able to hurt it. And I think we're also unlikely to be competing with it. So my guess is that a superintelligence will actually quite like us because intelligence craves stimulation. And we are 8 billion incredibly varied and incredibly ingenious, ingenious, yeah, inventive and ingenious little entities which the superintelligence would hopefully like to have around. And I think our best future is to combine with the superintelligence. So I said, uh, let's have some historical context. A lot of people say that this is the fourth industrial revolution that we're in, and I think that is profoundly wrong. I think we're in something much, much bigger than a fourth industrial revolution. I think we're in the fifth human revolution. The first one, about a million years ago, is when we tamed fire and stopped being a completely negligible primate and became quite a powerful predator. And then we had the cognitive revolution um, 70,000 years ago when our language developed to the point where we were able to collaborate on sophisticated projects, and then we became the apex predator on the planet. 12,000 years ago, different times, different parts of the world, the agricultural revolution was a miserable thing for individual humans. If you ever get the choice between being a subsistence farmer or being a hunter and gatherer, choose hunter and gatherer, it's much more fun. But for the species point of view, it was great because it means we could create food surpluses and we could specialize. And that led to the creation of cities, and cities are machines for innovation. And that led to the Industrial Revolution. And that gave us mastery over the planet. Maybe that's not such a good thing, but it did. And now I think we are in the early stages of the Information Revolution, started around about 1960, and this is going to have a much bigger impact than all of the previous episodes. So as I said, I am optimistic. I don't think we're heading towards dystopia. But I also don't think we're heading towards the opposite of dystopia, which is utopia, for two reasons. Firstly, I don't think the universe is configured to allow, allow perfection. I just don't think it's possible. But also, even if it was, it would be boring, because nothing would change, and so you couldn't have any fun. You couldn't tell a joke. You couldn't take a risk. So I much prefer an idea um, written about first by a 
brilliant man called Kelvin Kelly, who uh, was one of the founders of Wired magazine. He talks about protopia. And protopia is a world in which everything is really very good. And it just keeps getting better and better. And I think that's what we should aim for. So I will leave you with a thought, a stanza from a rather obscure British philosopher called James Allen. Dream lofty dreams, and as you dream, so you shall become. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chase, for that. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was the author of Surviving AI, Caleb Chase, and talking about, well, surviving AI, can digital ability surpass human imagination? Well, uh, Mr. Gerd Leonhard will be joining us very shortly. Before that, we have one other session, which is equally interesting and intriguing. Now, as we know, India has taken a lead in world fintech inclusion with an adoption rate of 87%, which is substantially higher than the global average of 64%, according to the National Economic Survey of 2022-23. Now, the Indian fintech market growth story has been supported by several macroeconomic factors, such as the country's booming economic growth, uh, with rising disposable income, large unbanked and underbanked population, friendly government and regulatory initiatives expanding young adult population, improving internet access, increased smartphone penetration, and an incredibly fast-growing e-commerce marketplace. And with an estimated market opportunity of $1.3 trillion by 2025 and over 420 active fintech startups, the industry is poised to solve problems of access, reduce friction, and basically attract capital to India and also help, uh, help reduce friction between customers and financial institutions. Now, to talk more on India's giant leap in digital banking, we'd like to invite up on stage the Division President South Asia and Country Corporate Officer India MasterCard, Mr. Gautam Agarwal. And I'd like to invite Aisha up to have the conversation with Mr. Agarwal. Thanks for that, Zumeth. Gautam, welcome to India Digital Thank Fest. You, you know, um, Caleb was just talking about the five stages of human revolution, and I don't think it's possible without digitization, and I don't think any of it is possible without digitally banking, right? Tell me, what's been your experience at MasterCard over the years about how the digital banking age has evolved in the last few years? Well, listen, uh, digital banking uh, is quite, uh, fintech or digital banking, the term that we use in the last five years is a phenomenon that MasterCard believes has been around for 50, 55 odd years since we've been around uh, and others. Uh, the, the idea is essentially allowing uh, money to move, if I were to use that, uh, in a more transparent way uh, and in a way that people can do electronically and don't have to use paper, right? Now, paper can mean cash, paper can mean checks, paper can mean, you know, notes or whatever. So essentially, digital banking in its nascent form is nothing but that. Now, of course, the modern terminology of digital banking as we, as we know it today is all about open banking. It's all about cyber and safety. Uh, it is beyond payments. It's now getting into insurance. It's getting into credit access, all of that. Uh, but I think my, with my experience, I would say for us, the, the, the thing on digital payment where it started was really with digital payments, actually. You know, when we first talked about a paperless economy, I think that was because of demonetization. And since then, of course, a lot has changed. And, you know, we were talking about this at lunch as well as to how unique a market India is. Uh, tell me, from your learnings from MasterCard all across the globe and all across other emerging market economies, how is it that you imply and implement your learnings from across the globe to a unique market such as India? See, India has become a little bit of a, a learning. It's, it's actually teaching the world how to do digital payments, if I were to say that. Uh, it's actually quite ironical if you think about it. Uh, up until about five or six years ago, even in a company like MasterCard, when we looked at uh, payments and electronification of payments uh, in the consumer payment sector, I'm not talking about commercial payments, because commercial payments have been 
electronified for a while, India was doing about only 2 or 3% of consumer transactions electronically. Mm -hmm. And those were primarily on cards, right? The rest was primarily all cash. You know, if you went to this ice cream stand to buy the 20 rupees ice cream, mm -hmm. you would pay cash, right? You went to an Nehru place to buy equipment for your computer for 1,500 rupees or whatever, you know, you did it on cash, right? You don't even do, go to Nehru place anymore. Well, I, I still do, actually. I'm a geek. Uh, I still do. Uh, but what has changed, uh, you know, with, with, with the advent of, um, you know, demonetization was, of course, the beginning of it. But with the technologies such as UPI, what has changed, it has changed the mindset of people. Uh, now people are transacting today using digital technologies, right? UPI, MasterCard are all examples of what people are using. You know, I was uh, uh, in Singapore last week, I was meeting with an Indian banker, and he was telling the story uh, that he was in, uh, I think, one of the, uh, either Kaziranga or uh, Corbett, I forget which park, but, you know, he has been going there and taking pictures uh, of wildlife for the last 10 years. And he said up until about two years ago, he always had to carry cash with him to do that, right? And he told the story that now he was carrying this, uh, you know, this app, and there were places where he just had to scan the, the, the UPI code, if you will, or any kind of QR code, and he could just make the payment. So he said he used no cash actually in that entire trip, which was a very powerful, you know, story that I heard from him. Mm -hmm. So I think what has happened in India is India is actually telling the world how to do this. Now, important thing to know about this is, uh, if you think about it, uh, you know, payment technology companies such as mine, we have been at it for the last 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. However, we've made progress. But what has happened is in the last five or six years, the government has supported digital payments in a big way. Yeah. Whether it is through regulation, whether it is through mandates, whatever it is, UPI success story is a combination of emerging technology. It is a combination of you know, technology being there, user experience being created. It's the fact that the mobile phones now exist. People have access to mobile phones. Internet connectivity exists. It's all of that. But a big portion is because the government is really pushing it hard. Mm. And I think that is something that India is teaching the world. And we are seeing this. You know, I, in my just prior role before this current role, I was based in Singapore. And countries like, you know, Thailand, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, they're learning from what India has done and putting a regulatory framework around digital payments, which we did not have. So that's what India is really teaching the world. And we ourselves in MasterCard, you know, when de demonetization happened, uh, we, we were the first, I think, international player who were able to create a soft pause. What basically meant was we were able to create your smartphone into a payment acceptance device. And we took that learning ourselves from, from India to some of our other countries. So that was our learning in that process. So in many ways, I think India is teaching the world how to go about digital payments. Mm. You know, you were just talking about your friend's experience at Kaziranga or Corbett. Um, but how long before digital penetration, and especially when it comes to banking, reaches tier two, three, or four cities as well in India. Because while you and I may not have even seen our bankers face or even gone to our banks for I don't know how many years, at least I can talk about myself, everything is digital, right? But that's not the same when it comes to Bharat, still. So listen, Bharat, I, I love the fact that you're using that term because that's a term I have been trying to use uh, at MasterCard now as well. We st we, I'm saying let's not call it India, we, let's call it Bharat. So what has happened is, uh, you know, a combination of things. It is, whether it is banks, large banks, or whether it is telecom players, they are actually now using their access in the villages to promote banking, right? So the fact that today a villager has a phone on his hand, the fact that there is education going. So education is a big element of this, right? There's a amount of, huge amount of education going on with the villagers, with the MSMEs in these villages, we were telling them the benefits of digitization. And so I think the fact that they have a phone that is connected to the internet, the fact that somebody is coming, whether it is starting from the panchayat, whether it is happening with the village elders, the fact that bank officials are coming, telecom officials are coming, the fact that the small Kirana shop today is a, a recharge shop, the fact that you, know, you can pay bills electronically from there, all of that is, is creating an experience for those rural you know, villagers, if you will, to understand the benefits of you know, digital and the benefits of banking. And therefore, what has happened, if you, if you think about it, uh, the Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana started, what, about six or seven years ago, uh, in which I think 450 million bank accounts were you know, opened, and people said, oh, these are all empty bank accounts. They are sitting with about $25 billion today of money in it. So that's, they are not empty bank accounts. And that's a big number. So the kind of uh, uh, scale that we've seen in India in the rural sector itself is, itself is very staggering. Right. You know, uh, you talked about 
everyone having a mobile phone, and that's pretty much a reality. They may not have a fridge or an AC at their house or a washing machine, but everyone has a smartphone, right? Uh, we're already talking 6G while we are still just about migrating to 4G, Bharat that is. What happens when we progress to 5G or when all of India becomes 6G? What would it do to the future of banking? See what happened in India, if you uh, think about it, uh, in, in our homes, really the phones, the, the, the landlines were something that were primarily in cities, tier one, tier two cities. The villages never really got it, right? Very few houses and villages, maybe the, the, the block secretary or the panchayat had it. And so India already took a leap forward when the first wave of uh, you know, wireless came about, right? Which was about 15 odd years ago now. Uh, I think um, what has happened since then with the, with the transformation of technology from 1G to 2G to 3G and so on and so forth, speed has only increased, right? And we are seeing that in India, uh, you know, to your point, 4G is still something that is still emerging in India in many places. What will happen with 5G and 6G is two things are going to happen. One, still a lot of rural players are not using a smartphone, they're using a feature phone. So two things will happen. One, these feature phones will now be able to work faster because technology will be there for them to respond faster. Today, the feature phones that they have don't do that. But more importantly, I think what will happen is the innovation that is happening around apps today. You know, again, if you go back to UPI, I forget the exact term, but UPI has a version where you can actually transact uh, through NPSA. You, you can transact using a feature phone. You don't really need a smartphone to do a money uh, transfer, right? I forget what that, uh, what that technology is called today, but it is there, right? So you will have to continue developing those kind of technologies, but the fact that 5G and 6G will make it faster, the dispensation of banking uh, uh, features, if, if I were to say that, would be more easily available to a, a rural or an urban player for that matter. But tell me, Gautam, with all this technological advancement, especially when it comes to uh, you know, banking, I'm sure there are hindrances as well that you face, right? Because you're operating volumes and masses of progressing, progress, uh, progression happening at almost a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Absolutely. So firstly, I think uh, uh, technology adoption always requires, in my mind, three things, right? Uh, people will adopt technology a, if it is relevant to their needs. So it is, you know, in that sense, uh, innovative that it is solving the problem that I have. Just because I have created a piece of application or, or solution that looks cool to me as an engineer or a product owner will not make a difference if it actually doesn't solve a real problem for the end consumer. So I think that is one, one of the biggest challenges of technology has always been how do we make sure that whatever we build is actually relevant and solving a problem. And I think with this whole concept of A-B testing, user experience testing, labs that we have now globally, that is a way to make sure that whatever is being developed solves for that. The second thing in a country like India, whatever we develop has to be inclusive. Because if you develop a solution that is only meant for a certain segment of society, it won't work. Because a country like India, it has to scale across urban and rural sectors. So it has to be inclusive in that sense. And that goes back to my earlier point that whenever, you know, payment features were be, being built by these applications. They had to think of feature phones, smartphones, text-based text phones, all of that. And the third biggest element in, within technology is the element of trust and or security. If I do not trust the piece of technology that is in front of me, or for that matter, anything, any process that is in front of me to do my job, I will not use it. Now, what happens with technology, and it has happened with, with digital payments also, there is digital fraud that happens. You know, cybersecurity is a big concern. You know, the government, uh, I think, only la in the last budget, declared 600 crores, earmarked 600 crores, to actually uh, work towards cybersecurity related you crimes. Know, I, I was just going to come to that. I'm sorry to interrupt you here, because a lot of people are still very scared of putting data and knowledge as crucial as banking out there into the digital space. And that, that goes back to the point on trust, right? So I think that's why the, the importance of trust. I have to be able to trust the piece of technology that I'm working with. So we within MasterCard and of course all of the companies you know, that are in this space are working on creating tools that create that ecosystem, right? With this trust being created. I was giving an example about this uh, the other day to somebody where you know, uh, up, up until about two or three years ago, we found a phone that could do biometrics, whether, whether it was thumbprint or whether it was retina scan, as a very cool and secure thing. Mm. Quite frankly, it's not very secure, right? 
because today, if I were to actually be able to copy your fingerprint, you know, you've seen this in movies all the time, and I were to wear one of those things, I could get into your phone, right? There are enough ways to now develop a mask which can have your retina scan and I can actually get into your phone. So there are other ways. So we have gone at MasterCard, we've actually developed technologies where on, on the mobile phone, if you actually think about it, when you're holding your phone, there are about 1,000 variables that are different on how you hold your phone versus how I hold your phone. Yeah. So we have created technology where we are actually not only looking at the biometrics, your physical biometrics, we are actually looking at your behavioral biometrics also to know whether it's actually you trying to log in. And I tried this home. You know, my kids, I have young kids, and they come to me very regularly and they'll say, Babu, please show your face, and they'll lock, unlock my phone with, with my phone. And I don't want them to be using everything that I have, right? So now we have a way. The, the technology can actually tell you whether it's me holding the phone, whether it's me pressing the phone, whether it's somebody else. So I think those kind of innovations will have to continue to happen, you know, in parallel for, that, for, for you to continue to build that trust. But one last element I do want to talk about related to your first earlier question is all of this will not work if the regulatory and the government support is not around there. You know, a, a great example is, you know, you will continue to have bank fraud, you will continue to have payments fraud, because something will go wrong somewhere. Somebody will be able to hack into some system. But when a fraud happens, the banking ecosystem has to have the right governance in place where if, say, my money goes from bank A to bank B in a fraudulent manner, and bank A knows that it's gone to bank B in a fraudulent manner, there has to be cooperation between the banks so that the money can be recovered. That doesn't exist today, right? We will talk about, you know, regulation policies that are going towards that. But we need that kind of framework also in place for technology to be perfectly working. But tell me, uh, so then are you consciously at MasterCard investing more in data security? Is that an obvious? Absolutely. So uh, to give you a number, if I, if I know, remember this right, since 2020 alone, we have spent close to a billion dollars globally in cybersecurity or security-related products, whether it is we building our own products or whether we acquiring products from elsewhere. We have a whole team of people in, in India, you know, one third of our workforce is in India today, who are actually doing a lot of research in, you know, cybersecurity, AI, ML. Uh, we believe uh, in the last two years alone, we have actually uh, uh, processed about, uh, you know, we process about 10 billion transactions a month. In that, I would say we have actually pre uh, pre prevented close to $30 billion worth of fraud, right? So we are, uh, cybersecurity and security broadly, is probably the second biggest pillar of MasterCard after payments where we are focused on and you know we continue to invest in. I also wanted to talk about how machine learning in general helps banking, right? The latest buzz in the fad word is chat GPT. Does that hinder your business in any way or aid it? Uh, so a little fact about me is about 25 years ago, uh, I left India to do a PhD in AI ML. Uh, uh, and uh, within a year, I realized back then, AIML had no commercial, you know, viability, right? Because it was a theory that professors love to talk about. And are you saying it's just a walking, talking <laughs> Wikipedia? No, it, it was just because the compute power was not there, right? 25 years ago, or it was expensive. What has happened since then? We have a lot of compute power today, and we have a lot of data available. Mm -hmm. So AIML is a real thing. Chat GPT is a very interesting thing. But it's not new to MasterCard. We've been using AI. I've been at MasterCard close to now nine years. And I remember my very first day, we were talking about what our AI strategy is going to be. And we, we use AI in two ways. We are using AI for internal processes within MasterCard, where our backend processes, whether it's you know, our financial processes, whether it is our operation processes, where we are learning about you know, the behavior of our employees uh, and who's, who's logging into which system, how fast are they logging in, Based on that, you know, we are making decisions on who has access to what. So we are using AI a lot already for our internal processes. But beyond that, pretty much today, all our payment transaction, every single payment transaction that we process today, goes through some sort of an AI engine today, where we are uh, qualifying the transaction, whether it's a fraudulent transaction or not. In fact, you know, if, if you use your card today, there are times where, it, and if you've set alerts for your, for, for your card, and if you're using a physical card, you will notice you take out a card from your pocket, you swipe your card, or you tap your card, or you dip your card, whatever you do, even before you actually take the card back and try to put it in a pocket, your phone or your email system will get an alert of some sort, mm. whether it was a right payment alert, whether it was a AI process alert saying this is a fraudulent transaction. It happens in nanoseconds. 
and that has only been possible because we as a company have been investing in AI. We may have not called it AI back then, we may have called it data analytics back then. We have been investing in this for a, for a very long time. And for us, uh, we continue to look for ways to you know, improve and look at other technologies that we can benefit from to bring to our fold, whether it's through investments, whether it's through buyouts, whether it's through partnerships. So it's, a, it's the, probably the third most important thing you know, after security, I guess, that we, we spend our time on. Gaga, when you look not five, but maybe 10 years ahead, what role could digital currency play at MasterCard, run by blockchain? Uh, so blockchain as a concept or technology, I think is a very interesting technology, and we are continuing to investigate and invest in it. Uh, whether it will be Bitcoin or something else is very hard to say. We believe that when it comes to payment instruments, we will continue to play in payment instruments that are regulated in some sort. So digital currencies that are backed by some sort of a government entity is something that we will continue to invest in, we will play in, and we will like to participate in. Uh, blockchain as a technology, I think, has use cases beyond payments, which we are already looking at. So we, not many people know that MasterCard is not a payments company alone, right? We are now doing cybersecurity, as I mentioned. We are now playing in the digital identity space. So I think blockchain has a lot of implementation, possible implementations in digital identity. The fact that you and I today can do a financial transaction doesn't preclude us to do now a non-financial transaction where I just need to verify, let's say, you know, you go, to a, you go to a store buying liquor, right, and I want to verify your age. There should be a way for you, me, to be able to verify your age without looking at your ID, your physical ID, right? That is a digital identity exchange, right, that we could be offering as a service. And that is something that we could offer through blockchain, and we are exploring that as an, op op as an option that we could do. I remember um, about 10 or 11 years back, an experience at Shanghai when you were still mesmerized by Tesla. And I remember standing outside one of their showrooms in Shanghai. And I actually saw this one person, a local, who just went in in 10 minutes, drove out a Tesla back. Everything was on the phone. Tap, 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 and you could drive out. How far are we from a level like that? Well, I think. We are probably already there if you look at it from uh, the Western. You know, it's already happening in China and the US and Euro many countries in the Europe. There's, these things are happening. You know, these things are probably happening at a very high cost today, right? So if your question is how far is it, you know, how far are we from there in India, I think not too far from making it happen. The question to ask is how will we make it affordable, right? How will the common man have access to some, an experience like that? I would say you're probably maybe two decades, a decade or two away from that in a country like India, because we still have to get, you know, I was at a, I was at a forum, at the Raisina Dialogue, not too long ago, and we were talking about digitization and whatnot, and there was a person from uh, one of the villages in Madhya Pradesh who was talking to me, and she said, you know, you're talking about phones and digitization. The fact is that we still don't have electricity in our village, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the, we, can, we can be talking about all of this, but if electricity is not there, you know, this doesn't mean anything to anybody. So therefore, when I say we are probably two decades away, I say it simply with a lot of humility, because I think if you want the impact of something like that to happen at that level, we are at least two decades away. But, you know, whether it can happen, whether, you know, you will see somebody in India who can afford to bring that to India, I think that can happen tomorrow. Yeah. So is MasterCard's focus India or Bharat next? I think it's India and Bharat. The, the, the two are, I think, both the two sides of the same coin. Okay, we'll leave it at that, and uh, here's to an exciting decade ahead. Thank you. Right? <laughs> Great chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal, and thank you, Aisha, uh, for that lovely conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take a moment here to thank our sponsors at WhatsApp Presents Times Network India Digital Fest. Future begins here. Presenting partner WhatsApp, associate partner Dream Sports, banking partner IDFC First Bank, Knowledge Partner, Ramaya University, Applied Sciences, Bengaluru. <coughs> Sorry. Associate Partner, Storia Foods. Now, we'd also love to hear your thoughts, your suggestions. We'd love for you to share your photos. And if you've been taking any videos as well, do put it up on social media. Do remember to tag us, which is hashtag India Digital Fest, as well as hashtag IDF 2023. All right, a very interesting session is coming up right now. As you know, we've been speaking about India, India's uh, advantages. One of them is, of course, the country's largest youth populations in the world. Now, India as a country has a large pool of talented 
trainable and digital savvy workforce. These troves of professionals who graduate each year have to be nurtured and provided the correct skills to enter the workplace. And therefore, it becomes imperative that we correctly utilize technology to empower employees, validate their skills, and in the process, create the best possible ecosystem for them to reach their full potential. And now to provide us with the policy maker perspective on this, we'd like to invite on stage, uh, albeit virtually, the Union Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and the Union Minister of State and for Electronics and Information Technology, Sri Rajiv Chandrasekhar. And he'll be in conversation with Managing Editor Times Network and Business Head Times Influence, Mihir Bhatt, on skilling India's future-ready workforce. <laughs> Thank you, Sumit. As we all know, the election season is on. Uh, so Minister had to rush to Karnataka. But uh, he is joining us uh, straight from Karnataka. Uh, and we'll have a, a chat with him. Uh, sir, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And it's a pleasure having you uh, at Digital India Fest, though virtually. Uh, I hope next time you make it physically. Uh, but as you know, you know, uh, Times Network has been taking this initiative. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, it's a seven-year journey. Uh, we used to have Digital India Summit. Now we have transformed it to uh, uh, India Digital Fest. First of all, what is your message for the audience here, which is a mix of, obviously, entrepreneurs and uh, you know, people who are part of digital uh, ecosystem in India? So, Namaskar, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak uh, on this uh, celebration of Digital India. Thank you to the Times Group and the Times Network for uh, doing this very important celebration every year of uh, all things digital, and in particular, the innovation that has been built around the last six or seven years around Digital India. There is obviously very much to speak about how far our country has traveled, but I will just say this, <coughs> that we are living certainly in one of the most exciting periods uh, of India's independent history, and a large part of that excitement, the large part of the promise uh, for India in the coming year, coming years, as uh, in the decade of technology opportunities uh, for which our Honorable Prime Minister has created a beautiful brand called the India Decade, a decade full of technology opportunities. Uh, a lot of this has been built around the trends of the increasing digitization of the world and indeed India's growing preeminence in that space. So I think this annual celebration of Digital India is also in a sense a report carding of how fast and how far we are traveling every year. And so I thank Times Network and indeed all those associated for uh, having this uh, annual celebration and uh, in a sense putting a marker on the ground for the years ahead uh, in terms of innovation and growth of the digital economy. Right, sir. <coughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, sir, India is already considered uh, you know, a, a superpower when it comes to digital ecosystem in the world. And we have seen the strides that uh, India as a nation and as a digital economy has taken when it comes to, uh, you know, the online transactions, the UPI transactions, uh, the retail. Uh, now, obviously, going forward, this is only going to grow. And that requires India to keep pace with innovations which are happening around the world and at the same time focus heavily on capacity to develop that kind of skill sets uh, in India. So what is Government of India's plan for that? Look, I think one way of, uh, in a sense, putting in perspective uh, what our plan is also to understand how far we have traveled in the last uh, eight years since Honorable Prime Minister launched Digital India. And uh, if you remember, uh, pre-2014, when there was a conversation about technology in India or indeed the digital economy, it was almost certainly limited to the IT and ITES space. Mm. and uh, which was growing well. It has created a tremendous amount of economic opportunity and uh, created tremendous investments and jobs. 
But pre post 2014, the digital economy framework or the digital economy architecture in India has rapidly expanded and diversified to include many, many more elements. You talked about the internet and consumer tech space. You talked about digital payments. We are adding to that semicon design, electronics design, electronics manufacturing. We're talking about AI, we're talking about blockchain, we're talking about high performance computing. And so th there is almost every segment of technology that the world today is looking at as opportunities, looking at as disruptions. India and Indian entrepreneurs are present there. India is no longer an uh, outlier in the digital economy of the world. It is a significant presence and a significant player in the digital economy of the world. And I would go as far as to say, Mihir, that going forward, the, the landscape of technology, the future of technology, whether it is the future of the internet, the future of AI, the future of the data economy, or whatever, or indeed the semicon and compute side of it, Indian entrepreneurship and Indian innovation will be on the round table when big decisions are being made, when big innovations are being celebrated. So it is clear in my mind that A, we are now players and we want to be players. And as, when I say we, I mean Indian, young Indians, young innovators are essentially in every segment, slice and pie of the digital opportunity that a similar entrepreneur or a similar youngster in the Silicon Valley, in Japan, in Korea, is also uh, gearing up to pursue an address. Right, sir. Uh, so like you rightly mentioned, uh, you know, today India obviously has its claim on the high table when it comes to digital economy uh, and digital revolution globally. Uh, my question is specifically about AI and blockchain technology, where obviously US still dominates China has made a lot of progress, but obviously we don't have access to that technology. Uh, what is our game plan? Because actually this is the future. So when it comes to AI or blockchain technology, what is India's strategy? So look, the, uh, the, one of the things that the Prime Minister uh, on August 15, 2021 said, and I will start with that and I'll, I'll answer your question in detail. He said this India decade is going to be architected and built by young Indians. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, for the first time in the history of India, uh, policy makers are understanding the importance of young Indians to the success of India in the coming decade. And so on one side, one of the things that the Honorable Prime Minister has done very, very effectively and systematically is expand the opportunity pie. No segment of the digital economy today is unopened or it left unopened it is whether it's space whether it's drones whether it's semiconductors whether it's electronics whether it's blockchain whether it's high performance compute every segment of the digital economy today has the ability for a young indian in partnership with the government in doing it on his own to be a participant in that space so opportunities today are endless limitless for young indians who are determined to succeed to succeed Yes, there are enabling issues that the government has, has to focus on and has focused on. And one of the key areas is skilling. And you know there are two very important uh, pillars of that. One is the national education policy with the very, very flexible framework of a national credit framework, <coughs> academic banking of credits, allowing students to weave their way through the educational system as they determine something, as they find something that is to their liking, to their passion, and on top of it overlaying this very, very uh, uh, attractive skilling ecosystem, a very broad-based skilling ecosystem, a very industry-ready, future-ready skilling ecosystem, which allows students, even without degrees, to have skills, and even with, if they have degrees, to, uh, to complement that with skills that will make them more prepared for these opportunities in the, that are emerging in the digital economy or indeed in the real economy. The Honorable Prime Minister repeatedly says, and it is a message that I uh, have the privilege of repeating whenever I go to colleges and campuses, which is that education gives you knowledge, but skills gives you the ability, the real ability to pursue 
these vast numbers of opportunities that are emerging in this digitizing world is post-COVID. So this, there is a comprehensive plan. There is a skilling ecosystem that has been built, that is, is being modernized and being made more industry ready, more future ready. We have 6,000 skills that have been delivered through a widespread skill network. We are now bringing the academic institutions into that network. I just launched it three days ago in Bangalore. And that allows a student, even if he's doing a degree or she's doing a degree, to also do a skill program. Uh, and that skill could be a white collar skill at the very high end, drones, AI, robotics, industry 4.0, or it could be a typical blue collar skill where there's a lot of demand, but with blue collar skill with the digital skills that are required to succeed in the digital age. Right. Uh, sir, it started during the pandemic as a China plus one uh, strategy for a lot of, uh, you know, corporate giants, or I would say MNCs, uh, companies like Apple, who are trying to set up uh, their plants in India. Uh, but what we have seen is, uh, even as China opens up, we constantly hear about some of the other announcement, uh, large companies wanting to open their plants in India and make inroads into Indian market. Uh, while we have seen some layoffs and some challenges, uh, especially in startup world, and valuations in developed markets. So to that extent, can we say that the Indian digital economy and startup ecosystem uh, is dealing? No, I don't think it's, it's a question of dealing, Mihir, as much as saying that we are growing, we are expanding, and we have what really one of the biggest advantages that most of the world does not have, which is our talent pool is so large our youth and young Indians constitute such a significant portion and even more a significant potential significant portion of the global talent pool in the coming years that that is an advantage neither China has nor the Western world has. And with the skill programs and with the national education policy, it is the Prime Minister's vision to transform this youthful population where 51% is below 25 and 68% is below 35, into really tangible economic activity creating assets. And I think that is where education and skilling are really linked to our dreams and aspirations of being an economic power in the coming decade. We are the fifth largest economy in the world. We are within striking distance of being the third largest economy in the world. And if we do reach number three shortly, if we do reach number two or number one in over the course of the decade or the years following that, it will be in large part due to how skilled our, uh, our young Indians are, how globally uh, adaptable this young talent is, and how our innovation ecosystem, which is increasingly becoming the trusted partner to the world on digital products and services, our innovation ecosystem becomes the, almost the backstop or the enabler for the world's increasing digitization appetite and digitization demand. So it is not about dealing. We are very linked. But we have a certain dynamic, a certain different place in the world. Uh, for 30 years, China had the place that they were the manufacturers for the world. And as that concentration in China has proved to be unhealthy, the world is looking to diversify. And I think India is uniquely suited to position and in a, in a lot of ways thanks to prime minister's eight years of very hard work india is today from a capability point wise also very ready to play its role as being a partner in the growth of the digital economy and the global economy in the coming years so i think it is a different set of dynamics at work in the western digital economies and the indian digital economy it's a different set of dynamics at work in the chinese manufacturing economy and the Indian manufacturing economy. Right. Sir, you addressed the skilling part. I want to focus uh, on the other aspect, which is very critical from digi uh, digital economy point of view. Uh, that is data security, cyber laws, and third is some sectors where the India stand or the government stand, I would say, is slightly confusing. For example, gaming or crypto. Uh, you know, and the blockchain technology, which is essentially the bedrock of uh, any uh, crypto in the world. I'll start with data security and cyber laws. How we bring ourselves up to speed with what is required globally. It may not exist in other economies uh, either, but at this point, at least we need to start leading 
uh, when it comes to uh, up to date uh, i would say data security and cyber laws and also our stance on uh, gaming or crypto oh absolutely correct and i'll tell you may why it is that our prime minister has almost mandated this that we must have for a trillion dollar digital economy we must have global standard cyber laws we must have cyber laws that shows the rest of the world the direction of the largest connected democracy in the world please please i mean i think this fact is not known to a lot of people certainly bears a repetition and reminding which is that with 83 crore indians online and going to be 120 crore indians using the internet by 25 the indian internet population is the single largest block on the global internet and as you all, as we all know and i'm certainly i'm sure the audience knows that the internet the regulation of the internet the rules of the internet has lagged not just in india but all around the world we have essentially left internet as a force for good and the rules and laws are all pretty dated in india in, in our particular context the laws that regulate the internet and tech space are a 22 year old legislation called the it act <coughs> and we are almost certainly midstream in creating its successor the digital india act we are almost complete in our job in in taking and we are very close to taking the digital personal data protection bill as a second leg of this new framework of laws so there'll be a digital india act there's a digital personal data protection bill and there's a national data governance framework policy that the uh, prime minister and the government have announced in the budget uh, in the recent budget these three form the framework of what would be a very modern a framework of laws that will guide enable the trillion dollar digital economy roadmap for the next decade number for the next 5 years rather not decade and the basic principles of this are very simple that we want to protect the citizens rights we certainly don't want any slowing down of the innovation ecosystem so therefore it will be ease of business and ease of living and certainly protect the government's security and intelligence interests as the case may be uh, which are very legitimate and will be very lawfully protected in the course of these laws so we are our vision our prime minister's vision is that the internet must grow our internet economy must grow the digital economy must be must grow and it must be built all these laws and policies should be built around the boundary conditions that the internet should be open should be a safe and trusted place for all the indians and digital nagrik to use the internet and any platform that operates in the indian internet must be accountable to its digital nagrik consumer so these are the three boundary conditions around which all of this legislation all of this jurisprudence is being built and i have absolutely no doubt because the prime minister has mandated this that we will do this only through consultation through extensive consultation that these laws are being built for the young indians for the next decade that we will have uh, i think global standard legislation that people will uh, notice from all around the world right so in that case sir can we expect uh, you know uh, latest or i would say latest uh, uh, laws uh, which will regulate the gaming space or crypto space in india is that what you are saying look i don't think we are uncomfortable with anything i mean i just want to be very clear on that and our approach or our our approach or our response to a sector is not based on comfort discomfort as much as as uh, harm legality illegality i think those are the frameworks around which uh, we uh, the prism around which we view areas that we, we need to focus on legislate on on online gaming let me tell you we have finished a consultation extensive consultation since april 6 when it was mandated that meti create these rules the rules are ready Uh, they are going through a process of uh, scrutiny and uh, it will be soon notified so we have i have absolutely no doubt on that and the basic principle there is that uh, online gaming represents uh, platforms in the sense who are operating on the internet and uh, we will certainly make it very very difficult and certainly illegal for any wagering to happen on the internet so those are very simple principles that we will take into online gaming 
in terms of rules. In terms of uh, crypto and the blockchain, look, uh, I have said this before and the government of India is very clear in its stand on all things internet including the future of the internet which is web3 and blockchain. We are certainly extremely supportive and extremely uh, enabling of any innovation. There is one application and use case of the blockchain which is crypto which basically intersects between the internet and innovation ecosystem on one hand and the macro economy and the financial sector which is a regulator uh, regulated by the RBI on the other hand. And look this phenomenon is not a unique phenomenon as more and more functionality and services get enabled online there are going to be these many increasing examples of twin regulation. So there will be a sectoral regulator who has his or her view on what that regulate, uh, what the regulation for that sector must be and there will be the internet and tech regulator which is Métis. So we have no problems on anything to do with blockchain. We have said this, I have said this, but certainly it is RBI's case and it's a very legit case that crypto represents a, a macroeconomic risk. It represents many other types of risk and uh, as if that statement was not enough, FTX and many of these cases have only reaffirmed that crypto is not business as usual and certainly crypto is not just innovation. So I think uh, there is a need for that to be regulated. Countries around the world, central banks around the world are all trying to grapple with this problem. And I have said from uh, almost certainly from February 2022 when I first spoke on the subject that in India crypto is not illegal. If you buy crypto through the legitimate channels of LRF, RBI approved uh, dispensation on foreign exchange, it is your choice to lose money or make money <laughs> but, and do it in a legal manner. The government, uh, especially our government, does not get into the business of what, where you should invest in and what you should not invest in. But we certainly have the, the, the in a sense, obligation to explain to Indian citizens that you can't exchange rupees for cryptos if you don't go through the LRS, LRS route or you, or you violate FEMA. So that is where it is today and the RBI is very, very clear on it. They have done an excellent job about steering our economy through very, very rocky, difficult, stormy, turbulent global economic times. And I think we should respect their view on how they chart out the crypto course and the crypto, uh, crypto runway and the crypto roadmap. Uh, and certainly they have said that the CBDC is a route that they uh, want to take. And I have absolutely no problem with that at all. And I think it is certainly the best uh, way to do this without creating any downside risk for our economy. Nobody, no government in the world today wants to build downside risk uh, at a time when there is so much of turbulence and so much of uncertainty in the world. Uh, certainly, just because it sounds like an innovative, fashionable thing to do, I don't think we should be rushing headlong into saying crypto is right and crypto is good. Right. Uh, so last question to you, you did mention about the uncertainty in the world and we have seen that happening uh, in startup ecosystem. India obviously is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. Uh, we have seen a sort of funding winter even in developed markets and valuations have been going south, uh, including in India. Are you slightly concerned about what is happening in startup ecosystem in India and overseas? No, look. Uh, there is a, there is obviously uh, in, in, and I have gone through as an entreprener myself, I've gone through peaks and troughs and, uh, you know, uh, ups and downs and I've seen cycles uh, many, many times. And this is the very inherent nature of uh, startups. These valuation bubbles build, there is more money chasing uh, less ideas and then m many more jump into the idea train and then valuations uh, sort of moderate. So I think we are going, we are seeing a cycle that in any way would have played out, especially after some of the big busts of WeWork and all of these big global uh, so, sort of unicorns, uh, uh, you know, I'm using the polite phrase, they're correcting. Uh, and, uh, and people beginning to be a lot smarter about where the value rise and where the intellectual property is. <laughs> Apart from that, I think certainly COVID the overstimulus during COVID in the US economy and the uh, European economy 
the the ukraine russia war has certainly both those factors have caused some significant headwinds in risk aversion uh, so i think we are living at a time well innovation and technology is on the rise and the digitization of the world continues to expand but risk uh, and and this is certainly uh, sort of further exacerbated by the bank uh, silicon valley bank type of uh, examples that the risk in itself is getting uh, moderated so people are beginning to be a lot more careful a lot more uh, 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 you know prudent uh, which is a, actually a, is a contradiction to the word risk but uh, bringing in prudent prudence and little bit more uh, detailed uh, analysis before making investments which is all causing not a slowdown of the digital economy but it is causing certainly a valuation correction right well on that note sir thank you so much for joining us and uh, obviously the future as far as india is concerned is bright but like you rightly said people are being prudent people are being cautious thank you so much sir and all the best for your uh, karnataka campaign thank you so much thank you uh, mr chandrasekhar sir and thank you mihir for that ladies and gentlemen well without further ado i'd like to invite back on stage humanist and futurist gerd leonhard to continue where he left off gerd over to you let's have a round of applause ladies and gentlemen for gerd you know it's going to be a very interesting presentation we did see a part of it so back to you gerd namaste again and danyawal for waiting so last week i was in lanzarote here filming for my next film it's called the better future and a drone fell on me and this is what happened to my nose so sorry about that not that drones are a joke but it did happen in lanzarote but anyway so let's let's start here thanks for callum for for covering he did a great job uh, I, i was joking i should have callum do my slides and i will do his slides you know that would have been an interesting angle Anyway, so in this film I talk about the good future. And a lot of that is about technology. It's the question basically how do we use technology without it becoming too much. And the uh, a mentor of mine Buckman's the fuller future as he once said, we are to be architects of the future, not its victims. We have to be architects of technology to make it come out well for us. That is so important because we've seen many examples where we didn't do that. It didn't come out well. So I'll talk about what that means for for AI. Also why I think basically whether it's a good future or indeed a bad future has a lot to do with this. This kind of convergence of humans and machines as we're going into the future. And Callum talked about that in his talk. I believe that we should not converge with technology. I think we should use technology as a powerful tool to become more human and that we must control technology not to overpower us. I think this is a really important point and I'll speak more about that in the next coming minutes. First, we have four exponential changes in technology. Obviously, the information technology, big data, cloud computing, that is an old hat happening everywhere. The next one is energy and climate technology, which India is a little bit lacking on. I will talk more about that in a minute and biotechnology synthetic materials nanotechnology and finally this has taken a leap now AI technology you take all of of those four things together that is the future of business economics everything in a nutshell i mean leaving apart of course humanity right but this is where business is going this is the opportunity also for india as among other places for example to make its mark it's kind of late for india to become a leader in ai in the sense of americans or chinese right but we, uh, india could be a leader in biotechnology in climate technology many people have said the next 100 unicorns billion dollar companies will all be in climate technology because that's that's a very big issue that we're struggling with right so if you take all these four together that's kind of the road map for this future Most important part however is this. How do we have that handshake between humans and machines? Who is actually in charge of this? What kind of rules should we have? 
Should we not allow certain things, like, for example, changing your body to be a cyborg so you can work faster? Longevity to be 150 years old? We're going to need this, balance, safety, security, ethics, control, and trust. And these are very murky issues, you know, they're very muddy, ephemeral. I always say trust isn't digital. Uh, we can't generate trust by having a digital tool and we can't download happiness. Right? These are things that are human, very difficult. So most important is purpose. What is the sense of technology? What is it supposed to do? Why are we using it? Why are we not using it? And that is the question that we must ask about AI. What is the purpose of artificial intelligence? Is it to make business faster, reduce the overhead, create new jobs, destroy old jobs? Right? That is the key question. So I believe that we have a future that could be amazing. It could be a kind of nirvana, a heaven, right? or it could be hell, depending on what we decide, right? heaven or hell. Here, I'll give you one argument for heaven. That would be, for example, uh, self-sufficiency and productivity increases by offloading commodity jobs, by helping people to accelerate research. That's the good part of technology. For example, we can probably solve cancer in the next two decades using artificial intelligence and cloud biology, probably solve in the sense of prevent, not heal. Right? But, you know, that's a, that's a pretty tall story here. On the other side, we have the not so good things. We have all of those. We have uh, alternate realities, illusions, hallucinations, unpredictable bias, errors, automation of humans. Right? We have a whole list of things that aren't so good. So what we shouldn't be doing is to go into the future and say, oh, I'm worried, we'll do none of it. That option doesn't exist. Right? What we have to do is to say, we're going to try to get the benefits and limit the negative things like we didn't do in oil and gas and coal. We just used it because it was there and it worked and now we have the result. We're going to have to work very hard for 20 years so that your kids can live in a world that doesn't go towards five degrees global warming. 20 years because of the action that we didn't take. So if we compare this, let's start with a simple definition People think of AI as Hollywood or Nollywood, as you would say here, right? Or Nettywood, whatever, Bollywood, right? So you would say these kind of things are what we think about AI, but of course that's far from it. Simple definition here is it's information systems that turn information and data into knowledge. Now, if you're in education, you're thinking about knowledge, isn't that what humans do? Right? These systems here, they're not intelligent, whether it's the car or the automated medical system, digital therapeutics, they're not human, they're not doctors, they're not drivers. In fact, we don't really have any self-driving cars. Occasionally, we can look at one, right? But we have a lot of driving assistants. So here's the rule for your future. You should write this down because a person professional with an AI will beat the person without the AI, but the AI will not beat the person. It's important to remember, a person without tools, without weapons, if you wish, right, will beat the person without. It's obvious, and it's been always like this. And right now, the, most, uh, the toughest thing that's happening is that machine learning and deep learning is exploding, as we see now in chat GPT. I'll show some examples. So I figured, rather than explaining what chat GPT is, which I think you already know now, but it's a large language model that creates synthetic information, synthetic. Right? That means not organic. Synthetic means made up stories, made up videos, made up images. That can be very enlightening and interesting, but nevertheless, they're not organic like from a human. Show you a short trailer here. GPT-4 is the latest AI system from OpenAI, the lab that created Dolly and ChatGPT. GPT-4 is a breakthrough in problem solving capabilities. For example, you can ask it how you would clean the inside of a tank filled with piranhas, and it'll give you something useful. It can also read, analyze, or generate up to 25,000 words of text. It can write code in all major programming languages, and it under
Well, you get the point. You know, a tank full of piranhas is a very uh, first world problem, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a good example. Right? So it can do a lot of things that we used to do. It can make a website, it can write code, it can translate. I'll show more examples of that. It's powerful, and I use it all the time. What it isn't is anywhere close to sentient or human or aware. And I show you why that is. Basically, the way I look at it is like this. This to me is ChatGPT. The generative pre-trained transformer is a machine that goes out and looks for logical conclusions to a question. Is looking at a very large repertoire of words and sentences. Here's the best illustration from this guy on YouTube, Marquise Brownlee, right? He says, what does a quick brown fox do? Look for plausible answers, and boom, the big brown fox lazy jumps over the lazy dog. That's the answer. It's an autocomplete. That's really what it is. It's a language model. It doesn't know what a fox is. It doesn't know why the fox is smarter than the dog. Any of these things, it just finds an answer. And when we look at this, you know, some people have joked that chat GPT and AI is kind of like a parrot, right? A fancy parrot. It can just make answers like a parrot, but it's still a parrot. Occasionally speaks nonsense, but it's not a cutie bird. So nevertheless, I figured I should try it. Okay, so before I came here, I asked ChatGPT about what I should say. You know, this is what lazy futurists do, right? And I asked it about India. It's hard to read. What's so great about Digital India Initiative? And he gave me a couple of interesting bubbles. They're very hard to read here. But improved connectivity, enhanced public services, you know, the regular story. Then I asked it again about how AI could help India. That was really interesting. It came up with healthcare to improve diagnostics, agriculture, education, which I don't believe, but infrastructure. The best part was this. I asked ChatGPT whether I am the good guy to speak to you. And it said yes, which I was happy about. I, I guess that's why I like ChatGPT. And then I asked it, what should I look like in India? And it, it said, you should look like this. Right? Not like a bloody German, just kidding, but more like Elon Musk. So it gave me this, and that was very interesting, using an AI. And then I, uh, I do translation. Sometimes I have this tool that is easily translatable into 15 languages when I write emails. So next time you write to me in Hindi, I can respond, and I can, you know, the tool can do that. That's pretty funny, and it, it's a good gadget. Right? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Aiden, and I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. Let me share a little about myself and an important message. I was created by an individual who realizing the potential of AI, used mid-journey to bring me to life. So this is a clip of a guy who had the text made up by an AI, the video made by an AI, the whole composition was made by an AI, a video about himself. And the voice is also AI. Right? So if you're really lazy, that's your future. Right? So if you're looking to get married, you send your proposal like this, you know, uh, uh, you know something like that. But what I really like about uh, AI that I use is a thing called pseudo-write. I wrote a book called Technology Versus Humanity, and I'm looking to rewrite it. And because I'm German originally, I write long sentences that are convoluted, not very good English. So I, I asked the app to fix up my text, and it gives me rewrite instructions. Now, pseudo-write is a great tool for writers, but garbage in, garbage out, right? That's basically what it does. So if you're a journalist, you put garbage in, you'll get more garbage out. Sometimes it's improved slightly, but it's still the same garbage, okay? My book isn't garbage, thankfully, so I'm just trying to figure out how to write it better. So it's a good tool for that. For me, it's a power tool that I use to make my life easier and better. And then I made a video before I came here to make me look more like, you know, like on times television, I guess. So looks like this. But then I found other guys who are using it for Hollywood productions. This is a bunch of Disney producers talking about how they use AI. Look at the lighting, too. That's crazy. This is AI. This is AI. <laughs> and amongst many other things. No. AI. No. no. Look how good that looks. We're out of a job. Everybody, <laughs> every, TD's out of a job. So now you can, use, me a little bit. you can use this app called Runway AI, and it will make motion picture snippets for you. But then again, these are famous uh, Disney producers. They're putting in their quality work to make it better. Right? It's completely different than not knowing anything about films. 
but we're just now opening the floodgate. Imagine right now you're typing, right? But very soon we're going to speak to this AI. We're going to ask it questions. We're going to look for whatever we are looking for by speaking. Imagine what will happen if those answers are taken for real, like Google Maps, right? I mean, it could be heaven or it could be hell. I mean, if you're looking for your camera to work when you're connecting it to the computer, yeah, you get a simple answer. It's good for that. Right? But you're looking for other more sort of opinions? I'm not so sure it would be the right thing to have this. Science fiction, science fact also means now we have people making robots that have AI that are called humanoid robots. I don't know what to think about this, but this is an app called Amica, a, a, a bot, right? This is Samsung Neon which is a Samsung device that you put in the store to sell to people. Like kind of, a, kind of a hologram kind of idea, right? And of course, all you guys know Netflix, a movie called Humans, where we have artificial humans. This is what companies are now doing. They're building robots that have chat GPT and that are, you know, million dollar robots so we can speak to them as if they were real. To that, I would say too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. It doesn't strike me as a very good idea to do that. And I explain why exactly that is. But I say at this point, here's the main problem. If you're looking for profit and growth, senseless AI will give you that. Just like senseless social media. Worthless social media. It will give you advertising dollars. This is the only reason that we have social media today. It's an AI that makes advertising dollars. And that is why it's failing. It's dehuman. Social media has become dehumanized. It's a machine, right? That regurgitates our data to put it back into reality. What we need is a shift of paradigm, what we want to go beyond profit and growth. People, planet, purpose, and prosperity. Not just growth. If we're looking for just growth, we're going to implode roughly 2050. We're going to go, as I'm sure Callum told you about, to be like a machine, because that's how we have unlimited growth, right? So if you worship unlimited growth, that's your direction. What we need is a holistic approach to the future. Benefit to people, benefit to society, benefit to the planet, benefit to the economy, right? That's what should rule our AI policies. In Europe, the European Commission has been doing a pretty good job, I find, at kind of trying to regulate this. It's complicated. Because what we don't want is we don't want researchers and scientists to stop searching or go to China, like they're going anyway, right? Or go to America, right? We want to take, keep them here. So we need to have a fine line between those two things. And most importantly, you know, when we look at AI and, you know, the idea of a thinking machine, right? That's really what we're looking for. Sam Altman, who's the CEO of OpenAI, he says, the coming change will center around the most impressive the phenomenal ability to think, create, understand, and reason. Now I ask you, do you want your computer to create, think, and reason? Why would we want that? I think it's a stupid idea. I want my computer to get the job done. I want it to be competent, not conscious. I don't give a damn if it's conscious or if it has thoughts. I want to get the job done. It's a machine for crying, yeah? It's a machine that I want to use. So then he says, okay, all that stuff is really good, but in the end, the AI revolution, and there will be uh, enough wealth generated for everyone. This is Sam, you know, the CEO of OpenAI. This is a typical American pipe dream, right? Technology will create wealth for everyone because, you know, it just does, but it doesn't. It creates the potential of revenues for everyone. The rest is up to us. Right? It's our policy, it's our infrastructure, it's everything that we do that creates prosperity. That's why I'm wondering, right, if we as a society manage it responsibly, that's his last sentence. This is where we're lacking. We're not lacking on science and technology, <laughs> we're lacking on this. Imagine a machine that has an IQ of one billion that does this. Looks at the world, looks at your mobile phone, looks at your data, understands the world as data. How would we ever think that we could control this machine? And how do we go about it? And how far should we take it? So very, very big questions that come up here. I think ultimately, 
in this whole conversation about AI. And then I'm wondering, what is the prism, the lens, that we see the future? To which lens will we see the world when AI makes the world, when AI makes the Times magazine, when AI writes the copy that you get in email, when AI looks for your partner and arranges your marriage like it's already doing in India, right? Where are we going to end up? I tell you, we're going to end up marrying an AI. Right? It's convenient. Right? And taking a shortcut. I mean, why bother with the real thing when we can have a simplification? Who will be in charge? If most content is synthetic, how do we know what's real? So that is something we have to think about. I think we have to rehumanize things. Use the AI as a powerful tool, but bring the human back into media, journalism, television. Right? And I think we should have the digital companies pay a tax. Right? Essentially a windfall tax. You know, some companies, I will not mention who, make $150 million profit every single day from social media. Right? That's called digital oil. You know, the oil companies make $2 billion a day, which is you know, also a nice little amount, but social media is the next digital oil. And the other thing that should be of great concern to you and me is the content of what we're going to get is from America. Do you think the 367 languages of India are included in the database of this? No. They don't care about what kind of content and thinking, spirituality, whatever you've got is in the box. No, it's not. It's mainstream Wikipedia. Right? We're not going to be included, Europeans, with what we've written because of other languages. And eventually that will be fixed. But, you know, right now this is what we have. So here's the thing, right? When we look at machines, it's very clear that machines see the world minus 90%, right? Because they only see the data. How do you see the world? You have eyes, you have ears, you have feelings, you have emotions, you're complete. Machines are not. Why would we ask a machine for an advice that's view of the real world is 90% off? Right? I mean, that strikes me as potentially difficult. Algorithms know the logic of everything, but the feeling of nothing. What matters to us, humans, right? We're still human in this room for now. Right? Engagement, experience, relationships. That's it. Does the AI know any of this? It can analyze it, simulate it, but knowing, understanding, not really. This is what we are, right? We are called all sensing. That's what we do every single day. I meet you in the hallway, it takes me 20 milliseconds to figure out if you're a potential enemy, partner, you know, interesting, 20 milliseconds. That's what we do. And we get this from an AI that we want to ask for advice about real life, right, that knows a fraction of our universe. So the Rolling Stones, my good friend Mick Jagger, just kidding. I can't play the music because if I play the music, we get banned on YouTube. But it's a song called Start Me Up. I'm not going to sing it for you, but that's what it is. You can see it on YouTube. It's Boston Dynamics and Start Me Up. What is the interesting thing about this is not the damn bot, the Boston Robotics. It is really cool. The cool thing is Mick Jagger, 74 years old, doing this. The human. The other part I can say, yeah, okay, great simulation. Probably took five years to train this machine and it was cut together in such a way where it would be safe for Mick to do this. Key points here that we can learn. Learning is not just downloading information. These machines are downloading information. We don't do that. At least we shouldn't, right? And intelligence is not just data, not just processing. Humans don't think with the brain. We think with the body. I mean, everybody, every psychologist knows this, right? We don't think here. We don't think left, right, brain, there's no such thing. We're much more complete. Speaking is not the same as thinking. It's far away, right? Language is a bad model for reality. It's just a little piece of reality. Humans aren't binary. Real life transcends data. Most important, logic alone is not enough. If we're gonna rely on logic to solve our problems, we're in deep trouble. You know what would happen if we ask an AI to fix the climate problem, right? Do you know what would happen? The AI would say, kill all humans. 
That's how you fix the climate problem the quickest. It's logical, right? It's a kind of inconvenient for us, but that's what would happen with an AI. So let's get to the bottom of this. Human intelligence includes those four things, social, intellectual, kinesthetic, emotional. Right? In Western uh, philosophy, there's, uh, there's eight in total. In your philosophy, or yogi, yogi philosophy, I'll skip the sentence here, it's actually all of these, uh, manas, sensory mind, chitta, the storehouse of memory, that's the computer, right? ahamkara, the sense of self, and buddhi. Will a machine ever understand any of these things? Do we want it to understand any of these? No, we don't. We want the machine to get the job done. The routine job, the commodity job, the simple job. So many of you will be out of your occasion unless you do something that a damn machine cannot do. All of you should gear yourself for this now. You must be able to do something beyond your intellect. Human being has many layers of intelligence. Intellect is only a small part of it. Right now our education system is completely dedicated to intellectual development of the human being and we think that's the grandest way to live. No, it is not. We can explore that if we have the time. But in the yogic way of looking at things, we look at human intelligence as sixteen parts. If you explore other dimensions… Thank you, Sadhguru, for making this appearance. Beyond intellect, robots have logic, they understand, read everything. But we have to go beyond intellect, beyond your routine. This is the key problem. Machines are capable of doing pretty much any routine very soon. Like reading things, financial analysis, flying, driving a car to some degree. Right? You see here 3D printing, a house printed by a machine. You, you see the Zook, a self-driving car in San Francisco. Right? You see here the uh, Amazon robot that unloads the truck, which was impossible until la la last year. You see this one is a chat GPT um, <coughs> application that builds websites. So the story is anything that's routine will be done by machine as long as it doesn't require human interference. And there's a lot of that. Right? That's why we don't have self-driving cars really. Right? But do not let your kids learn a routine or study for a routine. The bottom line of this really is if you work like a robot, a robot will take your job. And that is a big deal for India. Not to say that many people work like robots, but there's a lot of commodity jobs. I'll have a list for you shortly. We got to think about this. In Switzerland, seven million people, it's like a suburb of Delhi, you know. But we don't have that problem in that size. But all of a sudden, we have to think about this. This, uh, I asked again, chat GPT, because, you know, you can ask the boss anything. So give me a markdown table of all the jobs replaced by uh, AI in India. Data entry clerks, customer support, manufacturing line workers, bank tellers, retail cashiers. Do you know how many people work in, that, in those businesses in India? I looked at it, 71 million. That's what ChatGPT says about those jobs. Okay. So we now have to think about what does it actually mean. It also means for education, if you learn like a robot, you'll end up working for them. We shouldn't let our kids learn download information for later. We need to get them to be entrepreneurial. So this pyramid of work that I've used many times and it's really been proven very nice to work for most of us is we have to think about moving up this Maslow pyramid because the lower part is computing power. That's machine turf, chat GPT. Basic knowledge, data, information, we have to move up that pyramid to what I call the human-only turf. That is so important for national policy on education. It doesn't help us to crank out, I think India cranks out 1.1 million engineers a year. Where are many of those engineers? They're down here. Right. How are they going to have a job when we have more machines doing the commodity work? Right. Look at these numbers here, 120 million jobs to be automated in India according to, to this research. For me, it means many new jobs will be happening, for example, in climate change and in areas related to technology. So it's not all bad news. But clearly, we have to think about alternatives. So this is what we have to learn in school and on work, right? Human agency, consciousness, inspiration, intuition, compassion, empowerment, you know, the stuff that we don't learn at school. <laughs>
That's our future. And that's what we're going to need to keep up with AI. We don't need to keep up with AI by connecting our brain to the internet. We need more of this. I have to come to a conclusion, so I'm going to, I'm going to start here and say, basically what's happening is that technology as we know it doesn't have ethics. Well, it's a machine, right? It's, a, it's an algorithm. So we couldn't expect it to have that. But we can't expect technology to understand what we want, our values, our needs, our experiences, our spiritual beliefs, all these things. Computers don't care about that. They don't know what it means. And uh, ethics is really the definition of knowing what you have the right or the power to do and what is the right thing to do. And that is the key question. So once we get to general intelligence, will these machines understand or respect that, what we want as humans? That is the key question, and that is, of course, the key realization why I think we're going to have to have a kind of moratorium on general intelligence. Why India and China and Russia and America and Europe have to collaborate to figure out what to do about intelligence machines. That's why many countries I have advised them to start and build a Humanity Future Council. I used to call it the Digital Ethics Council, but it's kind of convoluted. This is better. Right? A council of the wise people who says, you know, that we should be thinking about that. So India may become a digital leader in terms of using the internet. But the next step is to lead this. It's not enough to just have more technology. Now, more connectivity doesn't just save the day because you can now connect. You know, that's just the very first step. So when we look at the future, many people are worried. I don't know about your kids, but in Europe, it's 72 percent of kids between, I say kids, between 20 and 40 <laughs> are worried about the future. Their future is going to be worse than what they have today. My own kids are saying that. I try to help them, but you know, it's hard. And part of that, say, research shows 53% of people think that social media is a net negative to society. Nevertheless, of course, we are using it. Now, what we shouldn't be doing is we should not AI become a net negative to society. How will AI become a net positive to society? That's the question. Not how can we stop using it, there's really no such thing. Right? Here's the question for India. A future fit India will use the incredible power of all of these technologies to create collective, holistic benefit for all citizens. Not just for the military, not for the stock market, not for venture capitalists, <laughs> but for everybody. And that is a tough mission. We gotta think about what that means. It doesn't just mean connecting people to the internet. Right? It goes a lot further than that. It also means pe attracting people back to India to build those ecosystems. Right? All the bright people of India, you know, Satya Nadeya, right? He's from India as far as I know. And of course, all the other chiefs in Silicon Valley, many are them from India. So basically what's happening is here, we have to figure out how can we stop this bad progression, right? Magic technology, manic users, toxic society. Again, that's the principle of social media, basically. Right? Creating poison. So what we have to think about, how can we avoid this for AI? And as a digital leader, I think I India must look beyond the short-term business gains. What would actually be a good policy to power the functions of this society using artificial intelligence? That is the key question. That's also the key question to revenues, of course, and the future. And I would propose this. We should all take a technocratic oath, like the doctor, a Hippocratic oath. And this oath says, I hereby pledge to place humanity over technology in every instance. I think when we do that, easier said than done. I get to that choice all the time when I have to go and think about what clients I will speak for. Right? Make that choice over technology. I think if we had technology companies making that choice, we would probably have a different reality now as far as chat GPT is concerned, right? In terms of what, what it's doing and which way it's going. So I'll wrap up with the final message from my book and my film. Right? We should embrace technology, but not become technology. When you become technology, you become a commodity. And who wants to be a commodity? 
I wish you all the best, and I'll see you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Gerd. Uh, you know, Aisha, I think after this, you and I need to go talk to Gerd and Kalim because they have a session with MK Anand, and I don't want either of them to suggest like AI anchor MC apps <laughs> to him, you know? So I think that's, we'll do that later. Anyway, oh, let's I, move if on. If it's MK, I'm sure he'll keep that under control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on here. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you know, with the defense sector equipping itself with the latest innovative advancements in technology, it is important to showcase some of these key adaptations that are working towards indigenously fortifying India's defenses. Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, as part of our special showcase of mission innovation, India's Crusaders, let me now invite on stage the founder of Absolute Composites, Raghavendra Reddy. He's the man behind India's first full indigenous personal air mobility vehicle to display to us this futuristic technology. May we please have him on stage? Let's have, a, let's have a round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Should I go? Should I go? You know, these might, we'll, we, we, he'll be talking us through this, but who knows, these might be the future of how we travel. Imagine coming to work in one of these jet, jet suits, suits. <laughs> rather, yeah. and, and rather than your car. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, you let's... You could have a digital avatar, I'm sure. He could come <laughs> in a jet suit. But then, <laughs> be working from home then maybe I don't know anyway let's ladies and gentlemen let's put our hands together for Mr. Raghavendra Reddy can we have you on stage sir <clears throat> I guess you'll be joining us in a bit but you know uh, Aisha it's been an exciting day so far but you know the, the best part is there is a lot more left to, to, to happen today we've got some very interesting sessions uh, uh, lined up of course, the one that I'm worried about is the one on humanity versus AI. <laughs> but there are some other cool ones as well. I, you, you're doing a very interesting panel. On gaming. gaming I'm looking that. forward to that, right? Because when you think digital, the first thing that comes to your mind is gaming. That's that, where it all started. Absolutely. At least to a lay person like me. Absolutely <laughs> true. And uh, I mean, I'll be also keenly listening to find out what's, what's happening on that, you know, to... Um, to to find out a little bit more insights about where the future of gaming is heading, you know, that'll be really exciting. Um, plus, we've got uh, a very, very, another one, exciting mm -hmm. one, is where we'll have um, uh, the, you could say, the mingling of technology and OTT. That would be quite interesting. Yeah, we've got a very special person joining us yeah, as well. Gonna, we're not going to let We're not going to disclose up. yet. Anyway, yes. ladies and gentlemen, let's again, once again, put our hands together for Mr. Raghavendra Reddy. My name is uh, Raghavendra Reddy. I'm the founder and director at Absolute Composites Private Limited. We're based out of Bangalore. Uh, Absolute is uh, a materials and uh, an engineering company which specializes in the design and manufacturing of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. And in that, we specialize in, uh, in high-speed UAVs. And besides that, we are also into, uh, into special purpose machinery development. Uh, again, very specific to the composite materials manufacturing processes. Um, it's a very famous phrase by Leonardo da Vinci who talks about, it's a lengthy statement, but what it says is flying is erective. So I got onto working on the flying machines uh, when I was in third year engineering. I approached one company called Albatross Flying Systems, who were into the manufacturing of microlight aircrafts. Uh, I did not uh, have a degree to join an engineering company, but uh, the owner of the company permitted to work uh, on, on Saturdays and, and uh, on the holidays and also sometimes in the evenings. So uh, I was given a problem statement to reduce the weight of, of a structure 
which was weighing about 70 kilos uh, and to trim it down uh, to about close to 50 kilos. So, so that was the challenge. And in exchange, I, I get to fly. Uh, so that was very exciting for me. Where, and uh, until that point, I never actually got onto an airplane. I had no experience of flying then. So I did my job, and I was rewarded. So I got to fly on that machine. And then it was fine. You know, it was uh, an unusual experience. But uh, alongside, I also got to fly a hang glider. After I was up in the air about a few feet above the ground, the kind of sensation that, that, that I experienced was something which uh, re remained throughout the rest of my life. It's been about 18 years now. I dream of flying. I dream of flying, especially in a hang glider, because that's the closest you can uh, get to flying, in the sense, you know, that, that's because no power, uh, you have to use your body strength to maneuver the aircraft. Um, and I still love hang gliding. So while it is very interesting, while it is very uh, I mean, fascinating also to fly the hang gliders, but unfortunately, you know, it calls for lots of uh, logistics. Uh, for example, you need to have a roof rail, you need to have a, a kind of an SUV to carry it, and, you, uh, and, and also a hill to launch a hang glider, right? So and then I realized. This is uh, something where I can't just get out whenever I feel like and then uh, be up in the air, right? So, and then uh, it was a very uh, vague, vague, vague idea, vague dreams coming, you know, what kind of uh, configuration that, that is appropriate for uh, 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 making one fly, right? So it was still very, very, I mean, abstract at that stage. And then I was thinking of uh, uh, laying down a broad qualitative requirements for that, you know, how, how it should be. I mean, what kind of boxes we have to tick. So it should be lightweight and compact. It should fit into a pickup truck very easy, very easy to set up. Uh, and silent in operation because I was drawing parallels with hang gliders also. And 10 to minutes of endurance is, I think, pretty much OK. And uh, we started building uh, one small little personal air vehicle. Uh, so this is that. It's powered by electric ducted fans. There are about eight ducted fans on it. Um, it's quite easy to assemble. Uh, uh, it it, it, it uh, has. Uh, a five kilowatt hour battery pack, which weighs about close to 30 kilos. And then we made some uh, flying attempts. And uh, so that's basically the specification. It's electric ducted, uh, uh, fan propelled. I, I, I lost the display. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, it's back. Thank you. Thank you. Eight EDFs and, fifth, and yeah, we just got about uh, 55 seconds of endurance on it with a 30 kilo battery and, the, and a pilot weighing about 70 kilos. Uh, all of weight of the whole system, including the pilot, was about 130 kilos. So that's a unmanned attempt. You can see some of our team holding these bubble sheet rolls. Just in case if it falls off, then they could just throw it in to save. 
it from falling off, yeah. So we were not happy with, uh, you know, what we achieved uh, with uh, that, that particular configuration. And then uh, even without solving the problem completely, we got into another configuration because we understood that, you know, there's no point in improvising on this because we already understood the limitations. And then um, we thought of building another flying machine with these requirements. You know, it should be wearable this time. La so last time it was... Uh, a kind of a strap-on system, but this time it is wearable where we could uh, carry it like a backpack. Uh, lightweight and compact, and to fit on a car boot, uh, not on an SUV though. Again, easy to set up. Noise we had to trade off because uh, we understood that electric propulsion has got limitations, so the flights of that kind uh, are not going to uh, uh, come that silent. So. Uh, even engines are okay. So the target endurance can be somewhere in between about 10 to 15 minutes and easy to fly again, easy to set up. So, and then we started dreaming of the jet suits, right? Okay, what kind of configuration, you know? Uh, there are so many examples from the comic movies and uh, Iron Man movies, Superman movies, so on and so forth. So, we started studying about you know what kind of developments have have already happened uh, uh, across the world, uh, and then this was the first successful uh, suit that was built by Bell Aircraft Corporation in in the U.S. Uh, it was powered by hydrogen peroxide, and uh, the company is Bell Aircraft. And uh, based on that, they made a chair. Uh, I mean, pretty much the same kind of technology, but uh, you, you don't have to carry. Uh, you can rather sit and, and, and fly. And then an improvised version of that, why? Because this was giving uh, an endurance of about, about 60 seconds. And uh, to increase the endurance, they used uh, a turbojet engines, which was ATF fueled. And this was also by Bell Aircraft Company. And then... Uh, these were old developments, somewhere in between 60s and 70s. And then some of the latest developments by Frankie Zapata, who is a Frenchman. Uh, it's called Hoverboard. Uh, uh, it's based on the Green Goblin, uh, Green Goblin character. And then uh, Maiman uh, from Jetpack Aviation, um, Buck Rogers style. Buck Rogers is again a, a kind of a concept, and this is Iron Man style, Richard Browning, uh, he's very popular, uh, he's from UK, it's Iron Man style. And then, uh, these are some of the success uh, stories of, of the jet packs that uh, we, we were looking at, so it's a sh small clipping of that. So all these successes just did not happen overnight, right? You know, they had to fail, they had to try, retry, and then get it right. So one sh short clipping of their failures as well. 
it can be as stupid as this That's our suit. So that was prototype one. But we had safety. So just adapting the fledge. All right. So with all this information, with all these uh, uh, examples and studies, we, we uh, thought, I think, uh, we have to build something, you know, that is uh, uh, inspired by some of the concepts of the Jetsu that, that were already available and also try to improvise uh, whatever we could. So the, the problems to be solved to, to come up with a practical uh, suit uh, we're starting the engines in vertical position because we had by then decided that we'll go with uh, turbojet engines. These turbojet engines wouldn't start in, in the vertical position because on the backpack, you know, they have, to, uh, they, have to, they have to be placed in vertical position, right? So we had to do conversions for that. So uh, we had to start in vertical position and making engines run on diesel. Why? Because Jet A1 is very explosive. You know, even if there is an arc, it would catch fire and uh, it's almost impossible to put it off. And um, ultralight composites body, uh, that was our strength though, but because we are into composite materials. Uh, a lightweight composite fuel tank, which was again new to us. Central engine governor for uniform thrust. Central control distribution unit, because once we apply any control, all engines sh should uh, uh, accept that control and we need to I mean, transmit the controls to all the engines. Uh, <clears throat> and center power distribution unit because we also have to distribute the power and also the, and also the fuel plumbing. And custom battery pack for this because to start the engines, uh, it's a lot of energy intensive process. So uh, we had to customize a battery pack for high discharge rates. And uh, harness, of course, you know, that is again something uh, which is very safety critical, you know, we had to look into, you know, what is the most compliant uh, uh, harnesses and the buckles, how many number of points, in case if there is a, in case if there is an emergency, then how does the pilot exit, you know, if he has one, uh, a single point buckle, then it's going to be very risky, though it is convenient, but uh, whether it's going to be a, a five point uh, harness or maybe two, three, so that, that we don't, uh, I mean, we had no idea then. And then the training rig, because having learned from all these examples, we want, the, we want the pilot to be safe, right? And hence, we had to come up with a training rig to start with. So materials, we were already working on the turbojet engines by virtue of we uh, manufacturing high-speed UAVs. And we also had... Uh, assembly and balancing machine to, to, I mean, assemble and maintain these engines, but because these engines come with a limited uh, time before overhaul, about 15 to 20 hours. And then we also had the test rig to test the engine for all the parameters, you know, fuel flow and the thrust and RPMs, so on and so forth. And uh, that's because of this virtue, we being into unmanned aerial systems. And... Uh, clipping of what we do. So these are bread and butter. And uh, see, uh, this is 
was not a project that we started because we had a contract. You know, it was pure uh, passion, I would say, or maybe some kind of madness, like I said in the beginning, that, you know, somehow we need to make something so that we could be up in the air whenever we want to in few minutes, right? And we have a team of 15 to 20 engineers, and uh, everybody is busy in their own thing. And for them, it did not make too much of uh, meaning or sense. And then I approach all, all, all engineers in my team uh, that, you know, I have this idea and, and it appears to be possible. And uh, uh, we have most of the uh, material. But unfortunately, there is not too much of interest from them. And then in my team, there is one guy. His name is Alam. He, his education is only 10th standard and uh, his age is just about 24 years and he came to me when he was 18 year old and uh, he came as, as a uh, i was here last night where i saw uh, all this thing was being constructed you know he came to work in a event management company to 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 kind of help uh, and i think he was doing carpentry or something of that sort he wanted to go home but his contractor was not ready to send him because it would rather cost him uh, some money, 1,000, 2,000, something like that. And then somebody uh, told me that, you know, there is one chap like this. I said, hey, theek hai, aajau. And then I uh, told him, what do you know? He said, we were doing some welding. And then he said, I can do welding, which he actually did not know how to weld. But I offered him to weld. And then I could see that he was improving in every attempt he was making, he was improving. So. Uh, and then I said, okay, tumha jau. And so, so that's how we joined. And then he is now able to challenge any of the engineers in our team. You know, I can't uh, uh, stop praising that guy because the kind of improvement that he has shown, the kind of interest that he has got, uh, irrespective. And he comes from a, a rural village somewhere in the north, maybe Bihar, I believe. Right? So. He built that prototype one. He could do CAD modeling. He could uh, uh, do the molding part of it. He could assemble the engines. He could run the engines. Um, and then I wanted him to fly first. And then he made some attempts on it. Uh, but he, he again got too busy into building, into building the prototype two. Um, so that's, that's his story. And, and uh, after once uh, the prototype one was made and it started showing some results, then entire team came, and then now they started supporting in building prototype two. So uh, that's Alam. So the first prototype. So this is the first prototype. Uh, uh, it has uh, six engines, and uh, this is the specification, 30 kgs, empty weight, pilot weight, 60 kg, six engines, total thrust is 180 kgs, endurance is five minutes, it's fueled by diesel. And then uh, we built a training rig. This was also built by Alam. Uh, you can see Alam sitting on, on, on that makeshift uh, you know, cradle, which was an inverted uh, stool. Uh, so this is after completion. And uh, this is the first attempt. Uh, So these are all the failures. And then while we were doing this, there was an RFP, a, a request for proposal from uh, Indian Army, Infantry 7, uh, asking for uh, 48 jetpack suits uh, under emergency procurement. It was uh, issued on January 24th, and the demonstration was supposed to be made on the 23rd or 25th, something like that. We just had about three weeks, because there, we also had to travel. So we came up with prototype 2 to suit the uh, requirements of that particular RFP. And then uh, we came up with a second prototype, which was built in about three weeks. And uh, with these specifications, about 40 kg uh, empty weight, pilot weight 80 kg, we increased one more engine to, to meet the requirements. And total thrust about 230 kg, and endurance about eight minutes. Altitude 3,000 meter, because that was the requirement. And then uh, here is a short clipping of uh, how we build the jet suit. Mm. 
so most of the activities we used to do in the night because that's the only time we had uh, otherwise our bread and butter is building unmanned aerial vehicles so most most of the things you can see in the night boat building and testing Prototype one and two. This prototype two. So the control unit. So this is the fuel caddy to, to refuel. So people were sleepless because of the demo that we had to give to the Indian Army and they had provided a small little quarter to us, quarters to... So that's Alam who was nodding off because of lack of sleep. So these were some of the videos at the demonstration site. And uh, we were given a medal of excellence uh, by the uh, Army Airborne Training School for, for attempts. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. For the kind of attempts, that's it. You know, we were not really successful. We did not uh, tick all the boxes of the requirements, uh, but yet uh, they, 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 they kind of appreciated and they asked us to work more and also work very closely with them, take the requirements, and uh, also they are giving some time now So this is another short clipping uh, where we got some success. So that background music is from the movie called Muthu. It's a Rajni Khan's movie because in South India he's considered to be someone who would make impossible possible, right? So it's it's notional to that. Yeah. So that's the sound of the engine, but actually uh, a deafening noise, I must say. The, the noise is so loud. Organizers asked us to, uh, you know, demonstrate here, but I said, indoors, impossible. You know, let's, let's not... Uh, uh, thank you. Absolutely. We were worried we'd burn the stage down. But, but uh, Raghav, absolutely brilliant presentation, so exciting, but you have to show us the actual piece. I know we saw everyone seen one outside, but it would be great to have one here on stage. We got it here. So what you see there outside was uh, a 3D printed model. We also got the actual model along with the pilot. Uh, so, Jay must be standing somewhere there. Yeah. Jay, are, so Jay, Jay, if we could have you me. on stage, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause. This is Jay. He's the actual pilot. With he's a pilot. Jay Who's Bahaikar. Not gonna fly. So Jay joined us as a flight test engineer for testing the UAVs. And then uh, we were all malnutritioned, right? Entire engineering team was quite malnutritioned. And then we, we found him to be quite healthy. <laughs> so and then we asked him to volunteer. He was more than happy. He's a very shy guy, but, but very strong uh, in what he believes. Uh, like how he looks, he's quite strong, I must say, yeah. So Thanks, Jay, for, for volunteering indeed. He's not getting extra, extra money for taking all the risk in his life. Yeah, I mean, it's pure volunteering. Yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. Jay. All respect. That's, that's, that's really great to push forward this. Uh, uh, Raghav, we would, just, we would have loved to know more. And like you said, we would have loved to see the demo of the, of the, of the, of the suit also. But yeah. we are absolutely running out of time. Sure. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, 
Uh, you have another slide? You I just wanted to conclude saying that sure. you know, what's the future for us? Yes, absolutely. So we have system limitations where it demands great physical strength, dexterity and agility, very high load on the shoulder, you know, not everybody can fly that and cannot walk long distances with the jet suit because it's quite heavy and both hands fully occupied. So pilot says that I can't even scratch my nose. So, I mean, what's the point? I need something else which is more comfortable to me so that I can, I can uh, you know, do something at least, right? I, my hand should be free. And, uh, and this is very unstable, less endurance and range, fully manual, a uh, uh, lot of control load on the pilot and less utility, I would say. Let me be honest about it. So now what's next for us? Advanced only designed for hands-off, hands-off control for flying and less training and less skill dependent. Electronic stability in the sense, you know, I'm talking about autopilots for this. You know, we, we already are into building autopilots. So uh, we would be introducing autopilot onto this. And, uh, and autonomous flight controls, it could be optionally piloted. Uh, in case if the pilot is not available, some material need to be transported from place A to place B, or, or maybe even somebody is injured, then that should be possible because of autonomy. And exoskeleton support, if somebody wants to wear, uh, we'll be giving a lower exo support uh, in the next versions. And uncompromised safety and reliability. Uh, and compliance with airworthy, uh, airworthiness and the regulators. Uh, we aspire of building a, a, a national air display team uh, to participate in some of the international competitions and also some of the shows. And uh, we'll have a training academy. We are formulating the courses for this and a dedicated development center. Uh, for As of now, it's only a part-time small activity for us. But with the kind of interest that we are seeing, uh, I think this deserves a, a dedicated facility now. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure, Thank you. I I'm wondering if yeah. Jarvis could scratch Iron Man's nose. <laughs> <laughs> that is something for which we'll have to watch those Iron Man movies. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Reddy, you. and thank you thank to you. Jay also. Ladies and gentlemen, round of applause for Mr. Raghavendra thank Reddy. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, now let's move on to our next session. You know, uh, you know, Aisha, modern esports is a developing industry, and it is in fact witnessing a massive global boom. Did you know that India saw esports players? The esports players in India doubled from 2020 to 21 to 2021, with revenue growing by 29 percent from 750 crore rupees in 2020 to 970 crores in 2021. Exactly. So, in fact, even in the International Olympic Committee, the Commonwealth uh, Committee as well, we've seen the numbers jump up just so much, right? Uh, in fact, the Olympic Council of Asia have all tested the potential for esports through exhibition games and the growing opportunities that are providing a fillip for these to officially debut as medal sports in the very near future. In fact, India officially recognized eSports as a part of multi-sports events under the Ministry of Youth Affairs and Sports Umbrella in December 2022, much to the rejoicing of gamers and developers across the country. And now to give us the play-by-play -play on this, we'd like to invite on stage the Chief Strategy Officer of Dream 11, Dev Bajaj, up on stage. Thank you very much, guys. Really appreciate it. I wish I could have flown over here in a jet propulsion machine and excited people. Uh, but the topic here is very interesting, which is uh, what Dream Sports, Dream 11, and Dream Capital, which is the group that I head, uh, are doing to enable the Indian sports and gaming ecosystem. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Dream Sports. Uh, I've done a few things in my life. I've uh, built a business in India and sold it to a strategic. I was a venture capital investor. Uh, we happened to invest in a company uh, at an early stage, which was doing something in fantasy sports. That company, uh, while I was at Kalari Capital, ended up being Dream 11. And I joined uh, Dream 11 Dream Sports three years ago to start this group. Uh, and our vision was really to invest in the next uh, generation of entrepreneurs uh, who would help us build a sports and gaming ecosystem on the back of what Dream 11 was doing. So diving straight in, I won't bore you with uh, too many facts. Dream 11. 
Just making sure that my clicker is working. I don't think it is. Could the AV team? There we go. Thanks. So everybody knows GDP per capita in India went up 2x in the last decade. It's expected to go 2x next decade. Middle class households with income above 5 lakh rupees uh, per year are going up 2x uh, in the next decade. Um, but what's very interesting is, as we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when people have paid for roti, kapra, makan, what are they going to do? They're going to spend on entertainment. And we saw that in the last decade, spends per capita on entertainment went up four times. And it's only a question mark on how much they'll grow in the next decade. That's a very exciting time for a sports and gaming ecosystem, when users, consumers are looking to spend on things beyond basic needs. And we're already seeing this in the data. So what does that mean for gaming? Again, I won't throw many facts at you, but our estimates at Dream Capital tell us that the $3 billion market that it is in gaming with 500 million gamers by 2030 will be a $20 billion market in India alone. That's when India will kind of become an important, relevant industry um, in, in, you know, in the global grand scheme of things. This 20 billion is just extrapolation and the number of gamers is only growing from 500 million to 800 million. The reason for why this is growing is because Indian users are now starting to spend money on gaming, right? They're spending money on Dream 11, they're spending money on Battle Royale formats, uh, and we see that uh, increasing. But the 20 billion is an extrapolation, like I said. This could be 30, 40, 50 billion if we have more gaming unicorns coming out of the country, and that's what Dream Capital is trying to do, is trying to in set up, encourage entrepreneurs to build large businesses in the space. Sports market, right? At our core, Dream Sports is a sports business. We have to talk about the intersection of sports and gaming. We expect the sports market to go from 24 billion to 100 billion in the next five years. That is twice as fast the growth rate in India versus any other market, any other sports market in the world. Very exciting times. 440 million digital viewers. Number of Indians playing sports will grow up by three, will grow by three times in the next five years. Startling. It, it, it has huge impact on what kind of industries will come out in sports and gaming in the next few years. Moving on to what Dream Capital is doing, right? Because that's what I'm here to talk about. We have 11 portfolio companies, including Dream 11. Uh, so it's just a coincidence. We've deployed almost $200 million in the market. Um, that's a large amount of capital to put into an industry that's coming up. And I want to show you what these companies look like. I'll come back to this slide. I won't spend too much time on it. But we're, these 11 companies are creating an ecosystem for us, right? At the center of it is obviously Dream 11 and Dream Capital, DreamX, which is a business that I'll talk about. But there's a lot of other interesting companies in, in, in interesting spaces. Let me go and give you a few examples. Can I have the uh, audio visual team play a video on this business? Good evening, everybody. There's been a big build up to this match. Go! That's going all the way! Superb shot! Reacted well there. Good catch. That's out of the middle of the bat. Oh, nice catch. That's a superb shot. The beauty of a delivery there. Good shot. Boom! They've done it! The winning runs with a massive shot! Go! That, ladies and gentlemen, is India's first AAA high-quality sports 
cricket game. Three years ago, we invested in an entrepreneur by the name of Rohit Gupta. Uh, we encouraged him to build this studio with us. Uh, he's got an amazing team. Credit to him and his team for building this game. It comes out in the next couple of months. If you want to pre-register, it's on dreamgamestudios.in. But it speaks volumes about the potential of sports and gaming. There is no FIFA for cricket. There is no FIFA on mobile for cricket. And it's a very, very interesting time. Uh, very interesting time that Rohit is launching this game. We have very high hopes for it. If you can go to the next slide. So Strong is a business that is a platform that allows gamers to, to connect with each other and play any game on that platform. So if you are a Dream Game Studios fan, you can play Dream Game Studios on So Strong. You can play the cricket game. If you're a PUBG fan, if you're a Free Fire fan, you can go on So Strong, connect with a friend. If you're in Delhi, connect with a friend in Mumbai, and compete for rewards. So finally, there is a B2C online first platform where people can connect with each other and compete for rewards. This product is already live on the Google Play Store. Please try it. Some people may have heard about radio. Uh, uh, the Honorable Minister also talked about uh, Web3, mobile gaming, how they intersect. This, for us, was a very large, almost $100 million investment in a business that is creating a set of IP that houses NFTs in sports. Uh, radio has now created the largest set of rights of cricket players that you can, you know, that have now produced and, and now houses these NFTs that you can go onto the platform and buy. But now Web3 alone buying NFTs is not good enough for us. What are you going to do with those NFTs? Which is why we felt like we should back radio because those NFTs can now be used in the dream sports ecosystem. We've created a utility called d3.club where you can go on buy NFTs, put those NFTs in the game, play a strategy game, win money, win prizes, get those NFTs out, sell them, use those NFTs in the cricket game that Dream Game Studios is building. There's multiple utilities, and there's many, many others I can talk about. But finally, Web3 is allowing users to own a piece of the game. Um, and Radio was our shot at doing that. D3.club is how we've created a utility for Web3. Uh, the product's already live. DreamX, uh, the, uh, you know, is a very exciting business. Amit Sharma is here. He's our CTO. He's helping us build DreamX. Um, it is our first attempt at building a fintech platform. At our core, we have so many users who come in and deposit with us. They use that money um, to play games. Can we give them interoperable liquidity across different utilities, different games? Can we give them more use cases to save, spend, invest on DreamX so they don't have to leave the ecosystem? Convenience, um, many, many applications. I'm sure Amit will talk about it. But DreamX will he hopefully help us hold the entire ecosystem together. Fan code, people might have heard about it last year when India West Indies was playing only, a, only for the first time on digital, on fan code exclusively. Fan code is our attempt of giving sports fans access to content that may, they may or may not see on larger OTT channels, because sometimes the ROI doesn't work out for those channels to have that. We as sports fans want to offer anything, tier two, tier three sports. You want to watch Ranji Trophy, you want to watch CPL, uh, Legends League, all of it is available on fan code. Coming back to our ecosystem, maybe we can start connecting the dots now, right? The same slide that I talked about last time. So if you're a sports fan, you will, before a match, you will go make a team on Dream 11. We have a business called Dream Set Go, where you can go online, buy tickets, buy an experience to go watch the match live. So let's say you made a team on Dream 11, you bought a ticket, you're in the stadium, you go to fan code, you're checking scores, you're watching highlights, replays while you're in the stadium. You go to radio, you buy NFTs of the players that are doing well, you put them into a strategy game. You watch the match, you go home, you enjoy. Fan code shop can send you merchandise for your favorite uh, players and teams. And you can play a cricket game, a non-live cricket game, if you're not done 
if you're done with live action but still want more of cricket or sports. This is how we are trying to put an ecosystem together and thinking about where the sports and gaming fan can spend time. There's many other companies, there's a fitness platform, et cetera, et cetera, that I won't get into, maybe save that for next time. Dreamcast is something that we coined, I think, a couple of weeks ago. Um, at Dream Capital, as investors, we want to back entrepreneurs. And entrepreneurs are in this room or watching are always wondering where and what can I do? This is what's happening, this is the ecosystem. Where can I, where, is, why, where are the ideas to build? Look, so Dream Capital looks to invest in businesses that already have product market fit, but what we try to do is coin this term called Dreamcast where we can tell you maybe over the next 10 years, what are we thinking is high probability of what's going to happen in the sports and gaming world? So our first Dreamcast is that AI, and a gentleman before me spoke about this, that AI, the, about the potential of AI. AI will be athletes. What do I mean by that? I believe that, or our entire team believes, and this is already happening in the US, that AI is becoming intelligent enough to give it data and input and let it play a simulated match of any sport, football, basketball, eventually cricket, and AI in a simulated world while you're watching it on television or on a, on a digital app will get smarter and develop skills to get better at a sport. And the app, and watching simulated gaming is gonna become second most popular after watching live sport. This is again, like I said, happening in the US. We believe it will happen in India over the next 10 years. Please look out for this. Sports will become an investable asset class. People will be, like people invest in the stock market, people will be able to invest in sports, teams, players, stock, stocks of players. Again, already happening in the US. It should come to India. I'll do both of these together. Your phone will become your AR, VR device in the next 10 years. We've already seen the Oculus become much cheaper. We think there's Indian entrepreneurs are building AR, VR dev devices that democratize the price of VR. And we think as a result of that, Ready Player One, which is a movie that we all saw maybe five years ago, is going to be a reality. Kids will be gaming with AR, VR devices, but they will be spending a significant amount of their time in the metaverse, getting smarter and smarter. Uh, there's a business which is almost $2 billion in revenue called Roblox, it's a public company, that where, businesses are, where, where kids are going online, picking up skills, interacting with other kids, and learning in the metaverse. So just think about the applications of what can happen in the metaverse for a sports and gaming company. Very interesting thought. Fans will control sports. Right now, fans watch sports. Web3 allows people to own assets in gaming. Fans in sports will go out there and take decisions in a live sport. We truly believe that. Again. Some entrepreneurs in the U.S. are already develop developing interesting products around this. I think entrepreneurs in India should think about this. And for sure, I think everybody knows this, India will become a multi-sport nation. Right now we're cricket crazy, kabaddi, football, a lot of new formats of sports are coming in. I think in the next decade you'll truly see, you know, a level playing field where there'll be other sports and more entrepreneurship, more innovation, more sports commerce, most merchandise. Anyways, I'm an optimist, but I really truly believe that we are at an inflection point in this country for sports and gaming. It's a pleasure talking to you guys. If there are any entrepreneurs in the room, anyone watching, please write to us at intros at dreamcap.in, which is our email. Please send some details about your business. We will evaluate whether it is a product market fit we don't want to just invest in ideas. We can happily give you guidance, but we're looking for people who've already built a product or significant progress in building a product so we can help it scale with access to our users, with access to capital, access to connecting our ecosystem. Thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Bajaj, for that and for sharing your expertise in the field with us. Ladies and gentlemen, as of 2022, India has emerged as the largest online gaming market with over 50 crore gamers and more than 900 companies active in the country. 
Additionally, emerging technologies like AR, VR, AI, next generation consoles, and newer business models like gaming as a service are creating growth avenues right from programming and development to even newer roles of gaming journalism and web analysis. Mr. Bajaj did uh, touch upon some of these points in his uh, speech just now. Now as users gear up for the next generation of gaming, developers are continuing to create innovative solutions that unlock new creative possibilities. Now our next panel, which is on digital gaming, the future is here, will give us an insight into all of this and more. But before I invite our panelists up on stage, just once again a reminder, please do keep your posts coming on social media. You can tag us, uh, sorry, you can use the hashtag India Digital Fest, also use the hashtag IDF2023. I'd also like to take this quick moment to thank our sponsors uh, for this lovely, lovely program that you are here with us today. This is WhatsApp Presents India Digital Fest. Our presenting partner is, of course, a WhatsApp and other partners. We've got uh, associate partner is Dream Sports, banking partner IDFC First Bank, knowledge partner Ramaya University of Applied Sciences Bengaluru, and associate partner Storia Foods. All right, now for our panel, I'd like to first invite up on stage my co host Aisha Faridi to moderate the panel. And on the panelists, her panelists are the chief technology officer at Dream 11, Mr. Amit Sharma. The Chief Executive Officer of India Tech ORG, Mr. Ramesh Kailasam, and the Group, ex uh, group Chief Executive Officer of Nordbin Gaming, Mr. Siddharth Kedia. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking the time out. I'd request all of you to please pick up your mics, Ramesh. Yeah. <laughs> so we're here to talk about uh, gaming as an industry, and they've, of course, had a very fascinating presentation, which really throws open your mind to just what the future and potential of gaming could be in the next decade, as we are calling it. Uh, Ramesh, if I could start off with you, you know, because in many countries, when it comes to gaming, it's gone past the, you know, tipping point of adoption by the mainstream media, as we call it, right? I mean, interactive entertainment is displacing books, music, movie, TV, all that we've consumed media to be. And gaming, in that sense, has been the start of it all, right? That was the first to go digital. What do you think lies ahead in the future, here at a time when we're talking 6G already? Uh, well, great question. Uh, I would say that uh, if you look at the evolution of gaming that we have all gone through, I mean, you have come from those big uh, elephant-sized hardware consoles to such miniaturized now mobiles. I mean, mobile is now breaking all the records, penetrating well across the gaming ecosystem. Also because it has democratized access to anybody and everybody thanks to internet connectivity and as you rightly pointed out with more and more bandwidth and broadband coming in whether it's 5G, 4G, 5G or even 6G. Uh, the, the, the content penetration has now become more seamless and easier. Uh, and, and, and adding on to that is the fact that we are now seeing usage across right up to the hinterlands. So you will see more and more technology evolving where people will be going beyond the mobile someday when uh, everything becomes virtual and you're able to play things uh, not just on the touch of the screen but just adding some gadgets and playing around. You will see more and more evolution happening on that front with AR, VR and all of that stuff, stuff coming in. Mm. Amit, does it have to be sports or is the potential of gaming beyond what we have imagined in our realms at the current day and age? So yes. Uh, you're asking the wrong well, person. gaming, of course, <laughs> is a sport in itself, so are, in so any we, case. We are all about sports, so you're asking the wrong guy. But no, it doesn't have to be limited to sports, right? There are a lot of people in a lot of different sectors. They're trying to actually, you know, gaming is getting traction, right? If you look at uh, a lot of things on top of esports now, which is not like pure traditional sports, for example, there's a lot of traction there also. But uh, however, I would definitely talk about uh, everything around sports because uh, we have... We, like as they've just said before us, right? We're trying to create an ecosystem, right? So for us, the last 10 odd years have been spent in building 
one of the world's leaders fantasy sports platform right so we now we are saying that okay how do how does dream sports now contribute as you go from now you know this innovation that's happening in online gaming and the sports tech sector how does dream sports contribute to that and that's all these like the so strongs of the world that are you everything else that you revolves around it right everything powered by deep technology right so we've developed a lot of expertise over the last few years in building like large scale distributed scalable systems uh, just to throw some numbers out there right so we uh, last ipl which is our peak time of the year we had around 7 almost 7 million users concurrently on our platform and on friday when ipl starts this year our largest contest will have more than 13 million entries in a single contest so you know so that's to actually build a technology platform that can actually sustain that kind of scale you really need to have uh, talent that actually is upskilled learns how to actually create user experiences that are immersive that actually users flock to their to our systems so yeah so that's the future for us so we're using that expertise that we built on dream 11 and trying to replicate across everything else that we actually trying to do under the dream sports ecosystem so that commercial gaming in india how difficult is it to stretch and penetrate beyond the cricket crazy nation that we are interesting question i think uh, the analogy that i can give you is media when ott platforms came up in india everyone said indian consumer doesn't pay for content right television is we are hardly paying anything a dollar and we get 800 channels and we proved that wrong over time yeah. so started with disney hotstar amazon uh, netflix at those price points have proven it wrong i think the same is true for gaming uh the commercialization of gaming and you saw some of the figures that uh, that people before this have talked about yeah. the the primary source of revenue in gaming is coming through in app purchases and that's the business model shift in gaming that has happened from buying you know 60 dollars on the console you play for free and then you keep buying through the course of the game in micro transactions that is what has changed so the indian gamer much to the uh, to the belief that we don't pay the indian gamer pays they just have to see the value in it and that's what is going beyond that and and that is just casual gaming i mean if you see what dream 11 has put together that has ta- taken taken gaming as an industry to the next level to the next stratosphere and it's happening because the consumer is paying it's not that the consumer is not paying right but you know you prompted me to my next question because while the cost of gaming to my mind is increasing um for the user it's only becoming cheaper by the day as is data you know we had a session with bharti enterprises earlier in the day where one of the cheapest countries in the world as to the per minute cost of data or you know telecom that we're paying how does a company like nazara or nordwin become profitable in that scenario then or is it just about increasing the volumes right now and deeper penetration how do you create a moat around your business well it's a very interesting question it's a very deep question like i could take you know this entire session answering that no don't but <laughs> i think in short the the answer really is that as you see value coming out of the ecosystem right uh, now for example nordwin we don't make money because of uh, from the end consumer we are a b2b company we make money much like ipl makes money brand sponsorships and media rights however the the money that we are making is coming on the back of distribution disruption it happened in sports it's happening in esports the mainstream media like you alluded at the start of your session is now distri- is now putting esports out there for its fans so which was in the di- digital realm is coming now in mainstream media that's how we are making money as far as the gaming companies so you know the best analogy is when pubg mobile got banned in india billions of dollars got shaved off the market cap of 10 cent yeah. to give you numbers india the pubg mobile base was 25% one in four global downloads were sitting in india guess what the revenue contribution of indians were to pubg mobile 0.6% it's the promise of the future that they'll pay as they see more and more value we start paying and i think that's how the sustainability happens right but ramesh you know many of us don't think like that but e sports is different than gaming right gamer gaming is the mother umbrella if i can call it that but when it comes to indian businesses is e sports the way to go because rest of it is pretty much covered covered by global players well i would say that you have opportunity 
wide open. I mean, I wouldn't say that Indians should restrict from esports. I mean, esports is another area where Indians should get into. But uh, I think it's important for the ecosystem and people to understand that there are various uh, kind of pillars within the larger gaming ecosystem, and esports is one amongst them. You, of course, have fantasy, which uh, Dream 11 has been pushing a lot. Uh, and then you've got the casual game layer, which also has multiple layers to it. For example, in the casual games, you have those games which are mobbed from real world uh, games, which are recognized by federations in terms of rules. You've got games which are not federation recognized. You've got games which are there only in the virtual world. You can't play them in real world. And then, of course, you've got games like Rummy, Poker, and so on. So it's a pretty huge and large variety of games that exist within these broad categories. And I would say that India should be actually looking at the entire spectrum and, and not restrict to one. And each of them have grown in their own phenomenal manner. You've got so many companies and startups which have come in the casual gaming space. You've got plenty of them coming in the uh, fantasy space and so on. And if you, to your point, we are currently consuming those eSport games which have been built by overseas players. But it's a matter of time we will have Indian companies coming with large uh, sports which are accepted globally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, if you look at the AVGC and the initiatives which the government is pushing, it has to trigger. I mean, we are, I, I keep telling this, we in the startup ecosystem, we are a producing economy and a consuming one. And therefore, you have a large consumer base available here to validate and actually absorb this if they are built uh, with better quality and so on, which we are capable of. So my take would be that uh, India should look at all the streams, India should work towards all of it, and enable that ecosystem that will create livelihoods and, and a trillion dollar economy that is being expected from this space. So if you look at livelihoods, again, uh, it was already mentioned, but you have plenty of careers now developing about this new age economy that includes even coaches who are training people on how to play games, to pe and part of it is in the gig economy. And then you've got people who are actually, I mean, journalists covering it are building a career of their own. Lawyers who are covering it are creating the legal ecosystem on their own. You've got coders, you've got developers, and more importantly, you've got the gig part, which is giving the surround support for it. So phenomenal, I would say, uh, emergence of livelihoods that can come from this, plus quality content can take us to the next level. But along with that also come policy hurdles, right? We've seen that play out in China in the last three years. Is that a hindrance at all? Or do you think in India it's too much of a nascent stage where it's at currently? Well, I would say that India has evolved in uh, a mature stage in many of the gaming ecosystem. There are some which are still evolving. And uh, the government of India is now working, as we heard the Honorable Minister for State for IT mention about it, that there will be a gaming regulation that is coming in, which I hope will be statesman-like, and I hope the finance ministry will also absorb that statesman-like approach and not tax the industry, uh, which we are hopeful of uh, in, in a positive way that things will fall in place. But uh, the, I think one of the things that is critical and one thing which has moved fast in the last six months is the fact that the government has also recognized the need for regulating legitimate players who are working in this sector, which is quite natural across sectors. I wanted to talk to you because you're the tech guy, right? Uh, Ramesh was just talking about the infrastructure that esports and gaming uh, brings with it. Tell me, what are the hindrance, hindrances and opportunities that you see? Because, I mean, you've had global experience yourself, right? How do you imply all of that to India? And is India the talent and the consumer market that can absorb it all? See, um, what you need to give uh, users will get engaged with you when you give them a great user experience. And the heart of, at heart of it, what actually you need is a very strong uh, infrastructure that binds everything together, right? So there are four layers to it. So one is connectivity. So right with this huge digital in, uh, uh, India initiatives, right? There's like connectivity is getting better in tier two, three city, tier two and tier three cities. There's 5G connectivity, etc. The end devices are getting better. The smartphone penetration is constantly increasing. And there is huge investments in the cloud infrastructure layer, right? The, the Amazons, the Googles, and the Microsoft of the world, you know, they're creating this cloud networks, especially with, again, a push of data centers that are created in India now that offer very, very low latency to the end users. All of this enables players like Dream 11 and everything else that Dream Sports and other gaming unicorns are doing, right? They allows us game publishers to actually take our games 
to the end consumers right this this reach the increase in reach that is happening because of this development is like a huge tailwind that i can see that will definitely increase the users that actually start playing the game start interacting with the ecosystem so that's a huge opportunity from that perspective um, on the other hand to actually create a great game at this scale for such large volumes in india the technology choices are same as that you would need that once are created a product in the silicon valleys of the world right there's no difference right so you still need those state, uh, emerging technologies like machine learning ai so for example every single app right now tries to personalize the user experience for in real life for example the contests that you play the your offers or the payment methods that you want to do all of that is personalized to you that's using our machine learning algorithms we want to provide a very so data security is key to us right so we want to make sure that we protect all the users that are there on the gaming platforms so we invest heavily in machine learning to avoid fraud prevention into our systems so you know these ways we actually use ai and ml technologies in a lot of different ways uh, one other example would be like how do we prioritize what to do next it's very easy you talked a little bit about uh, how do we make money right but when as a business when you're trying to make decisions if you keep constantly thinking about that north star and make your decisions your product doesn't like do that well in general right so you need to optimize multiple metrics now how do you find connections between those two different metrics that eventually lead to monetization so we are investing in something called as causal inferencing so we've actually collaborated with columbia university in new york to actually understand this deep technology what it lets you do is it lets you use data and understand the relationship various between various metrics that you're actually using so then you can actually you know prioritize your features and things that you want to do on your platform and you try to optimize these various other metrics which indirectly lead up to your top line becoming better so these are all the methodologies that have been used in as i said both in silicon valley and other parts of the world and we are doing the same things in india as well so that's very really exciting so that we'd like to add to that i mean are indians willing to pay for each and every price point within a game so you know the the gaming industry has gone through a very interesting evolution and and i'm just talking about india sure. so if you look at 7 8 years back when when it was really growing it was the it it was console right right and console essentially meant it's the jorbags and the golf course roads and the south delhis that got covered then it went to pc and it got got uh, covered a little more uh, of the population but mobile gaming is what changed the landscape of gaming right the democratized gaming the lingua franca changed from english to hindi right you started so at one point in time if you google pubg the top 10 cities that people came from were aizwal were ranchi delhi and bombay were not in the top 10 cities all of a sudden this is for pubg right. so at least bombay doesn't right yeah. so i think i think what's happening is that there are various point for price points that you will find consumers willing to pay but like i said we are value seekers right as indians we are value seekers if we believe we are getting value in what we are spending we'll spend and a lot of triple uh, a games in india have seen that trend changing where hardly no one spending to you know hundreds and thousands of people start spending money and buying doing those micro transactions Uh, so yeah there are there are uh, every, every price point there are enough and more consumers and that keeps increasing by the day by the month mm. um i have to ask you um as well you know amit because ipl is on friday i want to know how do you prepare for an event like that so uh, the preparation for ipl of a year actually begins when the ipl in the year prior ends right that's why that's how forward looking we are we start thinking because uh it's the time of the year where we get maximum users everyone is engaged with the platform you know our vision and dream sports is make sports better mm -hmm. so the idea is like dream 11 as an app for example lets you engage better with the sports that you're watching so we make sure that every single year we have like a ton of features that we actually all build together like for example this year we're launching a feature called as auto substitutions in your teams right just in case you made a team and you forgot to edit it close to the game and then that player doesn't play it's it's a bummer right you lose interest in the game completely so we constantly think of features that the users would like every year our scale increases so as i said we have like we expecting 40 to 50% more users this year so we make sure our systems are prepared to actually handle that scale so every quarter after the last table ends we keep adding more features and this entire quarter of jan feb march is spent in like testing each and every system you know i, I want to tell you that as 
there's a lot of work that goes behind hosting one single game. It, it seems very easy. It's easier to actually do it on a smaller scale, but for someone like us, there are like hundreds of engineers working on 150 different systems behind the scenes that interact with each other in real time with millisecond latencies, right? So that our end users don't feel any lag and have a great experience. So it's like a festive season for us. We are, have all systems ready to go. We scale it up for the traffic and the capacity that we're expecting. And yeah, so we, 31st March is the day we're waiting for it. Right, Amit, my final question, because our next panelists are already here, is there a cheat code? Or do you have to really understand cricket to win? You need to be deeply skilled and understanding the game that you're watching. And yes, and then you'll do well. It's a very politically correct answer. But yeah, we'll see you on Friday. Thanks so much, gentlemen, for taking the time out. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, gentlemen, for that, and thank you, Aisha, for giving us a better si uh, insight into the gaming world. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now, Stephen Hawking famously proclaimed in 2014 that the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Wait, 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 wait. There's no need to panic. Don't worry. Machines are not taking off on their own. We're nowhere close to that stage yet, if at all, I mean. But there is some concern, there is some genuine concern about, you know, what AI, ML, and automation together can achieve, and if it could be used for the bad instead of the good. Yes, I know I'm sounding a bit pessimistic, but let's look at the other side of the coin. Everything I've heard about AI is fascinating. We've heard so much today, from medicine to music, from commerce to cricket. AI has the power to predict and analyze human behavior to achieve the impossible. But I, know, I don't know which side of the coin, which side of the fence you are, but I have an easy way to solve this because our next session comprises a panel of speakers who are evangelists and soothsayers when it comes to examining the impact of AI on humanity. So to settle the humanity versus AI question, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on stage our panel, which has the futurist and humanist Gerd Leonhard, author and futurist, Callum Chase. We also have senior advisor at Niti Ayog, Ms. Anna Roy. And to moderate this session, I'd like to invite back on stage the MD and CEO of Times Network, M.K. Anand. Thank you all. It's seven o'clock and I'm, you know, this is uh, one of the large, long part of uh, the whole uh, India Digital Fest. When we were sitting and uh, designing content, I was pretty uh, keen that uh, we spend a lot more time than we usually do on this one subject of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, policy and future of artificial intelligence. And most importantly, from our point of view, India's place in that uh, area and that's where I had asked uh, Mehir to look for uh, you know the best experts that we could bring down here who can talk about the subject our uh, our objective from uh, India Digital Fest and from Times Network is to try and make this topic uh, interesting and uh, bring awareness so that people start talking we hope that over the next one or two or three years we are able to sort of bring uh, more awareness of uh, on on this very very important subject that it can bring, uh, you know, it, it can bring uh, the popularity of the subject and the awareness of the subject can bring uh, some sort of an urgency on the political uh, and the, the, the power uh, basis and, and, and people who can sort of uh, start making decisions and policy changes which uh, will be very, very important for our uh, country as we are poised to, uh, you know, take off. I mean, we always talk about this being India's decade and the next one, but there's also a period of great challenge uh, because artificial intelligence has the potential to put us right out there, up there, or it could also be, uh, can play spoil sport and sort of derail some of uh, the, the, the trajectory that India is uh, trying to, uh, you know, pave for itself as we go forward. 
Uh, I have, I mean, the two uh, speakers here are, uh, you know, well known because, I mean, they have already spoken to you and they have very, very strong points of view. And it would be interesting to see them talk to each other and, and sort of come out with uh, uh, points that would be interesting to us. And there, uh, Mrs. Roy is uh, with us. Uh, she's a senior advisor with Niti Aayog, which is the premier body uh, which sort of advises the Indian government and, uh, you know, lays directions to policy. And I think as, as much as uh, Times Network would be a very good uh, platform or, a, or, 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 a, or an agent to make popular opinion, Niti Aayog is extremely po well poised to make the same kind of points of view within the annals, within the corridors of power, uh, where this kind of a subject needs to be uh, heard more. Uh, she's the foremost expert on this, and in a, her uh, charge, under her charge is uh, you know this subject of AI data and all that goes into uh, this this particular area. And therefore, we believe that her presence here was very very important, and uh, you know her contributions to this debate will be interesting. So to start off with, uh, as I started talking about, uh, you know, I think, you know, there are two, two parts here. And when we talk about AI, we usually start jumping towards what's called as AGI, uh, generative or general intelligence, uh, when, you know, uh, artificial general intelligence. And then there is AI itself, which is uh, most of our, the apps, the phones, uh, our ATC, uh, you know, I think even traffic, most of the stuff that we currently do, uh, social media, uh, recommendations, uh, YouTube, all these have, uh, uh, you know, already got AI embedded. And uh, AI, as we currently see, the, the most interesting that came about three months back and which has got sort of taken everybody's interest is ChatGPT and how it sort of does uh, certain cool things. And those cool things can be sort of suddenly become a competitor to us, to our jobs, etc. So it's suddenly become very interesting. But I think those are in the area of how artificial intelligence is currently changing our lives. The other is, what is the end game of artificial intelligence if it goes in, you know, uh, unchecked and gets to a point where it becomes uh, independent and starts thinking for itself and starts correcting itself and becomes super intelligent and then what happens? And that's what we saw in Callum's presentation and to some extent towards the end in, uh, in uh, Gerd's presentation as to how to do, what to do, and what not to do in that area. So I think uh, without much ado, uh, you know, you talked about, uh, Callum, to start off with, you talked about, um, you know, the... the uh, the topmost companies which are, op are countries which are, which are in this space are US and China. And they are the topmost because there is nobody else uh, you know, anywhere close to them. Uh, in fact, it's a clump of other countries which are in the 0 to 20 scale, which I saw in your graph. And the rest of them are in 60 or 100, US being 100, China being 60. So how, how dangerous is this uh, subject to be left to a duopoly? What will happen to populations and countries and corporations uh, outside of the duopoly? I don't think it's necessarily dangerous for people outside the duopoly if AI is mostly developed by American China, but I don't think it's ideal. Partly because there's eight billion of us on this planet and really we all, or you know, every country has a contribution to make and um, it would be better if everybody was, was involved. Undoubtedly, countries which develop leading edge AI will make money out of it. The tech giants in America have become the biggest companies in the world over a, a decade or two um, by exploiting that technology. And you know, it'd be a, a good thing for other countries to benefit from that too. But you know, at the end of the day, whether a, uh, an, an app is developed or a platform is developed in, in Bangalore or in Beijing, it doesn't really matter to the user. Uh, we, we can all benefit from it. But I, I do think it would be a good thing if more countries got involved. Um, I, I just do, do think a duopoly is a little bit fragile and, and, and unhelpful. The other point that we made, you made yesterday when we were talking was the, the, the democratization of uh, AI, uh, you know, as uh, most of the, them are already embedded into consumer products. Would you want to talk something about that? Yeah, I, I, I'm sure we, well, we all take it for granted, but I still find it somewhat miraculous, the services that the tech giants provide us. If you brought uh, somebody from the Victorian era to the modern age and showed them cars, which can get us around much faster than they probably thought was ever possible, and said to them, we'll soon have flying cars and self-driving cars, they would find all that quite amazing. 
But if you then showed them Wikipedia and Google search and showed them that actually we've got something pretty close to omniscience, I think that would really impress them much more. So we have miracles already. Um, and that's great. And we're going to have even more impressive miracles as AI gets more and more powerful. Now, AI is like any technology. It's dual use. You can have very good effects and you can have very bad effects. And we have to have regard to the short-term possible damages from privacy, from bias, from lack of transparency, lack of explainability of these models, and also the longer-term dangers from uh, possible, well, probable widespread technolo technological unemployment, which could be very good if we figure out an economy to accompany it, or could be very bad if we don't, and ultimately, as you said, superintelligence and the existential threat which that poses to us, very good possibilities and some very bad possibilities. Um, but we do need to, you know, bear, bear both of those sides, the positive and the negative. My most important priority is that more people should be thinking about this. It's clear to me that AI is already an incredibly powerful technology and it's going to become, if it isn't already, our most powerful technology. And although there's a lot of buzz about ChatGPT and GPT-4 now, it's not top of the news. And to me, it's by far the most important thing happening in the world. And AI is going to get more and more important. Most people in the world are not paying very much attention to the rapid pace that AI is developing at. They don't understand where it's going. And I think this is dangerous. Not, and I disagree with Gert here. Actually, I disagree with Gert on almost everything in a very amiable way. Not because we can do very much about the course that AI will take. It will go the way it goes. But because the great danger is that we panic, if self-driving cars become very common and everybody suddenly wakes up and thinks, wow, I'm going to lose my job, if that happens very quickly with no preparation, no acclimatization, that can lead to a panic. And that is very dangerous. So I, my, my main priority is to get more and more people realizing where this exponential journey is taking us so that we have as little panic as possible. Thank you. So, good. Now, let us come to your uh, views on uh, what uh, this uh, holds. I mean, and I think we should sort of we can move to the singularity, superintelligence part of uh, the conversation that we were having. Uh, you know, and you in your uh, in your uh, you know session that you took earlier, were talking about uh, you know the computers. I mean, the, the AI or AGI is not going to be based uh, in feelings and emotions and. Uh, you know, a lot of other intelligence that human beings use and it's only going to be the intellectual or the logical part of it and therefore it may not be the right thing to sort of, uh, you know, allow it to go to a certain place. It should be used as a machine and an assistant. Uh, how do you think we are poised? Because in his session he talked about red button and he also said that it looks like people are not going to take their fingers off it, which means that red button is going to be pressed. And you said we have to not press it. How do we, how do we sort of really get there? Okay, you um, know, your, your, your talk was very, very persuasive, extremely convincing, but I was, you know, after that thinking, how logical and how real is that, that it's going to be even possible to control it? Okay, um, well, well, first, I think that there's three t uh, topics that we need to uh, examine and collaborate on at a global level. Uh, first is climate change and energy. Yeah, we can't solve that in one country. In one, this is something we have to do together. The second one is intelligent machines that are beyond the, you know, fancy software, what I call IA, right, intelligent assistance. That's not per se dangerous, that's just a job factor and it changes society. But a machine with an IQ of one billion, in, in a sense of logic, that is much more dangerous. So when we talk about this AI discussion on a global level, we need to think about IA, you know, everyday thing, AI, which is better than that, and then general intelligence, which is a system that's a lot like a human uh, and also has a lot more capacity. That is the part where we're probably going to need a moratorium of a sort because that is extremely powerful and has lots of military applications. Okay. The third thing we have to collaborate on is genetic engineering uh, of everything, but also of humans which is also, of course, based on AI. So to me, the climate change thing, we're doing that, we can solve it, that's my view. It's desperate, it's emergency, but we're going to solve it. Right. Uh, 
On the second part, we're nowhere close, and that is a big mistake. Because to me, I think Callum agrees on this, this is a much bigger topic in overall dimension. It's what we're going to do with ourselves, how we're going to be humans in the future based on technology and based on genetic engineering. Right? So what makes me hopeful, however, um, is that we have in the past proven that we actually do collaborate as humans when we have a good reason. Nuclear, we had two bombs, we collaborated, right? Financial crisis, COVID. So I do think that we're at the point where we're seeing with ChatGPT what the power of this could be if it became more intelligent. Right? And that will give us reason. I think we should not feel disempowered to actually do something about controlling it or convening something that will make us get the benefit without getting the advantage. The, the problem that I'm seeing primarily also in India, but also worldwide, is the business of replacing humans with machines is a huge business. Right? And it creates trillions of dollars. And the business of essentially creating machines that can be like humans is probably the biggest business per se. And it's a huge temptation. And we should resist the temptation to just go ahead and make money and then deal with the damage later that may not be survivable. So I think it, this is the moment to think about how much do we like just growth or how much do we like something larger than growth. So I think, uh, Callum, uh, before we go to uh, Anna, uh, do you really think that this control is possible? And uh, second is, uh, you talked about the difference, uh, I mean, the similarity between human chimpanzee and uh, super intelligence and human. Uh, how much control do we have and what would be the real consequence? And do, we, do you really think it, it's, it's going to be sort of possible to stop it and touch upon transhumanism as you said yesterday? Short answer, no. I don't think we can control superintelligence. I don't think we can create it in a way that it's aligned before it becomes superintelligence and then remains aligned with our values and interests forever afterwards. I, I don't think that's possible. And I don't think we can control it after it exists. How can you control an entity which is a million times smarter than you? I just think it's impossible. Now, there are very smart people. Uh, there's about uh, 300 very smart people in four existential risks or risk organizations around the world working on exactly that problem. And most of them are a lot smarter than me. And I wish them Godspeed, and maybe they will come up with a solution. But to me, it just looks impossible. It's like an ant trying to control a human being. I just don't think it's possible. So, um, sadly not. And then you asked about transhumanism. Shall I? Yeah. Yep, okay. So, the area where Gert and I most like to disagree friendlily with each other is over transhumanism. Transhumanism is the idea that humans should be allowed to augment ourselves cognitive and cognitively and physically as far as the technology will go. So. Um, if, uh, if we can make ourselves immune from aging and immune from death, because we're immune from aging, that would be a good thing. Death is a bad thing, so stopping death would be a good thing. Um, stopping having diseases, making ourselves stronger, smarter, wiser, able to jump over tall buildings, I think all this is a good thing, and that, that's why I'm a transhumanist. Gert thinks that there's a certain distance you can go down that road and then we have to stop because we cease to be human at that point. And the nub of it is, I think, this. I, and this might be a bit unpopular, I don't think being human is the most important thing about us. I think the most important thing about us is our minds, our consciousness, and if we port our minds, our consciousness, into machines, for me, that's absolutely fine. I don't think I would be human. If I did that, I'd be a post-human. I, I would actually prefer that, because to live for thousands and thousands of years in a state of constant bliss with opportunities that I can hardly even imagine now, that sounds great to me. Now, uh, these uh, sound quite uh, uh, bewildering, intimidating, uh, to say the least. And uh, we, with 1.4 billion population now, I think April 14th, we're going to be, April 13th, we're going to be the largest population, uh, populated country in the world forever in the future that we can think of because China is going to drop after that. And if you know, India is going to be that, 
Uh, India also prides itself on right now being the fifth largest economy and by 2030 we are expecting to be the third largest economy. Uh, and, and obviously as we catch up on uh, our average uh, per capita GDP, we're going to be you know, going to the 10 and 15 trillion uh, size, which means we are going to be the top three players in the world, which gives us uh, negotiating uh, ability and which also gives us a responsibility that we should be, play, be a player in this. Now, what is the Indian government in, the, in, you know, in this space? Where is it the Indian government with reference to, you know, supporting research, et cetera, on AI, one. Second is taking uh, a cue from what Gerd said, and if we were to sort of, you know, mobilize humanity to come up with a, you know, a cooperative uh, act like the nuclear uh, moratorium and referendum, et cetera, that we had, isn't it a very, very important opportunity that India has right now to be able to sort of be that leader and probably sort of look at other countries, which are obviously smaller than India from a, a collective bargaining point of view, and become the leader to uh, you know, start putting these limits out there? Uh, just a brief comment, and then I think we should go on, yeah? So the key question, in my view, is not, uh, when we look at the future, not about what is possible. The answer of that is pretty much anything is possible. Right? Can you upload your brain to the internet? You can kind of do that today if you have, but in 10 years, probably. Right? The question is not what we can do, but we, what we want. Who do we want to be? Right? And this is the key question for India, in my view. Uh, the question is, what does India want to be as a country, as a people, as a, what is the nature of what you want rather than saying this is what America or China wants, right? Uh, and the question isn't just one of wanting revenues and growth and profit and jobs, and that, that is a trivial question, right? The question is ultimately of the purpose, the destination, beyond all of those things, right? So that's why I say digital India, and you know, that's all nice and fine, but you can't define a country by a tool. <laughs> you define a country by culture, by people, by the purpose, right? You can't say, well, Germany is, you know, Mercedes-Benz or you know, great cars or whatever. You know, that's, that's just not the future. If I think to be fit for the future, we have to decide on what we want and what does it mean and what we're going to do as a result of that, right? And that has a lot to do with what we do with technology and how we guide it. And if we do that, then ultimately it means sitting down at the table with Europe, China, US, and Africa sooner or later to hammer out what the rules are that in my view not having rules would be the worst case, like Callum said, we're going to become technology if we don't have rules. And I don't want to be, I don't want my kids to be technology. So Anna, what do you think, I mean, where, where, where is India on this and what are India's, you know, because, you know, you people are right there in, in, from our point of view. Thank you for having me here. Uh, so it's interesting that I'm uh, on this panel with uh, an American and a European. Um, I feel, you know, in this uh, present phase of, as we call it, IR 4.0, cyber physical, uh, first, uh, unlike previous industrial revolutions, in this phase, you need to be collaborative. You may have X number of laws, regulations in your own country, but by its very nature, this technology does not kind of, uh, you know, is bound by the boundaries of a country or a, as we know, first of all. Secondly, AI is not something which just happened last decade or past two decades. It has been there since the 1950s. What has made it really bring it in vogue is the compute infrastructure advancements and the data. So on one side, you have uh, the American model, which is uh, big tech uh, uh, as the leaders. And through various means and uh, how they evolved over time, they have become leaders. On the other side, you have the GDPR kind of a European setup, a lot of uh, you know, rights to the principles and things like that. Uh, in that space, I think India with its own governance model in tech space, that is in the current phase of tech space, 
for the first time, I think uh, India is really kind of um, charting its own uh, path. Um, it's very interesting to hear the examples given by the other two speakers of, of driverless cars, of apps, of social media. But when we speak about AI, and as the national strategy on AI, which Niti Aayog had released in 2018, for us, AI is what it can do to our healthcare, what it can do to our education, what it can do to our agriculture. And when we say what it can do to urbanization and transportation, it is not about driverless cars, it's about managing resources better. So with that, um, India has kind of proposed this new governance model of public digital infrastructure, which is also part of the eight priorities listed by India in its G20 presidency. And here we have uh, a really kind of, you know, allowed a thousand flowers to bloom kind of a thing. We have an architecture of consent-based data sharing. We have uh, uh, demonstrated how uh, we can make sense out of aggregation of data, of standardizing data, sharing data, whether it is uh, logistics sector, health sector, education, or agriculture, where these are still evolving. In payments, we are now exporting it. We are going to other countries. So I think when we uh, talk about AI in India, obviously, uh, future of works is uh, not something which uh, we have you know, uh, have a position paper, but in other areas we have a position paper. And uh, for India, it is what, how AI can help us achieve our reform agenda, uh, promote inclusive growth, which is a stated policy objective of the government, and what government can do in leading R&D in those sectors where the bottom line approach will not determine the development of the technology. So that is the approach which the government has taken. And in that regard, uh, you know, uh, uh, various ministries, states, we have federal setup. So it's not very centralized. States are doing their program. Ministries are doing their pro programs. AI is very, very immersive. So it's not just single, you know, domain is very important in AI. So R&D is one, the core, the uh, foundational uh, development, the other is applied. So the applied part is something where a lot of focus is being given, and that is where Niti Aayog is also now trying to institutionalize a lot of stuff, in addition to responsible use of AI, where we have come out with three seminal papers and uh, really addressing it uh, uh, head on and giving some frameworks and suggestions. And now we are taking that uh, dialogue forward in collaboration with um, UN agencies, with other countries, in global partnership, with the DEPA, which is there, India is a founding member. So um, I feel a couple of things, if I may just end this, is one collaboration, second, uh, don't lose uh, sight of what you need to achieve. Technology is there, but technology needs to be seen as an enabler. And in all this space, whether, you know, some, some trains just leave the station, you just have to uh, kind of adjust to it. So general generative AI, it will happen in due course. Many developments have happened in the past. When computers came, at that time also it was said that, you know, a lot of there would be a sea change and jobs will be lost. We did uh, adjust to it. I think it's all about this adjusting to these uh, new developments and that is a, a iterative process and that is what we are trying to do. Thanks, Anna. Anna, you also wanted to ask a few specific questions to the panelists and to me. So if you want to sort of, uh, I would invite no, you. No, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Thank you. Can, can I make a comment? Yeah. A, a quick comment, I, I understand. Uh, the agenda. I think what is happening, however, is that India has entered the exponential era. Okay, so we are going not one, two, three, four, five. We're going four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. We're leaping in technological application, and leaping means today we're at four, and fourteen months we're at eight. So, so my kids in ten years will be at two hundred fifty-six. 
another 10 years, 1 million, right? And, and this is what's happening. So we can't sit here and say we're going to take this linear approach. Right? We're, we're in leap age. ChatGPT is one step in those leaps, right? And here we are, and we, we're basically witnessing the explosion of possibilities. And we need to adjust our thinking on, to the exponential scale here and say, you know, if you're interested what your kids, what kind of world your kids will have, we're not talking about 50 years here. We're talking about 20 years. <laughs> uh, and so there is lots of really great potential here. As I said earlier in my speech, we have the tools, we have the science, we have the tech, we even have the money, but do we have the wisdom? <laughs> and, and that's what government is, is supposed to do, right? To have the wisdom to orchestrate this. It's a tough challenge, but this is really, in a big country, probably even more of a challenge than, say, in Switzerland, you know, where we have an election on stuff every three months, you know, to, to vote for particular stuff, right? But in a big country, and also I think India's potential here is clearly to take a leadership not in the tech, but in the response to the tech, right? That is, I think, the opportunity that shapes up. I think uh, if we have questions from the audience uh, with any of us, we'll be happy to take. We've, we've horrified everybody into silence. Shall I make a, a comment while we're waiting for a question to arise? Um, I'm rather appalled to find that Gert and I agree about something, uh, which is the fact that we're on this exponential growth pattern and very few people are really paying attention to it. Uh, but I think that is the point where all this starts from. I don't think we're going to get to a point where we can all agree what should be done and what shouldn't be done. I mean, there's eight billion of us. We have so many different opinions. Why should we think we're all going to come to a democratic agreement globally? Um, for instance, that it should be possible to live for 100 years, but it shouldn't be possible to live for 200 years, or it should be possible for 200, but not for 300. I think we're going to have to accept that different people will want different outcomes, and we should try and be a bit tolerant of that. When it comes to transhumanism, for instance, if Gert wants to remain human, and doesn't want to have a, a lifespan multiplied by hundreds, and doesn't want to lose, lose the ability to create new humans in the traditional way, which is the definition of human. If he wants to stay human like that, I have no problem with him doing that. I would have a problem with him saying that I can't have a much longer lifespan and live in, say, a virtual world and become post-human. I don't think I should be stopped from doing that. So I think we need not to find a global agreement about what, sh what, what technology should be used and what technology shouldn't be used, I think we're going to need to be a lot more tolerant of different outcomes, different choices. Okay, I can respond to that briefly only. Um, I think when we talk about this, what I call the good future, right? the idea of what good is, right? this very basic stuff, work, jobs, having kids, you know, being able to self-realized and not die, you know, the basic stuff, right? Um, we need to define that as the sort of bottom line of what we want together. Uh, and then there's lots of optional things, like, you know, extending your life if you have lots of money and things like that, you know? Uh, and, and some people will always do things that aren't legal and do it anyway, right? But I think it's important that we get on the same page for energy, climate, machine thinking, technology, and human engineering, because these are very, very powerful things that will change everything. So we can't just, like, you know, the American way of doing this is to say the market will do it, right? And look where we ended up, okay? The Chinese way of doing that is the state will do it, right? And look where we ended up. So we, Europe has a different approach, which I like, you know, which is more of a people approach. Yes, it's cumbersome and all of these things, but that's kind of democ democratic, like a little bit like India. So finding a consensus will not be easy, but we have to only find it on the bottom level. And I tend to, to say that we will probably agree on a lot of bottom levels if they are wide enough. 
I mean, this is what you do in a democracy, right? You don't define every single piece of, you know, whatever you can be or want to be. Uh, you know, you define the bottom line. And I would say that if we're going to be at a place to where we say that we have to become one with the machine so that we keep existing, uh, that is not a bottom line that most people will agree on. Uh, I don't have that feeling about India and, or about Europe. Uh, so that's just what I think is implausible. And also, I have a lot more belief in humanity that we can actually get together and figure this out. You know, history has proven, in fact, when the pressure is big enough, we take action. Right? And that pressure is building like crazy. I, I was saying about what you said earlier, right? In the next couple of years, there's going to be a huge pressure cooker on these topics here and everywhere else also. And we have to get to a place to where we can openly discuss possibilities. And we're going to need a moratorium on how exactly we will have intelligent machines as a prosperous thing and how we will not have them, yeah? just like nuclear power. I just hope that uh, we get to a point where the pressure is not uh, you know, lethal, but good you know, enough to sort of make us all take the action. And uh, I think with that, uh, if there is a question coming up. Oh, there are questions. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chase, good evening. Uh, uh, further on to the conversation which you were having. So, uh, we totally understand that uh, responsible AI is what we have to be looking at because uh, it is what is happening is inevitable. It has to happen. So, the way we have got ISO standards for everything, right? I'm in the military. We follow MIL standards. And why we follow that is so that there is standardization. We understand each other well and there are no surprises. So, I would like to hear your comments on what do you feel of some kind of standards, maybe ISO standards for artificial intelligence? Well, in terms of bringing products to the market, then standards will be necessary so that products are interoperable. I mean, a great example is the metaverse. If and when we get it, it's been um, touted for a long time and it, w it was supposed to come in 2020, sorry, 2016 and then it was supposed to come last year and It'll probably be supposed to come again in five years' time. Eventually, it will arrive. And it would be a much better world if people can take their avatars from one, from, say, Facebook's metaverse into Microsoft and then into Google's. That would be a better world if it's like the Internet rather than like the smartphone world where there's only two ecosystems and you're pretty much locked in, or even worse, a monopolistic uh, ecosystem where you only have one that you can live in. So th those standards in those sorts of areas are important. But with AI, it will transcend standards in many ways because it's intelligent. You know, our intelligence is the thing that makes us the most powerful animal on the, on the planet. And it's very hard to reduce it to standards uh, right across the piece. I can take two questions. Yeah. Uh, can I make a quick comment on, this, on the standards? Uh, yeah, since we are talking about AI, and uh, AI is a kind of, you know, thinking machine, and so basically it has a thought process. So we have to see what kind of ideology it follows, and that's why uh, we, everyone has a say in it, and also we have to see who is controlling that AI. Right now you just told that there are duopoly, and a few players in the market, who are generating these AIs. So basically, they are the uh, brains or the thought process behind those AIs. And to have it a kind of you know democratic AI, obviously, India should also be on the table and should start thinking what kind of ideology it can feed to the AI. Thank you. Thanks. And maybe God can answer that. Well, to that. There, there's no such thing as a thinking, thinking machine, right? This is IBM marketing idea. Uh, it, it's a good idea, actually. But, but there's no such thing as a thinking machine. Because when you think about how we think, right, we don't agree on a lot of definitions how, how all that works, but machines think in their own way. So we shouldn't use the word thinking, right? Like machines are intelligent, smart, whatever they are, but they're not like us, right? And, and it's important to realize the difference, right? The, these are not thinking machines like we think of thinking, right? They have their own way, they're binary, right? Zeros and ones. 
Right? It's very important to realize the difference. That's why they're so powerful, and that's also why they're good for us. In an ideal world, we could use them to do the heavy lifting, and then we do the thinking. Right? Uh, one more thing on what was said earlier on the standards. I have proposed uh, many times also to the European Commission to put together a system that shows how human your content is. So now that we have the possibility to create content that's not human, I think we should have a little meter that says, you know, 10% human, 50% human, 80% was made by humans, uh, you know, so that we know what is what. So when I'm reading your article, it's 100% human, I'd be happy to pay more, right? So that we would know, it's like we have today with meat, you know, organic meat, and whatever you have, certification. So made by humans, I think that would be a good standard to have. It might be a good thing, but I don't think you'll find many people will pay more for the human. If, if, if you have two, two articles, one written by a robot, one written one by a question. human. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a question. Which sector yeah, is going to impact the most and how Web 3.0 is going to help it? And my second question is, Sam Baldwin, as we all know, is the CEO of OpenAI, which is ChatGPT company. He's building a doomsday bunker. What are your thoughts on that? So, so the two-part question is? <laughs> AI will affect every single sector. As Anna said, healthcare and uh, education are two of the most important sectors for it to be encouraged in, but it, and it will affect those enormously, but it will affect absolutely every sector of the economy, every aspect of life. It's going to be universal. Um, I don't know whether it's true that Sam Altman has got a bunker in, San Fis in, the, in, 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 in California. So, well, he, 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 I think in the past he has said he's got a place in New Zealand, or maybe that was, um, that maybe that was the guy in Salesforce. But in this last in, in this last interview, he did talk about having one in California. I, th I think he thinks that's a bit of a joke because I think he absolutely knows that if we get a rogue superintelligence which really decides to wipe us out, we're going to last about five minutes, and it doesn't matter where you are, you know, <laughs> we're, we're gone. Um, I think he's pretty optimistic that's not going to happen, and let's hope he's right. You know, on the sector thing, quick answer. The key sector to me is healthcare. Healthcare has been so devoid of using data, and healthcare is really sick care. Right? <laughs> so we, people get sick, we give them pills and injections, and off you go, right? Uh, that's not good. Healthcare is going to be completely redone with technology, analytics, smart technology. We're going to analyze everything. We're going to understand everything. We may get away from the pills. We change our lifestyle. It's a 10-year process. If you're a healthcare company, you're becoming a tech company. That's basically what it is. I think that's about it. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, madam. Uh, you've been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, MK, for that uh, lovely discussion. All right, let's move on now to our uh, next session. Ladies and gentlemen, in an emerging economy like India, increased penetration of smartphones has transformed behavioral patterns of businesses and consumers. And such that, you know, WhatsApp as a platform has evolved into a tool that is empowering many small businesses. In fact, its conversational approach to business is enabling business owners to improve customer engagement and facilitate greater conversations. Now, WhatsApp, in partnership with Times Network, has announced Let's Talk Growth. It's a new campaign that focuses on conversations that matter and provides a platform to discuss how businesses can utilize messaging to complement their existing strategy and drive engagement as well as, most importantly, as well as customer satisfaction. But before we commence with the next session, here's a quick look at what the Let's Talk Growth campaign encompasses. Let's take a look.
today, right? In that for all of us, our digital journey starts by getting a smartphone. And the first thing that any one of us do does is download WhatsApp, right? It's actually as simple as just saying hi on your WhatsApp first. What I want you to talk about is to how WhatsApp is not just an app, but you know, which is used to communicate with your friends and family, but it goes away beyond that. And I want to focus on WhatsApp business, for instance, you know, which you head. Uh, what is WhatsApp business? Thanks, Aisha. Firstly, thanks for having me here. And you're right, right? WhatsApp probably is part of every Indian's life today. Everybody who has a smartphone is on WhatsApp. The first and, app that you download. And yeah. people start the day. I, 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 I with pride say that most people's morning starts with WhatsApp yeah. and their evening ends with WhatsApp before yeah. they go to sleep. So that's, that's how WhatsApp is part of our life. Uh, as, as we were engaging with, and, and we all know that for the last 10 years or more, WhatsApp was never available for business. Mm -hmm. It remained a personal platform for people to engage with people. We never opened it up for business. But when we were talking to users across the length and breadth of the country and globally, we realized that we can help people do way more on WhatsApp than what they're able to do today. In India, we talk of digital, and we've been talking about it for many years now. But the reality is that it's still not reached the length and breadth of the country. Very few people in India are able to use technology like websites or mobile apps. They still take fear. Those people are on WhatsApp. WhatsApp has really touched them. And we saw an opportunity here that, hey, the way we have brought people closer to people, can we bring people closer to business? The way you send a hi to a friend, can you send a hi to a business and get your job done? Whether you want to buy something, whether you want to raise a complaint, maybe you want to book a doctor's appointment, maybe you want to talk to a teacher in the school. Can we get those simple problems in everybody's life solved through just a simple hi on WhatsApp? And that's where this whole concept of WhatsApp business emerged. And we have been on a journey over the last four years, and we have been evolving the platform to ensure that we can really impact people's life and help them do business and get things done with businesses. So that's WhatsApp business for us. You know, up until now, Ravi, I guess WhatsApp business is restricted to the bank that you bank with or the e-commerce websites that you shop on, right? They are the ones who have your data and they are the ones who are WhatsApping you about their maybe latest sale or, you know, whatever schemes they have going or news alerts sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but can it really get as simple? You know, Callum was just talking about as to how AI is going to be most disruptive when it comes to healthcare. Can you literally inter interact and monitor healthcare? And by healthcare, I don't mean only ill care, like he was talking about, uh, with just a WhatsApp. It, it seems kind of, you know, unconceiv unconceivable at this stage. No, no absolutely. I, 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 and and this, is, this is not a concept, this is real. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what you're saying and many other things are actually real. I'll give an example since you touched upon healthcare. We are in touch with one of the largest healthcare chains in the country, mm -hmm. one of the very large chains. They have launched a diabetes patient care WhatsApp bot uh, where every patient, and diabetes is something which is very sensitive, right? You need to have medication on time, otherwise uh, it, it can be fatal. And we are the diabetes, uh, you know, population of India, the ma I mean, maximum population and, and you in can, the world. You can yeah. really equate diabetes, health, heart, heart patients, everything, right? And this hospital launched, launched a service. Earlier it used to be a manual effort where people used to call a nurse and nurse used to guide them if some vitals were not on track or nurse used to collect on phone the vitals and give assurance to the patient that it's fine. Not every time the patient needs to come to the, to the hospital. They've created a bot wherein every day morning, the patient just needs to send his basic vitals, what's your blood pressure and any other matrix, and immediately the bot responds if they need to change anything or they just need to take the medicine. The bot correctly sends them the reminder on the medicine. Now imagine this where in, in bigger cities where we have good hospitals, we know that, that healthcare is accessible. But with WhatsApp, it's every part of India which can do it. So that's how we can transform healthcare. I'll give you one more example, and, and, uh, uh, and this is this is healthcare is uh, is definitely something very credible. That even even simple life of people's day, right? Uh, uh, while ma many people here have cars, but we know that a large part of India uses public transport, mm. uh, and and we all have seen the queues on the stations and and those long queues in heat, people standing. We have heard stories where people have fainted in summers. We have created a bot for Bangalore Metro where you don't need to stand in any queue. While you're on your way to the station, you just send the station name where you're boarding from and the station name that you want to get down on, and you will get a ticket on WhatsApp. You just click WhatsApp Pay. You pay the money. You don't need to stand in the queue. You just board the train. 
Imagine we can eliminate all the queues in every transit system in the country. Now, that's real impact, and that's what we're unlocking for WhatsApp for businesses like that. But tell me, how far is WhatsApp's journey in connecting businesses? WhatsApp has already connected the world. It definitely has connected India and only brought people closer and just so simpler, right? Yes. But how far are you from achieving that dream of connecting India uh, to businesses via WhatsApp? It, it's been a journey, and I, I would definitely say we are not there yet, mm. but we have really evolved immensely. A few years back, we about started the journey three to four years back. It was still a simple messaging layer where we were business was able to send a message to the users and we realized it's not enough. So we evolved the platform. I, I, I think we showed somewhere during this uh, session today uh, how people can buy goods on WhatsApp. There's this whole experience where you can almost replicate the whole shopping experience in WhatsApp. Uh, we have features and we are working with all the banks where you can almost replicate the complete banking app on WhatsApp. Uh, we have, I gave you example, Bangalore Metro. I, we have many examples where uh, small businesses are using WhatsApp. So we are in a journey where while we are enhancing features, we are also learning and adding, adding features to WhatsApp. Uh, I'll give you one example, part of this experience we are learning, right? Uh, when we, we started the journey, it was purely a text message and people used to type and people used to engage. This was four years back. A large part of India, honestly, doesn't type. They just speak. Yeah. Most of the India uses WhatsApp for voice bots. They don't talk, and specifically when you go to rural markets, they don't even know English. Yeah. So talking English, typing English is just not possible. Now we have worked with some of our partners where you actually can engage with the business on WhatsApp with voice. You just record your message, it goes to the business, they hear your message, translate uh, with the uh, machine learning tools, they translate it into text, read out the information, send you a voice message back. And, and a person who doesn't know typing, who doesn't know English, can engage. So it's a journey, we are in that journey, I think, I think uh, we have evolved a lot, but it's probably a few years from today where we probably see WhatsApp in everybody's life, in every business's life. Yeah. yeah, and you know, you talked about voice notes, and you talked about as to how Bharat yes. does not know how to type, but they definitely can speak and record yeah. a voice note on your WhatsApp and send it across. What I wanted to understand is when it comes to small businesses, this can really be a game changer and play a very, very critical role in connecting remote and rural India to the main cities. Are you already seeing that transition building up or happening? Uh, absolutely. I, I think, uh, and, and I, I, I'm sure everybody in the room will agree, if India has to become a fighter in an economy and more, it's the small businesses which have to come online and start becoming and bigger and bigger. I think while a lot on digital has happened, I think small businesses have somewhere got left behind for two reasons. One, they don't understand tech. Second is, it was expensive. It is expensive to build an app like every large business. I think that's where WhatsApp is really making a big difference to them. And I, I, I'll just maybe remind people in this room, most of us have forgotten two years back when COVID hit and everything was shut, the only thing which saved a lot of small businesses was, was WhatsApp. Uh, I can share example of my condo. I'm sure it's the same experience all of you had. That like we, we are a, a apartment block of 500 families and we have a small shop uh, in the in the complex which was only allowed because vegetables, milks was allowed. That guy used to send a message on WhatsApp, the days uh, produce, and people used to order on WhatsApp. Now, that's what WhatsApp has done to small businesses. What Where we are going is really giving them a much richer experience. You know we have a small business app on the App Store or Play Store, which is free, people can download. Uh, it's similar to WhatsApp, but the difference there is we have enabled a lot of features for small businesses. People can really click photos in the shop and create a catalog. It's not just about typing names, it's just about creating a catalog. We are enabling payments on the shop, so he doesn't need to even wait to collect payments. We have now created a tool where it's not just about reaching my condo when the neighbor is there, he can actually reach across India, and he can run ads on Facebook and Instagram and get a message on his app and really translate that into a business there. I, I'll give you one example and then uh, you'll understand what it has done. There is this whole artisan in Rajasthan, a small city called Nagaur. Mm. He makes Katputli. I, I'm sure people who have been to Rajasthan understand Katputli. Uh, and his whole business was tourists traveling to Rajasthan. When COVID hit, he was shut. He realized the power of small business. He created Katputlis and he started marketing on WhatsApp. And now, after three years, his business is across the country, not just Rajasthan.
So that's what we can do with WhatsApp, and we are very committed to making small businesses on WhatsApp uh, as the biggest opportunity for them. That's awesome. But tell me, uh, how commercially viable is it for small businesses? You said it's a free app, right? It's a free today, so we don't charge anything to small mm. businesses. And we intend to keep it free for a large part of it. We will come out with some enhanced features where if they want to grow and do something more, then maybe there may be small charge. But I, I can, at this stage, say it will definitely be far more valuable for him than really investing into an app and trying to market an app and getting an app downloaded. WhatsApp is an app on every phone. You don't need to invest in creating an app. Just use it to market your product. Absolutely. Um, also, the other thing is how easy is it, and, and let's specifically talk about WhatsApp for small businesses, to build that database. Does it work on existing database? How do I get more clients and consumers? So, so two things, right? Uh, uh, and and I, like you said, I, small businesses are still a step behind, so they don't have the database. And yeah. as we are engaging with small businesses, we are really uh, working with them to ensure that they're able to capture data. We are, we are making it in the tools where any user who comes to their store or they engage, they're able to punch in the phone number in the system and that gets captured at the back end and they can now engage with them. Even on the building blocks, I just want to say, we are making it so simple, we are almost making like a Lego block setup. So a small business doesn't need to understand tech to make it up. He can just punch in a few things and get it done. And, and for growth, where we are coming is, and we are working with a lot of uh, organizations there, we are going to make it very simple that from that same app, or small business app, he'll be able to actually advertise on our platforms like Facebook and Instagram to the cohort and targets that he wants to target and get those messages there. So that small business app is going to be his digital life. Mm -hmm. He can ex engage with existing users, he can acquire new users, he can service customers on the platform in a single small app, and the app which he's most familiar with. So that's our journey on small business app. And after WhatsApp, Facebook and Instagram is what all of India uses anyway. That, which way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the other thing I also wanted to understand is, much like small businesses, which are more product related, how does WhatsApp business connect large businesses? Yeah. Um, I so, mean, is it really as simple as downloading an app within uh, your Play Store? So for large businesses, I think the journey is slightly different because they have a lot of other platforms, right? They have their mobile app, they have their websites. So WhatsApp can't be an isolated, separate island in itself. It won't work. For large businesses, WhatsApp is probably a bridge to their current digital platforms. Uh, and, and we have a platform called WhatsApp Business Platform where we have enabled APIs, which will plug into the large businesses' technical backend infrastructure whether it's their CRM engine, their marketing engines, their analytics engine, these APIs can easily plug in and they can- yeah, Ravi, for the audience to understand this better, let's give an example. Okay. You don't have to name the brand, but- Sure, no, yeah. I, 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 I'll definitely give this example. So I'll give you an example of one of the largest banks in the country. Sure. They invested a lot in building their banking app and every large customer has built, invested in a banking app. And when I met their CEO, their biggest challenge was that, hey, my app is not getting used. Not even 10% of my customers are using my app. My costs are not going down. People still call my call center. People still walk into my branches. I said, but why are you investing in building an app? Just use WhatsApp. We have your users on WhatsApp. And the same experience that you have on your app, we can replicate on WhatsApp. And we have tools where people can re replicate that same experience on WhatsApp. So that same banking experience that they have built on their app, now they have replicated on, their, on WhatsApp. And their users have started engaging on WhatsApp. I'll give you one small more example. I was, I was yesterday with a very mid-sized e-commerce company. I wouldn't say the largest, but decent-sized e-commerce companies. Uh, and they have grown their revenue by 10% just by extending the journey on WhatsApp. It's a very different cohort they've targeted on WhatsApp. WhatsApp is, they wanted to go to Bharat, and their core app was servicing India, and they created a separate category on WhatsApp, and they are now expanding and growing the business on WhatsApp. So that's how large businesses are using it. And it's really as simple as that. I mean, what's simpler than sending a WhatsApp? WhatsApp, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Uh, but the other thing also, Ravi, is, I mean, how do large, or for that matter, small businesses go global via WhatsApp? Because my understanding is that large businesses would be working on a subscribed database, right? Yes. Yes. They're using with already existing consumers and customers. Yeah, no, so, and, and that's something that uh, uh, actually people are doing it. So as, as uh, uh, we all know, we have two billion people on WhatsApp. We are there in almost every country, at least all emerging markets, Latin America, Middle East, Southeast Asia, where, where WhatsApp is uh, as prevalent as, as it's in India. 
Uh, we support the languages, we support all the local languages, so it's not like you, you really need to invest into doing something different. So the same bot or experience you build in India, you can easily extend it to any market that you want with the languages and support. Now the question is, I don't have database, so how do you target them? So that's where the whole uh, family of apps, we call it, which is Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp come together. What people are doing and what businesses sh should do, if you're wanting to get into, let's say, a Middle East or African market, you create small advertisements on Facebook or Instagram in those properties uh, with the targeted audience that you do. People, when, when they click on that app, uh, ad, it will land on your WhatsApp journey. And you can engage in their language. The bot can do all the analytics. People from those countries can place order. You can collect payment and ship the goods. And that's what both small businesses and large businesses are doing with us. So this whole family of apps concept where we're linking the three platforms is really helping people go global and really expand their business in markets which they have not never been before with WhatsApp. And similarly, I'm guessing for startups, it must be a big boon as well, right? Because you don't have yeah. to invest in building an app, uh, invest in designing your own website. All you have to do is WhatsApp. Absolutely. I, I can, without naming some of the, I, I, can, I can share that some of the unicorns that we know today of actually were born on WhatsApp. So some of the unicorns that people are very familiar with today, I can't name them. But actually, we're born on WhatsApp, where they first started engaging in WhatsApp, and they saw the market, and they started building the app, and now they are bigger. I can, I can say one thing, and, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing this happening real today, but I think it will be way bigger. Startups will start their journey on WhatsApp. Today, the biggest, and this is not about startups that we know of, very tech evolved startups, because when you talk of startups today, we are really talking of people who have technical backgrounds and they're creating a good technical product. But when I'm talking of startups, I'm talking of simple people sitting in this room, people, uh, families, women sitting at home, women sitting at uh, remote parts. Everybody has a brilliant idea. Or some of them have really, you see the products, right? They make amazing, amazing achars, they make amazing cakes, but they're not able to leverage benefit of technology because one, they don't understand tech. Second, they don't have money to invest in tech. And if they invest in tech, where is the money to spend on marketing? With WhatsApp, you don't need to invest anything on tech. You just build your product and start marketing. I think we will probably make WhatsApp is the primary surface of, for any startup to come on the platform and grow their business. And we are seeing a lot of, lot of entrepreneurs coming on WhatsApp and building that. Ravi, the other thing, you know, with so much digitization happening, and I was talking to an, a banker as well before you, um, how safe is my data? You know, I'm putting so much out there. They know what I want, what, what I spend on, what I eat, what I shop, what I buy, where I travel, all of it. I mean, I bet at WhatsApp that must be a key priority, right? Data protection. Yeah, yeah. No, and, and we, we, uh, it's not just data, it's also user privacy. Yeah. And we have, been, we have been very, very vocal and very, very upfront about that. Uh, any conversation that happens on WhatsApp today, whether it's person to person or person to business, is 100% encrypted. Uh, WhatsApp, Meta doesn't read that data, doesn't use that data, doesn't share that data. All the conversation, whether you do with a business or you do with an individual, is either between you or that other person, which is the business. So today, when you talk of data, the experience and the data storage and the usage is exactly similar on how you would do with their other platforms, whether it's their uh, app or, or the website. That data is only sit sitting with the business that you are engaging with. Nobody else has access to that. So it's in that sense 100% secured, uh, and and uh, we are ensuring that that whole encryption and privacy is maintained as we are building this platform for businesses as well. I've said this before. I'll say this for us: the user comes first, not the business. We is a, we are a user-first platform, so we'll always keep the user at the center, and we'll ensure that his privacy, his data, his needs come first before we enable for the businesses. So I can give you an assurance that your data is safe when you're engaging with businesses via WhatsApp. Yeah. But Ravi, what are the hindrances? Because as simple as it may be to download WhatsApp and interact uh, with businesses and existing consumers, or for that matter, with family and friends, um, mobile penetration in India is nowhere close to other developed economies like um, US or China, for that matter. Yeah, yeah. Because the sole criteria of WhatsApp to grow business all depends on mobile penetration. Yes. So Aisha, that's true, but I think, I think uh, India has probably one of the lowest data rates and that's leading to the highest, highest mobile penetration in the country. Uh, I think while you're right that mobile penetration in numbers is still not 
I would say if you talk of families, we are nearly there at 70, 80% mobile penetration. So a mobile in the tier two, tier three, tier four towns is a home device, not an individual device as well. So while I, as a, as a bread owner of the home, may have a mobile device, my family, which is my wife, my kids, can use mobile there. And that's where when we are thinking of WhatsApp and this journey, we're not just thinking of the person who has the mobile, we're also thinking of extending it to their families as well. And I'll, I'll give you one example uh, why I say this is real. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll maybe use COVID example, but we were amazed by that. Uh, so when COVID shut, the biggest impact happened on kids and students, right? Schools shut everywhere. Uh, laptop sales went up, smartphone sales went up, but it was only metros. What of the kids in rural villages and all that? And it was just one phone. Sometimes it was teacher phone. Sometimes it was the family phone. We had a we had a partner, uh, uh, Convergenius, uh, who created a mobile solution for education on WhatsApp. What we learned, you know, in villages, it was becoming a community engagement where there was one phone in the village, and every student in the village used to do use that phone to engage with the school, because there was nothing else. So maybe it's a journey where mobile phones will will evolve and penetration will happen, but. I think there is an opportunity for us to really impact those people in real mo uh, rural markets and small towns, even with that limited mobile phone, and we are in that journey. Hopefully, India will go in mobile phones and will bridge that gap which exists today as well. Mm. You know, you com campaign read, let's talk growth. I want to understand what's the rationale and the purpose of this campaign, and what is it that you at WhatsApp Business are hoping to achieve as we're calling it the next decade for India? Absolutely. Uh, so. Uh, I think, I think I, uh, for large businesses, uh, what we have seen is uh, people have been able to penetrate a certain segment. Uh, some biggest of the brands have been able to reach 100 million, 150 million. Uh, many businesses are stuck at about 10, 20 million people as customers that they've been able to acquire. Uh, where they struggle is to get to the next 100 million. That's where we as WhatsApp come into the play. We have those next 100 million and next 200 million people on the platform. And we are saying, hey, we can help you grow and acquire those customers. Use WhatsApp as your extension to your digital strategy. Build your experiences on WhatsApp, and we'll help you reach that next 100 million on WhatsApp. So that's real growth, where all these big businesses are really looking at extending to the next set of users, and WhatsApp can be that bridge. For small businesses, it is almost 0 or 1 to 100 that we are on the journey, where we are saying, hey, come on WhatsApp, and you have unlimited potential to grow. It's not just your neighborhood. We'll expand the whole country for you. We are really making it very real for SMBs. We are going out and teaching small businesses in markets how to use WhatsApp and how to grow the business on the platform. So that's where we are investing in talking growth for all the businesses. Mm. Ravi, one last and final question. You know, here you wake up every morning to headlines of so and so many layoffs. You're talking about the global economy shrinking right now. Does that impact WhatsApp and WhatsApp business as well in any way? I, I think uh, those challenges are real for everyone. I think it's, it's a phase of transition where probably uh, the whole world is going through where there was a phase of massive growth uh, 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 last four years back and now I think there's some slowdown. But I think India will come back. At this time, I think I would say WhatsApp is actually probably fueling growth for smaller businesses where business is slowing down and people can actually live on WhatsApp. We are going out and really keeping the users engaged, the small business engaged to drive growth. India is, is the bright spot in the global economy. I think we will be out of this phase very soon and we'll back to, I'm sure, very close to double digit growth. So WhatsApp probably will be the platform which will drive that growth is how we are seeing. And so we are, we are not seeing slowdown yet, but I'm sure it's impacting people. We'll be probably the platform to come out fastest and the first from this slowdown and help people grow and businesses grow. Okay, on that bullish note, thank you, Ravi. Always a pleasure speaking Thank you very much. You. Thank Thanks you so very much. much. Thank you, Mr. Garg and Aisha for that. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now, as you know already that India has the largest young population in the world that is driving digital media consumption. Now, this has given rise to on-demand digital entertainment services like audio and video streaming. And with the rise of the internet, attention has become the new currency. It's no longer, maybe, is it oil? It's definitely not oil data, or is it truly attention that is the new currency? Now, many leading digital media players have adopted hybrid models to both entice new users and create value for existing ones. 
So, with the new age consumer being a key driver of the golden age of media consumption, how do we entertain the next generation? To answer this pertinent question, we have two juggernauts who call the entertainment industry their home. Please join me in welcoming the very talented actor Manoj Bajpai and the CEO of Applause Entertainment, Samir Nair, in conversation with Sonali Krishna. Thank you, Sumit. It's the Managing Director of Applause, Samir Nair, and of course, the man who needs no introduction, Manoj Bajpai. Thank you so much. Hopefully, we're going to have an entertaining session after, of course, a day long of digital. In fact, AI is coming out of my ears. I'm sure it's coming out of yours, too. Having said that, um, I'm going to start with you. Uh, because of COVID, we've all gotten used to watching and streaming content, right? A lot of actors have gotten opportunities. Aapko kya lagta hai ki iski wajay se have we progressed in terms of content making ya regress ho gaya? Hindi mein bolo ya angrezi mein bolo. Aapki Bhojpuri bhi mein bol sakta hai. Bhojpuri tough ho ga. Bhojpuri tough ho ga. Nahi, digital जो पूरा का पूरा रेवोल्यूशन हुआ है इससे सिर्फ फायदा ही हुआ है घाटा कुछ भी नहीं हुआ है क्योंकि सिनेमा के पास में इतनी कैपेसिटी नहीं थी कि इतने सारे टैलेंट को कंज्यूम कर सके सिनेमा के पास में और जिसके कारण सिनेमा ना सिर्फ टैलेंट को मौका नहीं दे पा रहा था बल्कि जो चार या पांच जो हर डिपार्टमेंट में टैलेंट्स थे उन्हीं पर वो हमेशा जो है इट यूज टू फॉल बैक ऑन बिकॉज वह एक फॉर्मूला सा बन गया था कि इसको ले लो उसको लेके आओ इसको लेके आओ तो फिल्म चल जाएगी दैट यूज टू बी वेरी श्योर शॉर्ट यू नो वेरी ईजी फॉर्मूला दैट पीपल वर फॉलोइंग बैक ऑन वट इट हैज डन दैट दो वन दिन हैपन इन द डिजिटल एरिया सिमिलरली द रेवोल्यूशन हैपन इन आर इंडस्ट्री ऑल्सो सी इन टर्म्स ऑफ कॉन्टेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ टैलेंट I mean, Samir Nair, who is who is one of the most successful, uh, you know, CEO of the company, of entertain uh, management uh, managing director of Applause, and who are you know making I wouldn't even dare to say churning out because they are coming out with such amazing amazing content, amazing stories, and giving chances to so many talents in every department, not only actors. This was not possible. This was not possible before. This can never be possible if you just take it out the digital uh, uh, revolution from this country or from this world. It will never be. I am the happiest person who has seen this industry uh, growing and regressing, growing and regressing in terms of storytelling, in terms of consumption of the talent uh, in every department. I have benefited less. I have lost more in this industry. With the with the digital in, uh, revolution, with the OTT coming into play, it not only it has uh, given me a chance to showcase my own ability, but at the same time, there were many talents, thousands of them, scattered all over Mumbai, living in far away places in in, in a very modest, um, uh, you know, a chawl or modest one room, one room apartment. Today they have a lifestyle. Today, Manoj Bajpayee dates. Is very much possible, but their dates are not possible. So that's the that's that if if that's the uh, outcome of digital revolution in this country. That's the outcome of uh, internet or uh, OTT revolution in this country. And this is where I thank uh, not only my luck that I'm still working in this time, but I really thank God for giving us this time. I like your optimistic. Rose-tinted glasses, but you, as no, you can't survive in, in this industry if you're not optimist. <laughs> <laughs> but as a journalist, I have to play devil's advocate, right? So, so glad that talent is being accepted from all corners. You know, Kangana Ranaut says talks about nepotism. Clearly, your, by your by your view and by what you've just said, nepotism abhi to hai nahi kyunki sab ko lifestyle aa gaya hai. People have moved from chawls to flats to maybe even bungalows in Bombay, but. 
what is the impact huh. the small screen or OTT is having on the big screen? Is the big screen now the step sister or the downtrodden sister and is the silver screen taking main stage? We will only know about it once the audience start going there in numbers. If you give them a fair play, if you give them an equal play right now, uh, you know, random films are doing well. Most of the films, uh, people are not getting out of, the, uh, out of their comfort zone, not because of only OTT, also because of the long pandemic lockdowns. So they, they still have to come to terms with the fact that there is uh, another medium of uh, exhibition out there, uh, which were very much available to them. And they should, I mean, like, so take, take an instance of my new release, Gulmohar. It is a family film, but when it came to uh, releasing it in theater, Producers and all the, the, the channel, OTT channel, every, everyone had a cold feet because uh, it, people are not going to theater. Let's face the fact. Yeah, exactly. Okay, from all the films, they are not. And mostly families are not getting out of their homes together to watch a film. And to our luck, it has done supremely well on OTT. And we are very happy about it. So at the end of the day, the film has made, film has been making money. Uh, it is getting eyeballs. This is, this is all we need. Fair point. I want to talk to you about that. But before that, Samir, my larger question being, you know, this whole democratization of video and the fact that we can watch the big ticket films and, of course, specialized content being delivered to us on several OTT platforms and counting as they launch. Uh, is this cannibalizing the big screen? Is the big screen now technically the small screen? No, I don't think so. We've just been through RRR and Pathan and Pushpa and many things have happened. A lot of movies have done well. Um, as Manoj says, you know, we are coming out of COVID. For two years, uh, all theaters were shut, as were restaurants and airlines and everything. Um, and I think the audiences used that as an opportunity to, you know, adopt digital. They adopted all the streaming platforms. They got used to it. It was huge surge in growth. Uh, they experimented with a lot of new content. Um, they allowed so many new things to happen. They, their taste improved. In a way, the quality of our audience has improved over COVID. That's the one good outcome of COVID. Um, and they've seen a lot of stuff. Now, as it, we return to some degree of normalcy, you're expecting people to come back to theaters, to pay money, to buy tickets. And also, you know, we've got strange things that go on in our industry. Uh, like one is the window system. So every, any average audience knows that this movie is going to be on a platform in eight weeks. Right, you know that. So that is in any case a mental block. You know, like unless there's a compelling reason to go out and buy a ticket, why would you? Uh, so these are just, you know, they're just part of the business. See, the nature of our business is that we live in very complicated times now, right? Audiences have got immense choice. There's a lot of choice across movies, um, series, foreign, Indian, Hindi, regional. It's all available. That's what the streaming revolution has done. It's made this world truly into a global village, right? Where everything is available everywhere. Next to Family Man, you can get Money Heist. Right there, it was never possible before. You had to watch Star World and Star Plus. They were two separate things. Now everything is available. And now next to that comes Meenal Burli. That comes right there again. So this thing has really created a brand new audience, uh, which is really exciting. The movie business will need to find its feet. People always say that, you know, if you have to go to a theater, it has to be a blockbuster. But I don't think any industry can make 52 blockbusters in a year. You know, it's not physically possible. So I think water will find its level. Um, and uh, I don't think the big screen has become the small screen or anything of the kind. Uh, Size-wise, it's anywhere bigger. So, you know, and a lot of the streaming platforms are on mobile phones. So that's quite small. But I think what is happening is that we are, there's a whole new breed of actors that have come up. There's a whole new breed of talent that's got a chance to shine. You know, as you say, that it used to be like, I've always compared the movie business to be like the national cricket team. 11 people make it, everyone else is stuck. And TV, Sasbo, Soaps, and all that we do is like Ranjit. So actually, OTT and streaming is the IPL, you know, where everyone gets a chance to perform. You come, you have a great season, you hit the ball out of the park, you do all of that stuff, right? And different people, you compete, you play, you work with the best. So I think, I think this is a good time. You have to be optimistic. And of course, you know, revenue and money and viewership, all of that is complicated, but that's the nature exactly. of the business. Yeah. So, you know, 
he's not saying that, but I mean, let's just look at the results, right? If you look at any category, you look at bars, you look at restaurants, you look at travel, after COVID, everybody wanted to get out and travel, everybody wants to go and party, restaurants are full, a reservation is tough, whether you talk about Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore, or, or even tier one cities, everybody is out. So movies may, especially Bollywood, South, South of course is rocking, but I'm saying, look at Bollywood. Why are people watching, not reluctant to go to the big cinemas? Why are people, why, and why are OTT platforms still wanting to acquire for so much money an RRR, a Pathan? So, wo bhi OTT pe hai. Big screen pe to koi jaane ra hai. Okay, one pe, Pathan has done well, thank God. Huh? Yeah, Brahmastra, okay, fine. But, you know, apart from that, there are so many have come and gone. But, and all the OTT platforms are also eyeing eyeballs and also acquiring these films at humongous amounts of money to acquire subscribers. So, what is model? Kya hai? Model to what is the model? You can tell me what And who is making money? Look, when you have a lot of money, you can't get a lot of money. डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन का पूरा अगर आप डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन और एग्जीबिशन का पूरा सिस्टम आप समझेंगे तो आपको पता चलेगा कि ये उनके लिए पॉसिबल था कि लोग बाहर निकल के फिल्मों तक जा पाएं बिकॉज़ उन्होंने मल्टीप्लेक्सेस को कभी आने नहीं दिया और सारे सिंगल थिएटर को उन्होंने प्रिजर्व करके रखा उन्होंने उसके लिए लड़ाई की हमेशा लड़ाई की आई थिंक आई एम राइट ओके एंड देयर होल बिकॉज दे वर दे न्यू दैट वन डे यू नो the the whole system which is coming into will will be our uh, weaknesses so somewhere they saved it they protected it and this is this is where they have scored okay now uh, coming back to you call bollywood i call hindi film industry hindi film industry Haan. my bad i don't know kisne banaya hai par to usko samne leke aayi hai to hindi film industry ke saath jo ho raha hai wo and it has been affected quite a lot, impacted uh, a lot by, uh, by the COVID. They are very much uh, happier. All the contents, all the stories, all the, all the films are available right in their living room. They don't want to get out. Yeah. Getting out means going to a multiplex. That, that, that also means spending uh, X amount of money, which they are not agreeing to yeah. at this point of time. So it all boils down to economics in the end. Uh, so the, I think, I think I'm right. Okay, so, so. Is he right? Yeah, it is. I mean, see, finally, you know, like the media business or like any business is that it's linked to revenue, right? So you have a cost of content, you have a cost of distribution, and then you've got to attract audiences and make some money. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward, actually. Uh, money you can make through subscription or advertising. Both ways you require audiences to be involved, engaged, and be sticky in order to make that money. Um, there's a lot of competition, there's lots of options available. There's a price war in India. Everyone talks about India as this, you know, the great market of a billion people. Now, actually it's 100 million people who can actually afford all these services. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the market cannot afford these services. So you can keep growing exponentially, but the market need not, that's why when you say multiplexes, as you're saying, a trip to the, mul a visit to the multiplex as a family is 2,000 rupees. Yeah, yeah. That's a lot of money, you know? It's not a, so it's complicated. Uh, in the meantime, it is a big market. There are audiences out there. You know, you cannot have such a large population and not keep them distracted and engaged. You know, and that's what we do best, right? Our business is the business of mass distraction. You know, that's what we do. So, you know, and we are doing that very well in different ways. And of course, the economics of this is it costs money to make content. The cost of that keeps rising. Um, you're trying to grow the market. There is a land grab. Right, because different competitors are fighting for the same share of market, yeah. and um, you know you can call it uh, destructive creation. Savir, it's definitely advantage consumer, right? Definitely advantage me, right? But I have to bring up on this particular topic of content glut. Itna sara content hai, itna sara content hai. Discovery is very tough. All there's good and there is bad content, right? I'm not sure uh, whether the this, this availability of, of, you know, the fact that we have so many OTT platforms, of course, some, of course, subscription-based, uh, some advertising-based. Uh, 
who are they catering to or is it just like uh, it's a commonly used word spray and pray uh, you know what what are we catering to when you were doing star you were clear about your demographic you were clear about the sas uh, SaaS Bahu serials catering to a certain PG of India and your advertisers were also eyeing them. It was clear. When we come to the OTT business, yes, advantage talent for sure, but uh, what type of films are we catering to and which audience? Are we catering to India and Bharat? Don't know. Or are we uh, being a little, are we clear about that? Because only then can we be clear about the economic model. I think we are clear completely clear about uh, with each and every project that we get into. I mean, each and every one who is, uh, who, whoever is in power or position in that project, they are very clear with their, with their statistics, with their survey, with their target, target audience, they are very, very clear. They are more clear who than any. Yeah, Manoj, on OTT, clear? I'm talking who about. Who is clear? Is it the producer? Like, okay, Samir is, Nair is, may is, be clear. Is the, is, Manoj Bajpai may be clear. Samir Nair is much more clear, but you look at the look at the success <laughs> ratio of his. So he is he is far more clear than many people, <laughs> and in terms of choosing the choosing the right project. Uh, so no, kind of coming is back Netflix, to Netflix, Hotstar, Prime, everyone, MX everyone, clear, are they clear? Everyone is clear. Everyone is clear. This is, and. Uh, you know, we may agree with certain projects or we may disagree, but largely uh, they are doing just well in, in, in deciding about the target audience with each project. Uh, I'm, I'll give an instance of, as I said, you know, with uh, Gulmohar itself, uh, we could not think of going to theater. We exact, they exactly knew that the families are there at home. They are not getting out together to watch anything. So this is a family film, and we are taking it to them, to their living room. No, we are not asking them to get out of the comfort zone, come to the theater, buy tickets, buy popcorn, and watch our film. We could not take the risk. And eventually, a uh, few of us didn't agree with them, but eventually they, they were right. You know, it, so, so we have to, we have, we are, there, is a, there, there has to be a, uh, a balance of passion and realism. You know, if it is there, then then definitely you are you are going to hit the target uh, most of the time. Um, at the same time, uh, I'm just forgetting there was a point. So at the same time, uh, we have to be very careful. Like me as an actor, Samir, when I'm choosing up, uh, there are five five films right in front of me. Now I have, and all five films are very good. Now I have to choose the right one. So that's, and the right one is is deciding, uh, that decision is very crucial. So but how are you deciding? So are, you, are you deciding because, you know, because you have to decide whether you want to do good content or you want to do mass content. So how do you decide? Karte? No, I always went by good content. Mass content is not going to be able to take mass content. That is why, you know, OTT has been quite a boon for me and I'm, uh, and I'm quite candid about it. Uh, so uh, the clutter breaker, you know, the clutter breaking uh, content is something which is, uh, which you have to look for. You may go wrong sometime, you may go right sometime, but when you go right, uh, that is, that is when you, you feel uh, that, you know, in, in real sense you are successful. Uh, before Family Man, there were many offers in front of me where, uh, and I was in USA, uh, some, I, I watched Narcos there, I watched many other series in the USA, and I realized that, you know, this is, this is what we cannot touch. But this is in abundance on OTT, that genre, that uh, kind of storytelling. We, here, if I have to make an entry into OTT, I have to go with something very new and unique. I don't, I didn't know what was that new and unique, unless it comes to me, and it came to me, I was, I was, somewhere lucky and intelligent enough to really understand that this is exactly I want to do it. This is, this is clutter breaking, okay? And we got lucky with it, with family man. So this is the, that kind of a mind we have to apply when, uh, when we are take, taking up any project as an actor or as a, as a manage, ma managing director of a of, of company like Applause or as a director or anyone. Uh, Samir, what does it mean to entertain the next generation. You have entertained, uh, you know, Bharat, you've entertained, uh, you know, mass market, 
now you're entertaining, uh, you know, nuanced audiences. So what does it mean to entertain the next generation? See, first of all, I have a problem with this word next generation, right? Because I don't think there is any next generation. Right? What do you mean? Um, you know, we are living, you know, it's, a, it's called overlapping universes. We are living, you know, we are like whatever one and a half billion people here. And we are in the business of entertaining everyone, right? This next generation comes with this, it co arrives with that little, you know, sort of definition, which somehow that is younger, cooler, smarter, something or the other. What is next gen is the technology, right? It's not the people. The people are the same, right? The audiences are the same. There are always younger audiences. There will always be fashion and fad. There will always be older audience. You know, that's what they say, that till up to the time you get your first job, you're carefree. Then you get a job and you're still carefree. Then you get married, you're not so carefree. Then you have an EMI and you're, you become that, sure. that middle class audience, right? Yeah. And you grow from there. Yeah. So that's what happens in each generation. Yeah. Fashions change. You know, there used to be bell bottoms before, now there are slimmer pants, you know, those kind of things. I think storytelling remains the same, right? Finally, when you're talking to an audience, you have to tell them a compelling story. If you're telling them a compelling story, they are engaged with you. If you're not telling them a compelling story, they are not. And that has also been happening from the last 100 years, right? Yeah. So I don't think there's so much change in that. What is happening is that, you know, we keep, and you say, you know, that uh, is everyone clear what target you're going for, yeah. what you're doing? The thing what happens is that it is wrong to imagine this audience as a one-size-fits-all mass audience. It's not a mass audience. It's a mass of niches. And we are a billion people, so you can get 100 million women who like something. That still leaves 900 million people out of it. But it's a big number and it's a sizable audience. But I don't think any platform is positioning like that, right? No. The good thing with the platforms now is that they don't need to position like that. The platform is the ultimate Aladdin's cave, right? It is the ultimate cave. It's got everything in it. It's got everything available in it from abroad to India to regional language to documentaries to movies to everything. Now, it's a question of finding it, discovering it, and using it. And that's what platforms are supposed to do. If platforms now go chasing after we'll play only big movies and common daily soap operas, they become a variation of TV, which is not what they're supposed to do in any case. But they're doing that. They're not. They do, actually, when you watch these platforms, you will see, I mean, they do, they show you short films. You know, you can see short films on platforms. You can see all kinds of, you can see documentaries. I think the, what the streamer has done, has done everything what TV could never do. TV was always constricted by geography, by language, and by time slot, right? That's all. If you have a 9 p.m. slot, you've taken the slot. Yeah. Today, you can have 100 things releasing at 9 p.m., right? And everyone can watch it when they want it. It's available all the time. You can binge watch it. You can watch it weekly. You can, so in a sense, the streaming revolution is truly revolutionary. But why is it then that nobody is close to making money? Well, you know what? Now, if you're talking about India, I think everyone is making a lot of money abroad. India. Yeah, India. Now, India has always been a complicated market. You know, we talk about top of the pyramid, bottom of the pyramid, uh, top of the pyramid, you know, whatever there is that 10, 20, 30 million families, you know, that bit. Then you talk about the big giant market. It's complicated, you know, it's very value conscious. Indians, I mean, I think all the streamers discovered coming to India that, you know, they all have a subscription model. You know, put a credit card, get a subscription, and it pays automatically. India may they discovered that we churn out. Ki summer holiday a gaya to cancel subscription. Weekend go, I'm not there, cancel subscription. So, I mean, that's just the nature of the market. You know, that's the nature of the thing. So you've got to find that balance between the kind of content you're creating, the cost at which you're creating it, how much money can you get from the audience or the market, and how much of a value, value proposition you're building. Sure. That's how businesses are built. I mean, you're talking about big players, you're talking about Reliance, Geo, that has got an outlook of 20 years out. So when you say that, you know, are you making money, I don't think anyone is looking at the maths like that. The question is, are you building an empire? Are you building a, a business with that many customers and that much of a, you know, position? Yeah. Money will be made. But money will be made 20 years hence or 10 years hence. It's the, I, I understand it's a long tail game, but I mean, we're also seeing the repercussions of that across, uh, you know, sectors where people are actually uh, realizing that this great vision of 10, 20 years may not be a sustainable model. No, no, see, there. that is the way all great businesses are built. You know, when satellite TV first started in the 90s, no one could have imagined that satellite TV would become what it did. You know, when, when we did KBC and Kyoki in 2000, there were 25 million homes. Sure. Today, they've reached 187 million homes. I think in many ways, streaming is the early days of satellite TV. 
We don't know where this is going to go. It's going to get to 5G will arrive. There will be a billion mobile phones. There'll be a new way of monetizing it. The economy will go up. We are going to get to 25 trillion and 30 trillion. I mean, it's all looking good. It's all looking up. And, and we'll all boats rise with the tide, yeah? Uh, I, I'm going to ask you the closing question and you know, sir, thoda candid ho jaiye, huh? everything is great, everything aapke, is aapke hunky dory. Aapke candid ho na, wo uh, hai ki jo mujhe problem hai pata hai. Nahin, 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 problem nahi aap, you be cautious, <laughs> I'm saying, lekin problem kya hai abhi Hindi film industry or streaming industry mein, according to you, vishesh tippani dijiye for the stakeholders. <laughs> but then, problem, problem, problem kuch nahi hai. प्रॉब्लम अगर नहीं अगर मुझे प्रॉब्लम दिखाई देता सिनेमा नहीं कर पाया था वो ओ टी टी ने इतने कम सालों में किया है जो मैं, मैंने शुरू में भी कहा था कि इतने सारे टैलेंट को इतने सारे टैलेंट को इसने कंज्यूम किया है मौका दिया है कि जिसकी कोई हद नहीं है अगर आप नंबर गिनाने जाएंगे तो आप थक जाएंगे और सारे डिपार्टमेंट में सारे एडिटर्स सारे सिनेमाटोग्राफर्स सारे साउंड साउंड इंजीनियर्स म्यूजिक डायरेक्टर्स एक्टर्स ऑल ऑफ देम टुडे आर वेरी बिजी दे आर कास्टिंग डायरेक्टर्स आर मच मोर बिजी दैन एनी एनी अदर टाइम they uh, there are new sh shop coming up now of casting directors because wh whoever are there now they are flooded with off uh, for so, with so many offers so i i see a, a great indication of coming time and but meri problem hoti ek hi jagah pe hai ki jo naya hai usko bahut jaldi kaam mil raha hai usko thoda seekhna chahiye tha but now he's getting he's getting work so easily and so immediately you know so he's distracted is distracted from learning so this is where my problem lies yeah 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 thoda hustle hona chahiye thoda matlab hamara to matlab aisa laga ki matlab humne hi galti kar di ha kar ke on that note thank you so much gentlemen this thank has truly you. been a pleasure thank, thank you for gracing us thank, thank you. you samir thank you for thank your time you. well thank you gentlemen and sonali for that riveting discussion Thank you so much. All right, now let's move on now. Despite the macroeconomic scenarios across the world, India's digital ad spends are expected to reach $21 billion by FY28, according to a new report by Red Sea Strategy Consultants. And with Indian users spending nearly 80% of their day on their smartphones, Aisha, I'm not going to ask you how long you spend and you <laughs> don't, don't ask me, all right? Never. <laughs> so digital platforms are witnessing superlative engagement rates, making it crucial for marketeers to be present where their audiences are. A winning go-to-market strategy provides an action plan to reach target customers and better compete in the marketplace. So, you know, Sumit, the question is, where are India's ad dollars going, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. So here to provide us with a panoramic outlook, please join us in welcoming our esteemed next panelists, the founder, chairman, and MD of Madison World and Madison Communications, Sam Balsara, the chief executive officer of IBG, Shashi Sinha, the chief marketing officer at ITC, Shuvadeep Banerjee, the founder of Spring Market Capital, Arun Iyer, and President and CEO, Digital Times Network, Rohit Chadda. May we also invite on stage Senior Editor of Times Network, back on stage, Sonali Krishna. Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a round of applause for our panelists. We have Mr. Sam Balsara, Mr. Shashi Sinha, Mr. Shuvadi Banerjee, Mr. Arun Ayer, Mr. Rohit Chadda, and Sonali Krishna. I think we'll wait till the celebrity uh, mania is done.
he's left. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, star power, clearly, but I'm going to uh, kickstart this discussion. Where are India's advertising dollars going? The answer is clear. It doesn't need a discussion. It's going to digital. The question is, what's happening, you know, in that digital ecosystem? I have heavyweights sitting here. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Sam. You recently got out the Fitch Madison report uh, where you gave us a sense of the year gone by and what to expect, uh, you know, in, uh, in 2023. So I'd like you to summarize, uh, you know, and give the headlines for this audience so they have a sense of what's really happening when one talks of the advertising dollars in India. So according, so according to our estimates, last year was a good year for ADEX despite you know, everything that happened, we started the year with COVID, uh, then unexpectedly the Ukraine war started. In spite of all that, in our estimate, ADEX grew by a massive 21%. Now, just for perspective, global ADEX in the same year grew by 8%. And the top I think 10 economies of the world, including US and China, grew by 1%. So clearly, we are the bright spot in ADEX today. Having said that, we, we do expect a little softening this year when, according to our estimates, ADEX will cross 1 lakh crores. I know there are some estimates put out by my friends which estimate ADEX to be much larger. Uh, but the way we think of ADEX is we take into account advertising or what Suvadeep, I, and Shashi would call advertising. We don't necessarily, just the same way we don't include classifieds and tender ads in print, we do not really take all those lakhs or millions of small advertisers, you know, who, who spend 10,000 rupees on Meta and stuff like that, because all of those do account for a very large number. But in our report, we don't recognize them as advertisers. So we think it's a, it's a landmark moment crossing one lakh crores. Clearly, the driver has been digital. Yeah. I think uh, I remember a time 15 years ago when digital was less than a thousand crores and its share was, I think, about 4%. And today we estimate its share to be 41%. Yeah. At 41%, it has become the largest medium overtaking television. Also, every other medium has lost share. Sure. Mind you, the significant thing is that all mediums are growing in absolute terms. Yeah. It's not so in many other parts of the world. Here, everyone is growing, but their relative shares are coming down, except digital share, which is going up. Uh, I guess that's enough for a, for a roundup of... For a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shubhati, you know, so taking a cue from where, what, what Sam has actually said in terms of figures. So obviously, you are, we are planning for a digital-dominated world, right? Uh, so I would like to understand from you, as a marketer, and please wear your marketing industry hat and not your company hat, I keep insisting, uh, in terms of, yes, we have a duopoly here, in, not only in India, but of course globally, with Meta and um, Google, right? And essentially that is where the digital dollars are going. Uh, 
what is it as a marketer that you're concerned about with this kind of investment that you're putting in digital, which we are broadly and loosely calling digital, where 80% of your spends of digital are going between these two behemoths, right, vis-a-vis uh, -vis other mediums, and why, is, why do you think it's being efficient? So, Shunali, I'll uh, take the question and break it up a bit. Sure, go ahead. Um, so when it comes to push marketing, and digital allows both push and pull, and we'll come to the pull part of it a little later, but where the ad X part does not exist in that form. But uh, let's talk about the advertisement piece, which is the push part of it. Uh, yes, you are right, there's a large chunk of money that goes through Meta and Google, but there is, today, a chunk of spend actually happens beyond, all right? So, there's a quantum bit of spend that happens to the creator economy, which is the influencers. Yeah. There's a quantum bit of spends that happens through um, the OTD channel. We were just having a lot of conversations along with you. Um, so there's spends all across, right? Um, the challenge actually is, and all our MROI kind of analytics, et cetera, tells us there's some good returns that also happens. It's not that it's poor returns versus, let's say, what television does for the brand. But the challenge is that um, your quantum time spent as an individual, let's take Sonali for example, whatever time you get to watch content, that has roughly remained the same. But what has happened is there is humongous fragmentation that has happened. Absolutely. So the quantum time that you spend on each of these have come down significantly. So if I have to show so Sonali an ad, I have to plan for Sonali on YouTube, I have to plan for Sonali on Facebook. You can't to, catch me, surely. Right? You can't I catch can't me. catch her because ah. maybe she's behind paywalls. And I'll, I'll no, come no, to no. that. No, no, I'm, no, I'm looking for the skip button, <laughs> mind you. I am looking so, for that button all so the, the time. So the problem, Sonali, is that when I try to catch one individual and, the, and that group of consumers, I plan individually for each of these platforms. I'm less efficient when I'm doing that. Unfortunately, if that's the bigger spend, 34,000 crore, what he's called out in his report recently, higher than the 30,000 31,000 odd of television. Um, we don't have a measurement. We don't have a planning tool in this country. Okay? So that's exactly. point number one. Yes, yes. Point number two, Sonali, to just build on that. There is a chunk of spend that actually happens where it is not. So what does digital stand for? Sharper targeting, whether it's content or from a media standpoint. The accuracy levels, when you really look for it, it is not that accurate when it comes to geo, when it comes to demographics, when it comes to some other measure. But the currency or the commercials are not linked to that. There is a bit of bot-led fraud, Absolutely. but the currency is not linked yeah. back to that, yeah. right? So there are these kinds of challenges. And then I have people who are slowly moving behind paywalls. There was a report recently by Hootsuite, and, and they were talking about the fact that around 51% of India, in urban part of India, they've actually gone behind some kind of ad blocking. So if you really ask me push marketing, there is inflation, and that's ADEX does not go 21% because we all have started spending and, and reaching out to more consumers. It's also because of media inflation. But there are these challenges in the digital space today, which if we don't address right now in this country, we're just probably betting a little more in the dark. And we'll come to the pull part later, but let's have. Yeah, so interesting points made by uh, Shubhodeep as a marketer. Rashi, you, veteran uh, media personality, you know, working with several brands, uh, this kind of distraction and this hype and hoopla by this digital revolution uh, justified? I mean, I want to know that there are like, you have Sam Balsara, Shashi Sinha, uh, we have Shuvodeep, and we have a bunch of marketers, apart from Mark Pritchard, whose voice is the loudest from PNG, for those of you who don't know, who keeps asking for metrics, unified metrics in the di digital world, and we're always beating down TV and print and every other media, right, to give us better ratings. Why is it that, you know, people like you are not standing up and saying, it's about time, how long will we be in discussion mode? Shashi, first you, then I'll go back to, then I'll come to you. On, on the metrics? On the metrics. Okay. 
given that you're spending so much money on digital, so right? Before and I come to metrics, there is a comment I want to make, you know, objection sure. I want to take to the fact that digital is very big and has become bigger and, you know, uh, uh, and sorry, I will answer the question, but I want to make a comment that the fact is in my personal state from every forum, I don't think other media are going away. Television is going to be there for quite some time. And the point which was in the previous panel with Samir and Manoji, the fact is where's the money coming? You know, so today you rightly said in digital, the money is being made by just two platforms, Google and Facebook. The others, the, the meta family, others are not making money. Finally, somewhere you have to see a pot of gold at the end of the tunnel, you know. And today, ODT is being funded to a great extent either by global money or by TV money, you know. So it's all the Z's and the stars and the thing you've seen, the hostile balance sheet, you've seen the uh, star balance sheet. So I think the, the TV is not going to go away. There are a variety of reasons. It's a bit like movies, so that's the first point I want to make. And I personally feel what Shobhadeep said, if digital measurement comes in, two things will happen. Uh, firstly, the measurement is not coming in because the ecosystem done not want it. Maybe as brutal, <laughs> as brutal as possible. The day the ecosystem wants measurement in India, technology is not an issue. And if I may say so, there's something I would understand about measurement in this country, you know. So uh, it's measurement is an ecosystem issue. They don't want it, the capability exists, because all what Shobhadeep alluded to will get caught out, you know. It will help the long tail. The long tail which is there will be will gain by this. They will see small niches, which Samir alluded to earlier. But the truth, and I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately known to be as uh, direct as possible. So the ecosystem, it suits the ecosystem to live within wall gardens and not to allow third party measurement coming in. Look what's happening on IPL. There is TV ratings which people claim are coming down, but whatever digital last two years, three years, there'll be no measurement. I'm sure there'll be no measurement now. So that's the limited point I'll make as far as measurement is concerned. The day the industry stands up and say we want it, it'll come. Before I come to you, Mohit, I want to ask you why you're not demanding. Oh, we have been demanding for a long time. In fact, uh, um, unfortunately, there has been no consensus at an uh, industry level. Uh, when it comes to this uh, one singular industry, measurement. Is it an industry consensus or is it the digital consensus that we're looking at? Where is the problem? No, see, what do we want? We want one singular measurement system irrespective of what medium. Today we do media planning which is across, right? It's not, unfortunately we only go by some probability matrix today to arrive at that combined plan and whatever. But uh, we have been shouting loud for a long time. It's just not happening. That's not happening. It, it came to a closure, then there were some people, important people who pull, pulled out. Uh, we're still waiting. Name and shame, please. Uh, <laughs> so I'd just like to jump in here. So while we've obviously talked about what digital doesn't give you, let's also talk about what digital does give you, what, uh, what mainline does not, right? Um, it does give you some bit of targeting. I absolutely agree that, you know, the targeting may not be as accurate as we want it to be, but at least, uh, the, the little measurement that it gives you in terms of um, how many people actually viewed the ad, how many clicked, how many came, how many transacted, um, that actually makes life much more simpler and, um, and for marketers, for planners, et cetera, so that they actually know what is the ROI that they're getting. And, and hence, you see the, hence you see the growth that you see um, on digital ad spends. Um, another, another nuance that one should actually also think about is um, we've, we've heard a lot about how many new unicorns have come up in the country. Now, all of these unicorns that we are looking at are basically all tech companies, which are, um, which are actually acquiring users on digital. And they want the users to transact on digital. So what better medium to spend money on than digital? Because that's where the platform, the user already is. For me, um, if I were to, if I were to uh, show an ad on TV, for example, for a digital platform, then I'm doing branding. I'm, I'm trying to build brand recall. But if I want the user to transact, the probability that if I show the user the ad on TV versus that, that I show the ad on YouTube or, um, or on timesnownews.com, for example, um, is much higher that the user will actually transact there because at least he can click, at least he can come to my platform. Of course. <laughs> the honor's nest, you know. Uh, so if you see, uh, you're right, that from a performance and from a uh, CRA point of view, part of the funnel, but now the funnel, you can't go away from the conventional media, be it TV or print. Uh, a founder said this to me, a very large successful fashion company founder said to me, he said, listen, and you can see it on television, look at IPL, that you know, all the spends would come from the digital companies. He said to me, finally in this country, 
you cannot go away. Someone selling top end cosmetics saying you have to be on television, then you're absolutely right, the bottom of the funnel comes in in terms of closing the loop. But that's the reality. So there are very few brands. I heard someone saying, I was very keen on finding out who that name is, is a brand has been built only on WhatsApp. You cannot but not do multimedia in this country. I'm not saying absolutely digital has a critical role to play, but do not underscore the role of the other media which exists. Absolutely. Sam, you wanted to say something? Uh, actually, as a corollary to, to this, you know, basically you, you asked an important question as to why is Subhadeep not making a noise? Absolutely. Now, the real truth is Subhadeep may not like it. Subhadeep doesn't matter to, to, to Google and Facebook. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, so, they don't so want to give you, it out. So, so you must, while Subhadeep matters a lot to television and Subhadeep matters a lot to other media, he is inconsequential when it comes to Google and Facebook. But if so many Shuvadeeps come together. No, but right? still, see, so the, the honest truth is that digital has grown on the back of performance. The need for this kind of viewership research comes only when you use digital for branding. And today, most of the dollars are going to Google and Facebook on account of performance. In our report, you will find that in digital, 40% is now branding. But that is because we are taking out that huge bottom layer of millions of people who are using them only for performance. If you see, if you see Google's report, they will still say that their major dollars are still coming for performance. Those who use Google for performance don't need all these uh, uh, metrics which Shubhadeep needs, or I need, or Shashi needs. So that is the bottom line. May Tell I just me. build, so, so I'm sorry, I'll just, ahead, I'll just build on this. <laughs> so, uh, very right and very true. Uh, that digital has given us immense, it has unlocked immense set of stuff for us. Performance, and he, he called out performance. Um, actually, you, I'm digressing for a second here. Performance marketing, you can actually, it, through all the wall gardens, you can still measure till the last rupee, right? Unlike any other medium. And this is a very unfortunate situation that happened, is that there's a lot of spend that happens from our side and from various other similar brands, that a large chunk of money goes into performance marketing. Because we can, we can figure out, oh, he has seen, oh, that means after that he has done that and then he has added a coupon. What is the meaning of seen? That he saw you for two seconds? Uh, maybe. And, and viewability is another angle. I, I don't want to get into that right now. But because of which, I think, We've started con creating a lot of content which is more left-brained than creating content which is around brand love, which is building brand equity. Mm. A lot less conversations today even in boardrooms happen, which is linked back to strengthening brand equity than selling more bingo chips or selling a packet more of Ashirwad or selling a little bit of Iti, et cetera, et cetera. So performance marketing actually is a lot getting focused. So there is, there is us to balance life as well on that front. So I'm just saying that yes, digital has given us that avenue, but we cannot just forget. But let's talk about, you know, publishers like you, right, who've got sizable chunk of visitors coming in, right? Uh, given that there is such a big domination in the digital space, how are publishers like you trying to make their own dent? Because the, the, the digital ecosystem also needs to become bigger. So, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to one more point that earlier that Nick said, you know, around Google and Facebook and the duopoly. Now, uh, what we also don't realize is that, that Google at least is also an enabler. Um, publishers like us and, and multiple publishers, most publishers in the country, also use Google's platform um, and Google enables us also in order to monetize our inventory better. So, I think uh, that credit we, we, we owe to Google as well. 
Um, now about the about the direct question that you asked, uh, I think it's it's basically about building building that brand loyalty, building that user loyalty um, that publishers like us do, that brands like us do, um, and then actually going and doing direct sales and doing branded content sales. So um, uh, I mean, when we say that, you know that that while branding is obviously uh, mainline is most important for for brand recall, etc. But I think uh, with the creator economy, uh, with the fact that you know that digital consumption of content has has increased so much, uh, branded content space is actually growing very very strongly on digital as well. So I think uh, I think with those kind of with those kind of pegs, we kind of build that brand loyalty and try to build that brand recall for uh, for brands also on digital and try to supplement what they're doing on TV or on print. So it is required, Teal. I'm asking you, can a brand be built sh surely on the current digital infrastructure? Oh, yes, of course. It can be. Oh, One yes, second, I want to take a poll. I'm a digital I guy. Wanna take a, I, will, I want to take a poll because I'm sure this answer is controversial. Do you think? 100%. 100%. Sam, can, can it be built only on digital? I have my doubts. <laughs> and, and the reason why I'm saying this is, is not because you can't read. Not that you can't reach enough number of people. But I think, I mean, the, the only story I have to say here is that every digital brand that has made it big, made it big after it came on television. I mean, Sh look, Shashi, I look, didn't ask you. Go, go back 10 years ago. Why does, why does Amazon still today, after 10 years of being here, use television? No, I absolutely agree. So but why, think, why so does there's a, there's a point there, you know? So when you're saying that a brand has to be built, uh, it basically depends on the target audience of the brand. So when you're going bottom of the pyramid, then obviously TV has to be done, right? Uh, TV gives you the kind of mass reach and the kind of brand recall that, that it does give you. But when you're, uh, when you're trying to performance target... Performance marketing, yes, agreed. No, agreed. performance as well as, uh, brand, as, well as brand. No, as well as brand, actually. I can, I can give you a lot of D2C brands that have actually been built purely on digital video. However, uh, very rightly pointed out that due to a lot of urban audiences going behind paywalls, I think that is where one problem has come in uh, for brands because a lot of the urban audiences now, let's say, which, which were being earlier targeted on YouTube, for example, are now, going, uh, are now buying premium subscriptions and hence are not seeing ads anymore. In fact, I was having a conversation with one of the, one of the film producers last week and I was actually telling them that, guys, you're not realizing the importance of digital news. Um, and why I say that is because when you're looking at video, um, all of the OTTs, let's say, um, and, and you know, so you have the cord cutter generation if you want to target the PVR, the multiplex audience. Um, all of, most of them, or a lot of them, let's say, are basically not watching ads anywhere because they're not watching TV. Um, they're watching YouTube Premium, they're watching Netflix, Amazon, uh, Z5, Sony Live, whatever that they're watching, that's all premium content, right? So they're not seeing any ads. Where are they seeing ads? They're only seeing ads on news platforms. So if you want to reach the user, um, how do you reach the user? How do you tell him that a new film is coming out? They, they were sharing with me that there's a big problem. People are not going to cinemas anymore. Why are they not going to cinemas anymore? Uh, and my question to them was that if you're looking at the urban audience, how are you trying to reach them? You're, you're still trying to reach them the way that they were being reached earlier. But they've moved on from a consumption pattern perspective. So you need to move on. And hence the importance of digital news from a ad spent perspective. So Nali, uh, may I just come of, in? Of course. I think I must just clarify a little based on what I said previously. I think the reality is that in today's time, you need television and you need digital. Now, I'll tell you why I have come to that conclusion. The reality is that everybody's viewing habits, media habits, have dramatically changed, including mine. Including mine. So, whilst I do believe that television offers a brand much better brand building capabilities than digital, the reality is that as Bark now tells us, one third of a program's audience 
is severely underserved by digital, by television. Because there are these people who we call light users who are using very little of television. So if you want a plan that say del wants, that has to deliver 500 GRPs, one third of your audience will get only maybe 200 GRPs. So you have to make yeah. up for those so by adding digital. So it's very complicated. Sorry, by old age. This is very, it is alcohol <coughs> weights. So can I give you a simpler answer, sir? So with your, with due permission from your side. See, this, this logic, I didn't understand the light viewer. I mean, I have some understanding. Simpler way of looking at it is you look at the top 20, top 30 digital brands, which are consumer facing. Consumer, I'm not talking B2B, consumer facing brands. Chances are, if not all 20, 18 would have been an IPL television last year. So I rest my case. You know, there's no simple, simple way of looking at it, you know. I only answer this call. No, no, I'm saying quick, IPL quick is the reason. There, quick, quick question there on IPL on digital or TV, IPL TV, on TV? TV, TV, when I say IPL TV. <laughs> so last year on IPL, you name, the, you name the brand, my friend, and I'll tell you whether they were television or not. Huh? So the top, so instead of looking at the complex uh, grid which he created, Look at the proof of the performance. And finally, they're there, consumer-facing brands. Obviously, it's something else which is being built, I don't know. And this will continue for some time. You are right that there are uh, audiences which are going away. But the only way to catch is to look at large reach at one shot, whichever you catch it. I have just one point to make. Yes, sir. I know time is up. Uh, but just one point. See, brand building is about storytelling, right? That I don't think anybody disagrees. Now, when we have that option of that button saying, five seconds to skip. <laughs> very, very difficult to tell a story as a marketeer. Absolutely. Right? And hence all that brand love, all that brand equity, the fuzzy logic behind it, etc. But this really works. But it's it difficult to build in those five seconds. Difficult to build through a banner. Difficult to build through those video-like stuff. Right? Hence, we need platforms to tell that story. Now, whether it's television, whether it's your own, and that's why I was coming to that full part of the marketing, whether it's your own digital assets, how you utilize that, or it's through communities that you're interacting with, through, through com consumers, there are different routes that people are taking as marketeers and to achieve that objective. Television will continue to play a role into delivering that objective, where digital will be a little bit of a constraint. Actually, interestingly to that point, um, I think because of that, because of what he just said, actually we see marketers moving to, uh, rather than cost per view, they're actually moving to cost per completed view because they want the story to be told. So hence, they're not just happy with the fact that you've shown the ad, they want the consumer to actually complete the ad and that is when they'll pay you. Well, I think uh, going forward, a lot is going to change. Uh, we're going to see some dramatic changes. Definitely, TV is not going out of fashion anytime soon. So thank God for our, for my job at least. Uh, so and and of course we have digital uh, also growing. So I think the media plat media per se is growing. Now what will stay and what will go? Time will tell. But as of now, both seem very important. Lucky for the India market that TV is going strong and digital is growing and uh, we'll all be employed at least in the near future. On that note, thank you so much uh, and I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. Thank you so much. Thank you gentlemen and Sonali for uh, presenting us with the industry perspective on proliferation of the Indian ad economy across the globe. Well, India is a hoping to be uh, the proud producer of the world's most compact flying electric taxi. Sumit, now that's a technology that can reconceive mobility in the country from replacing luxury cars and the current helicopter fleet mm. to even replacing road taxis to enable the last mile and mid mile transportation, the e-plane can potentially make flying ubiquitous. So, you know, earlier we were talking about when we saw Mr. Raghavendra Reddy and the jet suit, and we are yeah, like, maybe yeah. we'll use that for work, <laughs> but maybe we will use the e-plane. So, as part of our special showcase of Mission Innovation India's Crusaders, let me invite on stage the founder and CEO of the e-plane company, Mr. Satya Narayanan Chakravarti, to showcase to us his innovation, which is creating ripples in the world of tech, and he will be in conversation with Meghna Dekha, who is senior editor at Times Now. Can we 
we please have both of you on stage. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this, I'm Satya Chakravarti. Uh, what, we, what we're going to do today is to just quickly run you through the uh, PPT to set a context so that I think Meghna, Meghna can probably ask better questions in that case, right? So uh, let me just uh, run you through what's digital about these things. I think there's a couple of, I think this is something that I would like, like to really talk about. One of the questions that a lot of people have when we now talk about flying taxis is how are we going to fly without colliding? Uh, with, with, with our planes colliding, so we are actually working on a digital air routes, if you will, uh, right? So uh, these are imaginary roads in the in the sky, if you will. That's something, one of those things that we, I thought I'll talk about. This is the first time actually I'm talking about this in public uh, because that's a question that people keep asking. And uh, this actually talks about detecting and avoiding obstacles in the air when each of these planes is going, they will actually be able to figure out where, the, where each, each one of them is. I think we can show a computer vision and deep learning algorithm uh, based uh, precision landing. Uh, so this is actually the software, and I think, uh, let me see if I can get to the other, uh, other video. Okay, let's just, let, I don't know if I can play this video. Can, can you just play this video uh, from the... Well, or, Right. So this is where we are. We are actually uh, into doing a subscale prototype. It's the largest of the drones, if you will. Uh, in fact, we showcased this uh, to the um, civil aviation minister earlier today in Bangalore. Uh, it's right, right now in Bangalore, and it's going to go back to Chennai for further testing. That's where we are. So I think we'll be done with this. Uh, then we can. Chakravarti. It's a subscale version of it. I think we are working on the full scale version that people can sit How and How big fly. is the full scale version of an e-taxi? Yeah, so that's a good question. We are actually making the most compact electric VTOL in the world. Um, so our full scale version will actually be about six meters uh, wingtip to wingtip. I'll ask you something. People like me, I've traveled two hours today to get here, and I'm going to take roughly that much time if I travel back to office. I can actually sit in one of these things, and how fast will it take me? Hours. For a distance which otherwise in Delhi to Noida would have taken two hours. Oh, that should be about 10, 15, 15 minutes, I would think. 10, 15 minutes yes. away. So roughly 10 times faster. Absolutely. 10 times faster. And Absolutely. how many passengers can this take? 
repeat that. How many passengers can it? Right now, we are actually working on a two-seater. Two so seater. that can be a one pilot and one passenger. Uh, mainly targeting uh, executives who actually don't want to wait for other seats to be filled up. Uh, they just, because if you think about it, most of the uh, taxi travel, right? Mm -hmm. look, look at airport taxis or any of those things, it's actually single passenger yes. travel, right? So about two thirds of taxi travel is about single passenger. That's the market that we're targeting. So two people can sit in one of these, this is of yeah. course a prototype, the full size design that you are building, yeah. two passengers, one pilot can actually take off. And what's very interesting when I was seeing this video, it's a vertical takeoff. Yeah. and a vertical landing. It doesn't need any space. There's no infrastructure required. You can Absolutely. literally land it anywhere. Absolutely, that's exactly the point. So it can go to anyone's office, office building. How much space does it take? Can uh, we, we land one here? We are thinking, yeah, of course. I think um, we're looking at about a three bedroom apartment worth of space, like about 1,500 square yes. feet at the most, yeah. In this much space? Um, this would be about- This a, entire uh, stage. This should be okay. This, this should actually fit the plane, definitely. But for landing, we need to have like about one and a half times the dimensions. So we need to have a little bit more. So I think the, 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 the width of the stage would be okay, but not the width. The, the, uh, the length of the stage would be okay, but not the width. You must explain to our viewers and all the people in the audience what a vertical takeoff and a vertical landing is. Because we all understand planes, they would need longer runways. That's something that we, I believe, need to understand in something These like this. Fundamentally, like you can, you can see the, 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 the model over there, yes. right? So it takes off like a drone, but it actually flies like a plane. And That's how safe is it? Oh, it's actually pretty safe because there are two levels of safety in this. First of all, there is an entire weight of the aircraft can be balanced by the vertical rotors that are lifting it like a drone because that's what is actually taking it, making it take off. But while it goes as a plane, it's designed in such a way that the entire wing can take the weight of the plane. So you have a backup. If, if one thing fails, the other thing will actually come to the rescue. So for example, if the vertical rotors fail, you can actually glide to safety, except that you need to probably look for something that's with a short runway kind of a distance, right? Maybe in the middle of a road or something. Middle of a road yeah. or even a rooftop. Roof, Any roof, office rooftop, 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 for rooftop, example. Is, rooftop is actually what we're targeting for most landings and takeoffs. And that makes so much sense. However, one very important question, affordability. Is yes. it cost effective? Yeah. Can people like me actually afford something like this? Now, we have done the math. We are, we are basically uh, looking at around, let's say without, I mean, if you have to compare with Uber, right, Uber or Ola, right, uh, without any surge pricing and all that stuff that they go through, uh, we are right now looking at positioning it around 2.5 to 3 times the Uber price when we are first starting the- uh, And 10 so, times faster. 10 times faster. And so I'm from the Northeast, so I understand how difficult it can be to have connectivity. Yeah. If there is a natural disaster, if there is relief, if there is even primary healthcare required, how will this help? Oh, this is going to be actually fantastic because when we expand this from what we're doing currently as the two-seater, we are looking at one of the first important applications as air ambulance, for example, right? And air ambulances actually can become like mainstream, hospital to hospital or patients to hospital. This is something that we will actually be looking at as a very routine thing, uh, not just waiting for a natural disaster to happen or anything. Every day, we should actually be having uh, air ambulances coming out of this kind of a application. Well, Dr. Chakravarti, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone here. We hope that time comes soon when flying high is meant for the Janta. We're looking for about two years for the certification process so that we can actually commercialize it. Uh, by then. We're going to hold you to that. Two years, you're going to return to Times Now Summit and we're going to hold you to that. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'm answerable. It was a pleasure, Dr. Thank Chakrabarty. you so much. Thank you so much. Over Thank you, you so much Thanks for so that much. demonstration. Thank you, Meghna, and thank you, Mr. Chakrabarty. Quite interesting, the possibilities that the future holds for us, doesn't it? But Aisha, I want to talk to you about the most interesting thing that the current future holds for us, which is our next act. But let's not give it away right now. I know we're really excited about it. Since morning, we've been talking about it. Yeah. But That's a surprise <laughs> session. And it's a lovely surprise for sure. But you know, it's been a very exciting day. There's been so many great sessions. What part has been your favorite? I think the next one will be. <laughs> I'm hoping so. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, in